The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. As Christmas Day draws near, every father becomes more deeply aware of how much his wife and family mean to him. For this is the season when we think of others, when we find our greatest happiness in promoting the happiness of those we love. Perhaps that is why more fathers choose December than any other month to increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, this is a good time to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative to discuss with him the finest gift that any man can give his loved ones, security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, Operation Rumba. Tonight, your FBI removes the secret classification from another of wartime files and makes public this story of how one of its special agents aided the Allied cause in the fight against the Axis. The time of this case was December 1942, almost four years ago to the day, a period which saw headlines about strange remote places like Guadalcanal, Tunis, Mature, Bazerte. They were the days of desperation, when it seemed, even to those who are not faint-hearted, that victory for the Axis might be just around the corner. Tonight's file opens on a street corner in a large city in South America. A middle-aged lady, limping quite badly, approaches the corner where George Harrison, a young American chemist, is standing. The middle-aged lady speaks. I beg your pardon, young man. No, uh, are you talking to me? Yes. I'd like you to do me a favor. If I can. I wonder if you'd wait here with me until the traffic slows down and help me across. Well, certainly. Thank you so much. You're an American, aren't you? Yes. That's why I asked you. Some of these natives down here hate us so much, I'd be afraid they'd push me in front of a car. Oh, they're not that bad. Oh, wait till you've been here as long as I have. Well, I think they're good ones. There are some... very few good ones, young man. You can take my word for that. Besides, they're almost all German spies. I wouldn't trust any of them. Well, I don't know about that. Well, you'll find out that I'm right, young man. And I hope you do before it's too late. Well, I hope so, too. I, I think we can get across after this car passes, ma'am. Yes, I believe you're right. You mind if I take your arm? Not at all. Wagner. Hurry, get in. That was a fine push you gave him. At first, I didn't think I'd pushed him hard enough to get him in front of that other car. It was perfect. In fact, I think the car that Pedro was driving, she killed the young man. Oh, that's too bad. He was a nice boy. So we can't worry about him now. Let's hurry. I've got to get this briefcase to the pet shop. A 
few hours later in the hospital room of George Harrison, George was explaining his strange accident to Special Agent Jim Taylor. You say this woman was about 45 with dark hair and a light complexion. Yes, Mr. Taylor, that's right. And when she approached you, she was limping quite badly. She was. Well, if the woman purposely pushed you in front of the car to get your briefcase, as you seem to think, then in all probability is, and well, that limp was fake. I suppose you're right. And you have no idea what happened to the woman? None. What makes you think she pushed you as this car was approaching? Well, the car just seemed to come out of nowhere, and it seemed to me she stepped back and pushed me right in front of her. Hmm. Can you describe the briefcase you say she took, Mr. Harrison? Well, it's an ordinary brown calfskin briefcase with my initials, G.H.H. Mr. Harrison, I happen to know that you're down here working on an important secret project. And that this may be a conspiracy, but... But what? But there must be a lot of women in this city who answer to the description that you've give, give, given me. Shouldn't be too hard to find her. Still, if we find her and she hasn't got the briefcase. What do you mean? I mean, what do we do then? There's no way you can prove that she actually pushed you, is there? You're not even sure she did. I see what you mean. However, we'll go to work on it, Mr. Harrison. And the first break we get, we'll let you know. Here we are at the pet shop, Mrs. Wagner. Good. I won't be too long. Do you want me to wait for you? Yes, wait right here. Good morning, Alex. Ah, good morning. You have the briefcase. Yes, it worked perfectly. Here. But it was very lucky there wasn't anyone in the pet shop when I walked through. Oh, that does not matter. Whatever there are customers, when you come in, just wait. Jose will get rid of them, and then you can walk back here in safety. Oh, yes, I see. You like the canaries in the shop? Why, yes. They're new, aren't they? We just got them in yesterday. But what do you do with canaries? They aren't rare. No. But Jose was complaining. He said the radio transmitter was making so much noise, you could hear it all over. Now they will think it is the canary. Why, how clever. That's a wonderful trick. To be in this business and to stay in this business, you must use your head. Ah, there. Now, let me see what we have here. Ah. 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 Mrs. Wagner, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Sorry to tell me what? This briefcase does not contain the right information. What? Yes, I'm sorry. But for this, we cannot pay you. You understand that, no? But I took great chances this morning, Alex. I know, I know. But... Mrs. Wagner, I can only buy from you what I can get paid for. Now, if you wish to undertake another assignment... Well, I need the money, Alex. I've told you that. Very well. Listen carefully. I want you to go back. Come in. Hello, Mr. Harrison. Well, hello. It's so good to see that you weren't hurt badly either. Oh? My doctor examined me and said I was only slightly bruised. So I came to see how you were and to return your briefcase. But how did you know who I was and where I was? Why, there was a story about the accident in the morning paper in which it said you'd been brought to this hospital. Oh, I see. Well... Thank you for returning the briefcase. Well, it's nothing, really. It was very nice of you, and I do appreciate it. Uh, how long are you going to be here? Well, I'm going to be released tomorrow. Splendid. Then I'm not going to leave this hospital room until you tell me what day you're coming to my home for tea. Well, I am a... Now, pre after all, I feel I'm partly responsible for your having met with this accident. Now, you must say yes, Mr. Harrison. Well, I'll be pretty busy the first day I get out of here, but... Well, how, how about Thursday, then? Uh, that sounds all right. Uh, what's your address, Mrs. Wagner? 17 Avenue of the Siestas. Isn't that romantic? Very. All right, then, I'll see you on Thursday at, uh, say, 5? That's wonderful. I'll be waiting. May I come in, Senor Montes? Yes, yes, come in, please. What is it I can do for you? 
Here are my credentials, senor. James Taylor. Oh, please sit down, Mr. Taylor. We're very happy to do what we can to cooperate with the American FBI. Thank you, senor Montes. What can we do? Our censors in the United States intercepted the letter with secret writing on it that was sent to a man here named Rafael Torres. Rafael Torres. I don't know that name, Mr. Taylor. You think he's a German spy? We are pretty sure he is, judging from what was in this letter to him. Where did they send that letter to Senor Torres? It was addressed to him at 43 Avenue Dos Picos. 43 Avenue Dos Picos. I went by there this morning. It's a pet shop. Oh, yes. That is owned by a man named Jose Condado. Do you know him? Not too well, but he runs a big business. He sells many rare birds. He has a boat which he sends up the river for those birds. Do you know the name of the boat, Senor Montes? El Aguila. That means the eagle in Spanish. Yes, I know. I speak a little Spanish. Good. Now, um, what else do you want to know? Well, according to your records and our own, there isn't a transmitter in this country sending out a signal powerful enough to be picked up overseas. That is correct. We have been very careful about that. Yes, I know that. Oh, what puzzles me is, if they're not using the radio, how are they getting that information out? That I do not know. But if there is anything I can do to help you to find out... Well, I'll tell you what you can do for us, if you will. Yes? You can put a plain clothesman on watch at the pet shop. Maybe we can pick up something by watching who goes out and who comes mm-hmm. in. Maybe. Hey, excuse me. Oh, certainly. Chief of Police Montes. Yes, Mr. Taylor is here. Just a minute, please. It's your office. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, yes, Don. Harrison called, you said? Said that woman was all right and returned the briefcase, huh? I see. Okay, Don, I'll see you later. Now, Senor Montes. Well, as you were requesting, Mr. Taylor, we should be glad to put a man on watch at the pet shop, and we shall give you a report. Thank you, Senor Montes. And as soon as I find out anything, I'll be in touch with you. the residence of Mrs. Nora Wagner? Yes, sir. I am Alex, Mrs. Wagner's butler, sir. Are you Mr. Harrison? Yes, I had an appointment with Mrs. Wagner. She's expecting you, sir. Please go straight ahead. Thank you, Alex. Hello there, Mr. Harrison. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wagner. Well, you look fine. No ill effects from the accident? No, the doctor said there wasn't a single after effect. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> Now, would you like some tea, or would you rather have whiskey? Oh, uh, tea would be fine. I've got to get back to the office after I leave here to finish up some work. All right. We'll both have tea, then. Uh, will you have a cigarette, Mrs. Wagner? Oh, no, thank you. I smoke a special brand. Alex, cigarette. There you are, madam. Well, here, uh, let me light for you. Thank you. Uh, I think the time is... Time to tell you something, Mr. Harrison. Oh, what's that? Mr. Harrison, we know you're a chemist and that you were sent down here to work on synthetic rubber. What's that? Uh... Now we want to know the results of your most recent experiment with butadine. It's as simple as that. But if I refuse to tell you? Alex? This is what will happen. <coughs> Now get up and start talking. I'll tell you what I'll do. You do it! Alex? Are you sure you didn't hit him too hard that time? No, he isn't hurt. He'll just be unconscious for a little while. Well, you'd better take him up to the bedroom. Yes. And when he comes to, if he still refuses to talk, then I can go to work on him again. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, do you have the courage to face some facts which may give you a real jolt? If you haven't got that courage, better turn off your radio for the next 59 seconds, because here comes a question which is very likely to open your eyes to a serious situation. You're still listening? Then you do have the courage. All right. Ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? 
How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That deserves more than a superficial offhand answer. It deserves a thoughtful answer based on facts. To help you get them, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers, which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, that's something that not one father in a hundred knows. Where do I get one of these fact-facing charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. It is unfortunate but true that during a war when emotion runs high and patriotism is a word with dignity, that there are some who place their personal comforts before the welfare of the nation. The list of traitors to every nation is a long one and is studded with those who are traitors in time of peace as well as in time of war, traitors to their own country and to the human race. For what they have to sell is not disloyalty, but hate. In time of war, they're called traitors. In time of peace, they're dismissed as harmless crackpots. But what they have to sell is dangerous at any time. For hate breeds hate. And when the world's quotient of hatred exceeds the world's quotient of friendship, then we shall know the terrible tragedy of World War III. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters where Special Agent Jim Taylor has just entered into a conference with Chief of Police, Carlos Montes. You think you have uncovered something, Jim? I don't know, Carlos, but I was down at the pier this morning when the El Aguila came in and there was a coat of salt on the prow. So? That coat of salt means that that ship was out on the ocean, Carlos. Yes, you're right. Where do you think the boat went? I don't know, but they've got a radio on that boat. Do you know anything about it? Yes, all radios and boats that ship out of this harbor are registered here, Jim. Oh? In that green book over there. Well, let's look up the radio on the El Aguila. Um, here we are. El Aguila. Mm. No, Jim, this radio, she isn't strong enough to send more than two, three hundred miles. Yes, you're right. That's only a ship to shore, 50 water. Now I am puzzled. I do not understand this whole thing. Oh, you mean about the boat? Yes. I have known Jose Condado for several years, and I know he is not the kind of a man who would work with Germans. Then he doesn't know what's going on under his nose, Carlos, because we know his pet shop is a mail drop. Still, no one we have not been able to identify has gone into the pet shop since we put a man on watch. Well, I don't know the answer, Carlos, but I'd... Excuse me. Oh, certainly. Chief of Police Montes. Yes, Mr. Taylor is here. Just a minute, please. It's for you, Jim. Thanks. Hello. Yes, Don. What? George Harrison has disappeared. Don. Don, do you know where his office is? Where? Wait a minute. Let me copy that down. Okay. Okay, I got it. Let's take a look around his office. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. Has he come to yet, Alex? Yes, he came to, and he wouldn't talk. So you went to work on him again? Naturally. Let me try for a while. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Alex. Yes? Get me a drink of that brandy. Maybe that'll help. All right. Here. Thank you. Here. Take a drink of this. Drink it. It's 
Good for you. I think you will talk now. The, the, remember. You're at my home, Mrs. Wagner. Remember? What were the results of your experiments? No. No, I won't tell you. You take him, Alex. Go to work on him. I don't think I'll work on him anymore. Why not? Because he will not talk to us. He will not tell us anything. What are we going to do then? Let him go? No, we will not let him go, but I will call the pet shop. What do you want from the pet shop? A truck. We will take Mr. Harrison down to the El Aguila. What can you do with him on the boat? The El Aguila will make a rendezvous at sea with one of our U-boats. And when they get Mr. Harrison in Germany, they will know how to make him talk. I don't know. But you had better answer the door. You think it's the truck from the pet shop? No, the truck will come to the back door. I told them. Oh, all right. I'll go. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Mrs. Wagner? Yes. Oh, is Mr. George Harrison still here? Uh, no, I'm sorry, but he isn't. I had an appointment with Mr. Harrison for this afternoon, but he didn't keep it. I see. Oh, George is a friend of mine. I have a message for him. He told you he was coming here for tea? No, I found that out from his appointment pad at his office. Oh, I see. Well, if you hear from him, Mrs. Wagner... I'll I'll... have him get in touch with you, Mr... Uh, Taylor, Jim Taylor. I'll tell him to get in touch with you, Mr. Taylor. He knows where to call you, does he? Yes, he does. And, uh, Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes? If you hear from him first, I wish you'd ask him to get in touch with me and explain his not making an appearance. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Goodbye, Mrs. Wagner. Who was that? Someone looking for Harrison. Looking for? How did they know he was here? Harrison had my name on his appointment pad in his office. All right, then we must hurry. Is the truck here yet? Yes, while you were talking, I saw the truck enter your garage. Come on, give me a hand. What do you want me to do, help you carry him? No, he's not unconscious. I have him tied up and gagged, and I will keep him covered with my gun until we get to the boat. Well, let's get to work. <laughs> Jim. Carlos, we've got to get moving. Well, what is it, Jim? I went to Harrison's office and found out that he was at Mrs. Wagner's for tea this afternoon. Yes? I went there and Mrs. Wagner said that Harrison had never arrived. You saw him there? No, but I know he was there. How? Well, you know how light it is out this evening. Yes? I saw a thread of fresh footprints on Mrs. Wagner's doorsteps. Yes? Heel prints were very clear. They were made by rubber heels that are sold only in the United States. I see. You want to go back and search the house? No, I looked around and back of the house after I left. And I saw the pet shop truck in the garage. What? Yes, they're probably moving Harrison somewhere right now. Well, what do you want to do, Jim? I want you to go down to the El Aguila with me. And we'll have to hurry. I hope we're in time. So do I, for Harrison's sake. I don't understand about that Jose Candado. I- I'm sure... More time, Carlos. I found you can't be sure of anyone. No, I suppose you're right. That is El Aguila down there. Oh, good. All right, Carlos. Let's stop about a half a block away. Good. Now let's get out of the car and sneak down there, just so we'll be close enough in case we have to go into action. All right. Is that the truck coming down here? Yes, that looks like it. Come on, I'll stuck in here. That's it, Carlos. The truck is stopping in front of the boat. Yes, I see. See that woman getting out, you see? Yes. That's Mrs. Wagner. Who is that man with her? You know him? I can't tell from here. They're going around to the back of the truck. Yes, I see. Someone else is coming out of the back of the truck. I recognize that bill. Carlos, it's Harrison. Let's get him. Let's go. Stop in the name of the law. Run, both of you. You got him, Carlos. Well, good evening, Mrs. Wagner. 
Do you mind if I remove the gag from Mr. Harrison's mouth? He, that man you shot, he forced me to help him. You'll know all about that in a minute. As soon as I untie the knot. There. Oh, oh thank you, Mr. Taylor. You got here just in time. Mr. Harrison, tell these men that I was forced into this. You heard that man threaten me. I heard you threaten him, Mrs. Wagner. What? Yes, I heard you say that unless you got your money tonight, you were going to make trouble. You said that you had delivered me, and that was your part of the bargain. So that's why you came down to the boat, Mrs. Wagner, to get paid. I wondered about that. Uh, Mr. Harrison, perhaps you can tell me something. What is it? You heard them speak of a Jose Condaro? I heard Alex, uh, that's the man here you just shot, say that Condaro was forced to work with him because the Germans kidnapped his mother and were holding her as a threat. Uh-huh. Well, Mrs. Wagner? I won't say another word. I want to get a lawyer. That's fair enough. And I've got a tip for you. You have? Yes. With Harrison here alive to tell his story, you'd better get a good lawyer. A very good one. Nora Wagner was found to be a German national, was tried and convicted of felonious assault, and was sentenced to be deported to Germany at the end of the war. That sentence has been carried out. And so another wartime file was closed by your FBI. Closed successfully because of the alert work of a special agent and the fine cooperation of the local police in South America. Also closed was the file on who wrote the original letter from the United States, the letter that was intercepted. That person's home was raided. One of the 25,881 raids made by your FBI during the war. Because of those raids, and because of the cooperation it received from local police all over the Americas, your FBI was proud to report at the end of the war that there had not been one single successful attempt at sabotage. That is a record of which your FBI is very proud. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Rendezvous in the Everglades. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Rendezvous in the Everglades on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This 
is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. One of the happiest hours of the year for every father comes on Christmas morning when excited little fingers untie the ribbons from their gifts. Yes, this is the season, at Christmas tide, when a man realizes that his love for his family is the most important thing in the world. Undoubtedly, that's why in December, more than any other month, fathers increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. After all, what better time is there to see your Equitable Society representative and talk over with him the greatest gift any man can provide for his loved ones, the gift of security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, Swampland Killer. Despite many reminders, there are still those who regard the crime wave as something that is happening to someone else, as something that is foreign to their daily existence. Perhaps one single fact, simply stated, will convince them that the crime wave is a grave concern of every citizen in this nation. That single fact is, that there are in the criminal files at FBI headquarters in Washington the fingerprints of more than six million people, which means that nearly 5% of the adult population of this country have been arrested. That is a sobering figure, a figure that becomes terrifying when you learn that the number of criminals is getting not smaller, but larger. Tonight's file opens in a fisherman's cabin located along a stream near a bleak stretch of Atlantic coast. It is late in the evening, and John Perry is resting after a hearty dinner. His wife, Matilda, enters. John. Hmm? What are you doing? Just resting. Thought you were going to fix the aerial for my radio. Yeah, I am. When? I just want about ten minutes rest. To me, you're always resting. Tilly, please, let's not have an argument. I'm not the one that argues. Okay. You're the one who always starts things. All right, Tilly, all right. You say I'm a nagger, I'm a terrible wife. Tilly, a... I, I didn't say any of those things. You say them all the time, and I'm sick of it. Sick of this old dress I'm wearing. I'm sick of living in this broken-down shack. I'm sick of... Where are you going? Out to fix the area. It's about time. Well. What is it? Motorboat. Coming up to the dock. Well, who'd be coming out here this time of night? I don't know. It's stopping. Stopping here? Uh huh. Someone's getting out. Who is it? I, uh, can't make them out. Hiya, Tilly. Paul! That's right. Paul, it's so good to see you. Thanks. How in the world did you ever find this place? <laughs> I couldn't get lost in these streams if I tried. <laughs> uh, Paul, you remember John? Hiya, John. Hello. Well, can you stay a while, Paul? Sure. Uh, Tilly. What? We, uh, we only have room here for ourselves. Look, how often does my brother come to visit us? Where would he sleep? In our bedroom. Where we sleep? In the storeroom. What? Where is your bedroom, sis? Right back there. Well, then I think I'll turn in. I'm tired. Good 
morning. Good morning. I'm looking for Sheriff Watson. Well, you came to the right place. You're talking to him. Oh, hello, Sheriff. I'm Jim Taylor, the oh. FBI. Oh, FBI, huh? Yes. Here are my credentials, Sheriff. Oh, fine. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm at your service, Mr. Taylor. What can we do for you? Well, I'm looking for a man who committed a murder about five miles out in the Atlantic. And you think he's around here? Well, let me give you the whole story, Sheriff. Oh, sure. Do you remember the yacht Mermaid the Second, one that caught fire and sank about two months ago? Yes, I remember that. Well, the mermaid was carrying a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry when it went to the bottom. Uh-huh. It wasn't insured, so the owner hired a salvage outfit to see if it could come up with the jewelry. I see. Well, they brought about half of it up to the surface to the salvage boat last night. The man who was guarding the jewelry was assaulted and killed. Well. The murderer apparently used a skiff to get out there. We found it this morning down at the mouth of the river. Got any lead on him? Well, there were some clear fingerprints and a bottle of whiskey that was in the skiff. I've sent them off to our headquarters in Washington. Say, you know, your man could be the one that stole a motorboat. What motorboat? Well, Mr. Taylor, I got a call that a motorboat had been stolen down by the mouth of the river last night. Had been sighted going up the river about an hour later. Oh? I was just about to go out and look for that boat when you came in. I see. Why don't you come along with me? I can't, Sheriff. I've got to go back to the hotel to wait for a report on those fingerprints. Well, okay, then. I'll phone you if I find anything. Good. I'll wait for your call. <laughs> more coffee? No, thanks. Look, are you still sore about Paul being here? No, I'm not sore, Tilly. It's just that... It's just that my brother isn't welcome in my own home. Well, if you want to put it that way, yes. He's no good, Tilly, for you or anybody else. He's my brother, and he stays here as long as he wants to. Tilly, this is my home, too, you know. Are you starting another argument? No. No, but I will if he sticks around. He went to prison once, and I... John, I've heard enough. Okay. Now, where are you going? Out to do a day's work. Hmm. Oh. Yeah? Oh, you're awake, huh? <laughs> Who can sleep with that husband of yours yelling his head off? I'm sorry. Billy, really, ain't you had enough of that guy? Listen, you should know what I go through. Always arguing, always picking on me, always... Hey. What? Where'd you get all this jewelry? Beautiful. Friend of mine gave it to me. Gave it to you? Well, not exactly. You see, the stuff's hot and he wants me to get rid of it for him. Oh, I see. And I get a piece of the dough for selling it. Well, it's worth about a hundred thousand bucks. If we sell it, there's a big chunk of cash in it for us. What do you mean, us? You're fed up with this deal around here, aren't you? Sure. Well, you help me sell this stuff, I'll cut you in for half of my end. Huh? You could live in a house in the city, get away from these swamps. Paul. Yeah. When do we start? <laughs> Hello, Sheriff. Hello, Mr. Taylor. I got your message. You were back. You find anything? No, oh, not much. I got a bad description of the man that was seen in the motorboat up the river, but oh. I don't think it's enough to help us. Did you hear from Washington? Yes. The fingerprints belong to a man named Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell, huh? That's right. I don't think I know him. Want me to send out an alarm? No, our field office has already done that, Sheriff. Good. This Mitchell was a bad egg. Oh, Long record? Well, not particularly long, but vicious. He was sent to jail the last time for stabbing a man to death. Well, how'd he get out of jail? He was paroled. What? Mm. How? Well, in some states, Sheriff, the worst killers have been paroled. Yeah, well, this is the answer to that kind of carelessness. That's it. But it doesn't catch our man for us. Mm. Anything else on his record? Oh, yes. Yeah. Take a look for yourself, sir. Oh, thanks. Say, Taylor. What? I remember this man. You do? Yes. He's got relatives around here someplace. His sister married a fisherman in this neck of the woods a couple, three years ago. Can you find out this fisherman's name, where he lives? Sure, sure. It'll only take a minute. 
Wait till I make a phone call, then we can get started. Your Plexus? No, but it'll only take me a minute. I ain't got much. <laughs> Wait till we sell some of this stuff. Mm. First thing I'm going to buy is a fur coat. What do you want with a fur coat? We're going to go south. I don't care. I want a fur coat. <laughs> okay. Look, how are we going to work this? I can't just walk into a place and say I'm selling jewelry. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got some dough. We buy a real good outfit for you. Good. I get some clothes. Then you go into a hawk shop. Yeah. And you tell the man that you lost all your money in bad investments. Oh, and I want to sell some of my jewelry. Right. Oh, that'll be easy. I thought for a minute I would... Oh. Hello, John. I thought you went fishing for the whole day. I did. What brought you back? I, uh, heard something on the radio in my boat. What'd you hear? The police are searching for a killer. For what? For a killer, a m- murderer. I gave the description of the man they're looking for. For what? The description fits your brother here. What? That's right. And that boat he came in, he stole it, didn't you, Paul? Suppose I did. You admit it was you then? Yeah. Well, you told me... Never mind what I told you, sis. You know the deal or not? I'm in. What do you mean by that, Tilly? I'm going to leave. But Paul... But he's going to jail. Are <laughs> you kidding? Tilly, we got to turn him in to the police. No. But Tilly, we you got to. You blow any whistle on me. Paul, put down that chair. I will as soon as I finish. <laughs> Yes, sis. I'd better finish packing. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Fathers, for the next few minutes, I'm going to ask all of you to take off your glasses. No, I don't mean the ones on your nose. I mean the rose-colored glasses that so many of you have been looking through for so long. Take them off so you can face some facts honestly. Facts that will startle you. Facts that will make you think. Ready? All right. Ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Please don't say to yourself, Oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's those rose-colored glasses again. What you're after now is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, The Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers which has these three advantages. First, its simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, I'm through with rose-colored glasses. How can I get hold of one of these fact-facing charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Swampland Killer. Your FBI does not wish to go on record as being against the practice of paroles for certain prisoners who have committed crimes and repented. 
But your FBI very strongly wishes to be on record as saying that at times, the practice of parole is unworthy of its name. The theory is good, but the procedure often does not protect society. In the state of Oklahoma, for instance, a mad killer, author Doc Barker, was given a parole a number of years ago with the fantastic provision that he leave the state and never return. After that parole, Doc Barker and his gang were responsible for the killing of 12 people before your FBI finally cornered and arrested him. Those 12 murders concern you, the average American citizen, because there can be another Doc Barker, unless you care enough to pitch in and work, to be sure that you, in every town and village, enjoy an honest local government. Tonight's file continues with Special Agent Jim Taylor and Sheriff Watson headed up the river toward the cabin of John Perry, where they hope to get a clue regarding the whereabouts of Paul Mitchell, the killer. John Perry's place is right beyond this turn in the river, Jim. Oh, good. We ought to be... Sheriff, what are we stopping for? I just want to see something up ahead there. Yep, that's the motorboat we're looking for. Sheriff, is that Perry's house? Yes. Look, let's get out of this launch and approach the house on land, huh? Good idea. Hey, grab that branch there. All right. All right. Hey, uh. Wait till I tie up here. Can I help you? No. Yeah, that's got it. Let's go. All right. Hold it, Sheriff. What'll we do? I'm gonna walk up to the door, Sheriff. You come up behind me with your gun drawn. Okay. Nobody home, huh? Well, there was smoke coming out of the chimney. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone. Come on, let's go. Come in. Hey, look there on the floor. Yes, I see him. No wonder he didn't come to the door. Yes, you know that. Easy. Uh, Are you Mr. Perry? Yeah. Yeah, who are you? This is Sheriff Watson. I'm Agent Taylor of the FBI. Oh? Mr. Perry, did Paul Mitchell do this to you? Yes. Yes, he did. He ran away with my wife. It was Mitchell's sister. Yes, I remember. Mr. Perry... Do you know where they went? No, but you can look in the swamps. Why would they go there? They were raised there. I see. Now, you you try to rest, Mr. Perry. We'll call the doctor. After that, Sheriff, we've got to get moving. going, Paul? I got a hideout in the swamps. What made you pick a place like that? Well, so the cops won't find us. Oh. Where is it? Uh, about a mile beyond the old hotel. What are you pulling into this place for? This is where you get out and get your bus for town. Oh? Are you sure you got everything straight? Yeah, sure. I go into town, I go to a hop shop. Right. I tell the man that I lost all my money in bad investments. Right. And I just want to pawn this jewelry for a few days. Yeah. All right, now get going. Paul. What? I just happen to think. What do you want to meet me back in the swamp for? Why don't I meet you in town? Let me run this. But I'm going with you to get away from the swamp. Billy, listen to me. we got to lay low for a while. Then we can go away. Where are we going to go to? Oh, I don't know yet. Why can't we go right from town after I get rid of the stuff? Oh, Tilly, will you go? Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, now what? How do I get to the cabin when I come back with the money? Take a cab to Palmer's General Store and call me. Phone number is 102. You'll come and pick me up? Yeah. And you'll be sure to wait for me to Oh, call... look, stop talking so much, will you, and get going? Sheriff. 
Sheriff, we must have stopped at 15 docks so far. Yeah, I know. Not a sign of Mitchell or his sister. You know, there must be some way we can get a clue on those two. Well, that's the last dock right up there, Head. What do you mean, the last one? The last one before we hit the swamps. Oh. Once we get into those swamps, there'll be no telling which way they took off. I see. Well, then let's hope for the best, huh? Look, there's a man on the dock. Let's see if he knows anything. Hello there. You speaking to me? Yes, sir. Well, what can I do for you? Well, we're looking for a young man, a young girl. Came this way in a motorboat about an hour ago. I saw him. Yep, saw him and heard him talking. You did? Just told you did. Well, uh, what did they say? Well, sir, the girl, she got off here. And the fella, he went on up into the swamps. Do you know where either he or the girl went to? No, nope, except that the fella... He yelled back to her to remember to meet him at the cabin. You don't know what cabin, do you? No, sir, we don't. Mm-hmm. But I reckon it's in the swamps, because that's the way he was pointing. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the information. Okay, Sheriff, let's go. Should we head to the swamps? No, that'll be too much like finding a needle in a haystack. What else can we do? Well, I think I've got a plan, Sheriff. Let's turn this boat around, head back to your office. <laughs> Tilly, you get the dough? Yeah, sure. How much? Eight thousand. Eight thousand? For a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff? Oh. oh. I'm sorry. That's all I could get. Oh. Are you at Palmer's store? Yeah, I'm waiting for you. You gonna pick me up? I'll be right down there. But we ain't coming back here. No? No. I got an idea. I'm gonna take a trip. Oh, good. Where are we gonna go? Cuba. Oh, Paul, that's wonderful. Rum drinks and swimming pools and dancing all night. Hold long. it, hold it, hold it. Wait till we get there. I'm leaving here right now. Sailor to plane. Sailor to plane. Come in, Sheriff. I haven't spotted a thing yet, Jim. It's okay. I just wanted to check this equipment. It works fine. Yes. Say, these small planes don't move along very fast. Well, that's why we use them, Sheriff. You can really spot a territory from up there, can't you? Yeah. I can see every inch of the swamps down there. Good. Say, Jim. Yes? I think I spot the boat we're looking for. Where is it? It's coming along the stream that's marked with a number 34 on our map. 34. Where will I find that on my map? Yeah. Four. Okay, I've got it. Well, you see that little bend just before the stream widens out? Um... Yes, it's about a mile downstream from where I am. Right. And the boat is heading towards you. And I'd better get moving. Come on, Sheriff. Keep an eye on both of us if you can. Let me know if he stops before I reach him. Right. You're headed toward each other. Still okay, Jim. Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? He's pulling into a cove. Oh, where? Mark Palmer's Cove on your map, Jim. Uh, is that the one about three quarters of a mile from where I am now? Yes, it is. Sheriff, where's the other boat now? Well, it's pretty near the shore. About a quarter of a mile, I'd say. I don't know how you're going to get there in time. Well, according to my map, Sheriff, there's a road that runs right alongside this river. I'm going to try and head him off by land. <laughs> Oh, Tilly. Gee, I thought you'd never get it. Well, I came as fast as I could. <clears throat> Got the dough on you? Yeah. See, I think it's wonderful about Cuba. Ever since you told me... Now, look, me, uh, how do we get away from here? I kept the cab I came in. He's waiting. Good. Let's go. Hold it. Hey. Hold it. Huh? Who are you, mister? I'm Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. The FBI? What do you want? You and your brother know what I want. Paul, is he arresting us? That's right. But we got to go to Cuba. Where you two go in the future will be decided by a judge and a jury. Paul Mitchell was turned over to the state authorities by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
After being tried and convicted of first-degree murder, he was sentenced to death in the electric chair. His sister, Matilda Perry, as an accomplice, was sentenced to serve ten years in the state penitentiary. And so your FBI wrote finish on another file, on another career devoted to crime. But as quickly as one criminal career is arrested, another somewhere else begins. There are 25,000 Americans every month who commit their first crime. 25,000 Americans who will either be killed or will spend part of their lives in prison. Now, no country in the world, however wealthy, can stand that kind of drain on its manpower. Sooner or later, the loss of those 25,000 citizens every month will weaken the nation. To prevent that, to see to it that this country does not indulge in national suicide, your FBI is at work 24 hours a day. Soon it hopes the tide will turn, turn in favor of law and order, of decency, and the dignity of human rights. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swindling Swami. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. And your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swindling Swami on this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> Is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. On Christmas Day, Dad's reward is not measured in the neckties he receives but rather in the smiles of love and gratitude on the faces of his wife and children. Yes, this is the season when home and family come first. Perhaps that explains why, in the Equitable Life Assurance Society, December is the number one life insurance month of the year. 
the month in which more fathers give their families increased protection than any other. How about it, Father? How about seeing your Equitable Life Assurance Society representative soon? There's still time to give your loved ones the finest gift of all, the gift of security through life insurance. Tonight's FBI file, The Swindling Swami. The world has entered a new era, an era to be called the Atomic Age. For man has conquered the atom and bids fair to learn every secret that's been hidden from him since the beginning of recorded time. We are the wisest people, so far as science is concerned, that the world has ever known. But for all our learning, we are still gullible. Many of us still prove the adage that there's a sucker born every minute. There is one source of learning we refuse to heed. That source is experience. Tonight's file involves a so-called fortune teller named Dr. Arthur St. Clair. His clients come from the very weary, the very nervous, and sometimes the very wealthy. He is just completing his treatment of Mrs. Harriet Brunswick, a wealthy widow. Ah, I'm afraid I'm exhausted, my dear. Oh. I can't go on. Oh, doctor. Oh, this is very tiring, you know. It requires very intense concentration. Oh, I I know. I I was wondering, uh, could you just tell me one more thing? Oh, what? Well, you mentioned one day last week that you, you might be able to communicate with my sister. Your sister? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I feel certain that I could. Oh. If uh, you want me to? Oh, oh, I do. When could you do it for me? It takes preparation. Tomorrow? Well, yes. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, same time as today, Doctor? Yes. Come in at three. Oh, thank you so much. It's nothing, my dear. Nothing. Until tomorrow? <laughs> Until tomorrow. Huh? Great performance. Great. Were you eavesdropping? No, I just got here in time to catch that little hand-kissing routine. I want to talk to you. What about? This. I found it in your overcoat pocket. Why, it's a scratch sheet. Yes, it is. And it's got the entries for today's races. Now, where in the world is that... Say that... You've got your bets marked down, and you're betting 90 bucks. Now, where did you get 90 bucks? Answer me. I, uh, cast a check. Oh, no. Oh, now, let me explain, my dear. We just got out of New York in time to beat that last rap. But I... When we came out here and opened up this fortune-telling dodge, you promised me you wouldn't do any more check writing. I prefer talking about more important things. This is important enough. Now, listen to me. I have got this Brunswick person ready to go. This one could be the jackpot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, now, I mean it. She has asked to talk to her dear departed sister. Are you telling the truth? Margaret. All right. When do you produce her? Tomorrow. That is, if you're prepared. Listen, I know that newspaper obituary of her sister like it was my own life story. Very well, then. Get behind the curtains. What for? That would be a good idea if we had a rehearsal. You mean commune with the spirit? Yes. And if you contact anyone, find out who won the fourth race. Meanwhile, in the Los Angeles office of your FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with colleague Bill Madison. Taylor has just received a report from FBI headquarters in Washington. Bill, I've got a surprise for you. What's that, Jim? What do you think is in Los Angeles? Well? An old friend, Arthur St. Clair. King Arthur, the bad check man? That's right. 
St. Clair wrote a bad check that was passed at the Hotel Wollaston. Handwriting matched perfectly, according to this report from headquarters. King St. Clair. Mm -hmm. How long has it been since we missed him in New York? Oh, almost a year now. Wasn't he traveling with a woman in the East? Yes, a woman he introduced as his wife. Have we got a description of her in the office? Yes, we've got that circular New York sent out on him last year. When did he pass that check at the hotel? Let's see. Uh, uh, here it is. Two weeks ago today. Hmm. How did the hotel happen to cash it? St. Clair had a counterfeit credit card. Oh. Bill's car outside? Yes, right in front of the building. Why? Let's take a little ride. Maybe we can get a lead on St. Clair over at the hotel. <laughs> Spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Do, do you think that will help, Doctor? Oh, I've tried every way I know to contact your dear sister. Oh, but it's difficult. Oh, yes, it must be, Doctor. Look, um, if you can't do it... Oh, uh, I haven't given up yet. Now, concentrate, my dear. Hold out my hand. Maybe we'll succeed this time. Oh, I feel so comfortable holding your hand like this, Doctor. That's fine. Now, we shall try to contact your sister again. Oh, spirit of Ella Brooks, come in. Oh. Dear, speak to your dear sister. Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, Ella, I, I've missed you very much. I have been with you always. Well, I, I felt that, but I've been unable to, to, to speak to you until I met Dr. St. Clair. Dr. St. Clair is a great man. Oh, I know that, Ella. If you have any questions, Mrs. Brunswick, you'd better ask them now. Harry. Sometimes it's difficult to maintain Harry. contact over a long period. Oh, yes, yes, I understand. Uh, Ella? Yes, Harry? I'm very lonesome. What shall I do? You should find a good companion. You are alone too much. Oh, you're right. You're so right. Uh, uh, can you suggest anyone, Ella, dear? Uh, Ella, come back. Ella. Ella. Mrs. Brunswick. Mrs. Brunswick. Margaret. Margaret. What do you want? She's fainted. You got any smelling salts? Uh, I don't think so. Well, run down to the drugstore and get some. Okay. Make it as quick as you can. She had one more message. Oh, oh, what did she say? Her one desire was that we become companions for life. Oh, if that could only come true. Do you mean that? Yes. <sighs> now I can tell you what is in my heart. I fell in love with you the first time you walked in that door. Oh, no. I never dared tell you. Oh, Arthur, I, I, I felt the same way. Really? Yes. Harriet. We must get married tonight. T tonight? 
Oh, but this is this is so sudden. I must have time to think. But, darling... Now, please, I'll, I'll go home now. I, I'll call you later. When? Tonight at... at seven? Very well, darling. I shall live in delightful agony till then. <laughs> Are you the bell, Captain? Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Here are my credentials. Huh? Federal Bureau of... Hey, you're a G-man, huh? That's right. Would you please take a look at this picture on the circular here? Tell us whether you know this man or woman. Uh-huh. I, uh, don't know the woman. But you recognize the man? Yeah, that's Dr. St. Clair. Hey, what do you know about him? Nothing much. He came in here one day and he wanted to make a bet on a couple of horses. Yes. So I introduced him to a bookmaker who hangs around here. Is the uh, bookmaker around here now? No, sir. The manager found out about him last week and threw him out. I see. Well, I wanted to find out where St. Clair was living. Well, I know how you might be able to get his address. Oh, how? Well, sometimes the doctor used to go out to the track, and he used to take that racetrack cab that runs from in front of the hotel. Uh-huh. Sometimes the cab would pick him up at home. Do you know this cab driver? Uh-huh. His name is Al West, and he'll be here tonight at 8. So will I. Let's hope Mr. West has a good memory. Dr. St. Clair speaking. Hello, dear. Oh, my dear Harriet. Have you... Have you decided? Yes. Which? I'll marry you. Wonderful. Uh, let us run away then, tonight. All right, dear. Uh, you wait at home. Yes. And I'll call you when I'm ready to leave. I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Goodbye, my love. I Oh, hello, Margaret. Don't throw that phony charm at me. I was listening to your phone call on the extension. Eve's dropping again, eh? Now, look. Shut up and sit down. Margaret. If you've got any idea that you'd like to run barefoot over that dame's bank book, I've got some news for you. Our original deal still goes. We cut everything right down the middle. I'm just trying to make a score for us. I wouldn't believe you if you told me my name was Margaret. What are you going to do now? I'm going to call your girlfriend and tell her you can't make it. Put down that phone. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Hello? Hello, darling. I'll be over in ten minutes. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, imagine for a moment that you're on the witness stand, waiting to be cross-questioned. In just a few seconds, we're going to shoot a tough question at you. It's a question that nine fathers out of ten spend most of their life dodging, a fact that most heads of the families don't like to face. Here it is. If you should die, how would your family get through the critical years before the youngest child finished high school? How long would your wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Yes, how long can they get along without the breadwinner? Isn't it about time you stop dodging that issue, Father? Isn't it about time for you to face the truth? To help you do just that, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, that's something that not one father in a hundred knows. Where do I get one of these fact-facing charts, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. 
the Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Swindling Swami. Each of us has in him certain desires for things which we do not as yet have the good fortune to possess. When the power of those desires to affect our life is kept within bounds, they add up to a characteristic known as ambition. But when the hopes and desires swell up and overpower us, then they become classified as greed. With ambition, any of us can achieve a measure of greatness, for there is greatness within the grasp of every one of us. But when greed takes the upper hand, then we start on the road to becoming a criminal. For greed in itself violates a law, an ancient law which says, Thou shalt not covet. Tonight's file continues in the Los Angeles field office of your FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from his trip to the Hotel Wollaston. Hello, Jim. Get anything? Yes, I think so. Oh, did I receive a phone call in the last couple of minutes? No. Who are you expecting to call? The bell captain at the Hotel Wollaston. Didn't you get to see him? Yes, but a cab driver named Al West is going to give him some information to pass on to us. Who's Al West? Well, he's picked St. Clair up at his home a couple of times. I'll get it. Right. Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is George. Oh, yes, George. What did West tell you? He said that he used to drop Dr. St. Clair off when they came home from the track at this address. 797 Mount Hope Avenue. 797 Mount Hope Avenue. That's right. Thanks, George. Come on, Bill. We've got St. Clair's address. Arthur, my dear, are you happy? Supremely. Ah. Harriet, hmm? how did you happen to pick Sunbeam Manor for our honeymoon, dear? Oh, I was just looking through that magazine at the apartment, and I liked the picture so much, I tore out the ad and decided we just had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur. Yes, dear? Uh, uh, could I ask something of you? Name it, my love. Well, I'd like to speak to my sister Ella again. Hmm. Uh... That will be difficult. Oh. I don't think I'll be able to get her voice up here in these mountains. Oh. Uh, but tell me. Yes? Do you remember Ella's handwriting? Oh, uh, not too well. Why? When we get to the hotel, I just might be able to get Ella to write you a note. <laughs> Bill. Yes? See that woman just coming out of that house? Well? Doesn't she look like St. Clair's wife? Hey, you're right. Come on, let's stop her. Okay. Mrs. St. Clair? Uh, yes? Oh, Mrs. St. Clair, we're looking for your husband. Well, so am I. He knocked me cold and ran out on me. I... Wait a minute. Who are you? We're from the FBI. FBI? Oh. You know where he went? <sighs> well, I might as well tell you. He was going to pick up some dame and elope with her. But aren't you two married? Sure, but that ain't going to stop Arthur. Where did he go? Maybe we can head him off. Well, you'll have to hurry. He went from here to her apartment at 1400 North Dover Boulevard. What was the woman's name? Mrs. Harriet Brunswick. And when you catch him, you can give Arthur a message from me. Yes, what is it? You can tell him I always knew he liked horses, but I never thought he'd elope with one. Ah, 
right there. Yes, dear? Now that we're all settled, would you mind terribly? Would I mind what? Trying to get that note from Sister Ella. Oh, of course not. Uh, wait till I get my slate. Oh, can you get the note with that? Oh, of course. Now, uh, let's see what Sister Ella has to say. Hmm? Uh, sit right here. Thank you. Now, you must concentrate. Yes, I will. Good. I'm beginning to see writing on the slate. Oh, Arthur, what, what does it say? Well, I can't quite make it out oh, yet. Ella never did have a good handwriting. Oh, there, there. I have it now. She thinks we ought to get a home in the country. <laughs> That's just like Ella. She never could stand the city. She... Oh, it's fading now, my dear. And I'm afraid that'll be all I can get today from Ella. Oh, Arthur. Well, that was grand. Say. What? Do you remember those cottages we passed on the road? Yes. But why yes. don't I go down and see how much they want for one? Oh, yes. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. What's the matter? I just remembered something. I... <laughs> I came away from the house so quickly, I forgot to bring any cash. Oh, that's <laughs> all right. You go find the cottage, and by the time you're packed, I'll have arranged with a hotel to get all the cash we need. Darling, you think of everything. Jim. Jim. Oh, I'm in here, Bill. This is Mrs. Brunswick's apartment? That's right. How'd you get in? Superintendent opened the door for me. Did you find anything? Well, I've just been going through this desk. What are those papers? Bills from a grocery department store and one from a garage. I'm going to call them now. The garage? Yes. Oh, St. Clair was here all right. How do you know? The circular on St. Clair said that he smoked a special brand of Turkish cigarettes. There's some stubs of that brand in that ashtray over there. I see. Hello. Hello. Uh, North Street Garage? Yeah. This is Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. Do you have a car there belonging to a Mrs. Brunswick? She took it out. Could you give me the license number of that car, please? Don't know it. Well, do you know the make? 46 Caddy. Mm -hmm. Have you any idea where she was going? She said to get it ready for a long trip. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. Well, it wasn't much. Car is out. All the attendant knew was the woman had prepared to go on a long trip. I think I have an idea where she might be going. Really? Yes. Come here a minute, Jim. I want you to take a look. Harriet. Harriet, darling. I found the most beautiful cottage. Costs only 10,000 cash and... Harriet. You've been crying. Oh, Arthur, how could you? How could I walk my life? Arthur, while I was downstairs, I bought this paper with your picture on the front page. Oh, Arthur. Here, let me see that. Why, I'll sue them for every penny they've got, my dear. It's all a pack of lies. Did you get the money from the hotel? Yes, I did, but I'm not going to give it to you. Why not? Well, I'm, I'm afraid that story is true. Look, you've got to give me the money. No, Arthur. Give it to me, I said. No, you let go of me. You let go of me. Take your hands off, huh? St. Clair. Thank you. Oh. Who are you? Well, from the FBI, St. Clair. I should have known she'd call you. Well, Mrs. Brunswick didn't call us, but she did lead us here. Well, what do you mean? Well, that ad for this hotel that you tore out of the travel magazine, Mrs. Brunswick, we just checked with a new copy of the same magazine and found out what was missing. You're a real genius. Oh, no, I'm not a genius, St. Clair. I'm not even a good fortune teller. But I can read your future. What's that? You're going to take a trip, and you will be away for a long, long time. Arthur St. Clair was tried and convicted for his crimes and was sentenced to a long term at a federal penitentiary. His original wife, Margaret, was turned over to local authorities for complicity in his crime. You've often heard that crime does not pay. And while there are no truer words in the English language, 
the criminal does not always pay immediately. Sometimes, and is in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, he escapes punishment at first. But that is no escape. For neither your FBI nor any other law enforcement agency admits defeat. Their business is catching criminals. And they perform their duties 24 hours a day, every day in the year. Though he may gain a momentary advantage at first, the criminal soon learns the inherent truth of the adage that crime does not pay. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. But first, let me answer a question. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Little Tough Guy. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Little Tough Guy, on This Is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now that the new year is only four days away... Once again, we hear jokes about resolutions, turning over a new leaf. But deep down inside, there's not a one of us that doesn't seriously consider making some important improvement, either in himself or in his relations with those near and dear to him. Probably that's why in January, so many fathers increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. So, fathers, this year, why not make the finest New Year's resolution of all? Resolve now to give your family increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, Little Tough Guy.
There are seasonal trends in every business, including crime. In summer, the majority of crimes are committed against people. Crimes like murder and felonious assault. In winter, however, the criminal turns his attention to crimes against property. Crimes like auto stealing, arson, and armed robbery. During the year of 1946, there were an unprecedented number of those crimes against property. It is important to the future of the country to know that of all the arrests that were made by police throughout the nation, 55% of those arrested were found to be under the age of 25. There have been various reports that juvenile delinquency is being combated successfully throughout America today. Progress has been made, but there is still much to be done. The number of persons under the age of 18 arrested in 1946 is greater than the number arrested in our last peacetime year, 1941. That fact constitutes a menace to you, the American people. Tonight's file opens in a trash-littered vacant lot near the crowded tenement district of a large Midwestern city. A young boy is idly playing in this lot as a second youth approaches. Hiya, Joe. Huh? Oh, Tommy! Wait a minute. What's your hurry? I ain't in no hurry, Tommy. You know, what'd you try to run away for? I... I was just getting up, that's all. Where you been all week? I'd been around... Not where I could see you. I looked for you, Tommy, honest. To pay me off? Yeah. Well, it ain't too late now. Let's have it. I... I spent it, Tommy. Don't give me that. Honest. You know what that means, don't you? Oh, no. No, wait, Tommy. Give me a chance, will you? <coughs> Get up. Please. Oh, Tommy, leave me alone. Get up, I said. No, Tommy, No. <coughs> To learn you not to run out on me. Wait, Tommy, I'll pay you. Now? No, just let me go home. I'll get the dough and bring it right back. Well, okay. But get back here fast. Oh, I will. Honest, I will. <laughs> huh? Regular killer, ain't you? Quite a workout you gave me. What's it to you, mister? Oh, no, no. Save that for somebody your own size. What were you slugging him for? He didn't pay up. What do you mean? I charge him a dime a week for not hitting him. He was a week behind on his dues. He pays you for not hitting him? Yeah. All the kids in the neighborhood do. <laughs> That's quite a touch. Just one of my touches, mister. No kidding. What are some of your others? <laughs> Why should I spill them to you? I might be able to give you a few more you don't know about. Come on. Let's you and me go get a soda. Mama. I'm in here. Oh. Hiya, honey. Where you been? Downtown. Doing what? Working. Wipe that pool chalk off your coat. I tell you, Norm, I was working. Yeah, I know, I know. You got a big deal. We make a big bundle. That's right. Well, please explain one thing to me, will you? What? You got a phone call right after you left here this morning. It was someone who sounded all of 16 years old, and he said he was your partner... Now, what's the rib? Well, uh, he ain't exactly my partner, but it wasn't a rib. What? I, uh, I, I got the kid working with me. What are you going to do? Hijack some bubble gum? Very funny. Just so happens I've lined up a real good score. Ah, this I want to hear about. Okay. Now, here's a the setup. There's a couple of dozen crates of army binoculars stored in a little building down in a freight yard. Yeah. It's surplus stuff that they're selling to people. There's real big demand for them now. Mm-hmm. Well, the building therein can be entered by a little window at the back near the roof. A window that's just big enough for a kid to crawl through. Now, does it sound so funny? Where'd you get this kid? Well, I picked him up just a few days ago. He's okay. What's the rest of the caper? I'm renting a truck. Back it right up to the building. The kid crawls through the window, then lets you in? That's right. What about the law? There's a watchman. I've got his movement time. We can load the truck and be out of there before he finishes his rounds. When do you and your little partner go into action? Tonight.
Okay, mister. Let's go on, Tommy. There's some crates piled up right inside the door. Good. I'll start loading them. You need any help? No, no, no. You, you stay here. Keep your eyes open. What's the matter with you, mister? What do you mean? Are you scared? You're kidding. You act that way. Ah, look, we're wasting time. i got to load those crates. Mm. You're running this, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind, I'll handle it. Oh, wait a minute. Shh. Hold on. What are you doing? Oh! oh. Okay, mister. Now you can load on them crates. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Jim, this is Adams. Yes, sir. Detective Fulton from headquarters has just left my office. I'm sending him in to see you. Ken Fulton? That's right. I've assigned you to work on a case with him. Can I come in, Jim? Uh, he's here now, Mr. Adams. Good. I'll talk to you later. All right, sir. Hello, Ken. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Now, pull up a chair. Thanks. I suppose you came over here to show me that Christmas tie. <laughs> well, that was one of the reasons. The other one's a robbery that took place last night down the freight yard. Oh, huh? what's the story, Ken? A small warehouse was broken into. Mm-hmm. Ten cases of binoculars were stolen. A watchman was slugged. How does the FBI figure in the case? The binoculars were army property. I see. You got any leads? Well, the ground was soft in front of the warehouse. One of our lab men got a good impression of the tires of the truck that was used. You been down there yet? No, no, I was just been on the case myself. Oh. What about the watchman? Was he badly hurt? Well, he's in the city hospital. Did he see the thieves? He hasn't given too coherent a statement yet. He mentioned something about a kid being there. That's about all. Well, Ken, how do you think we should work this one? Any way you say. I suppose we divide up our activities and save some time. Okay? Okay. Then why don't you go down to the warehouse and see what you can pick up there? I'll go out and interview that watchman at the city hospital. Norma. Um, Wake up, will you? Oh. oh, it's you. How'd the job go? What do you care? What? Well, you didn't even stay awake to find out if it worked or not. Oh, look, I was up all night. If you'd had any consideration, you would have called. Oh, that would have been real smart. Maybe you wanted me to send you a wire, too. Robbery, a big success, stop all. You stop. Now, how'd it go? Okay. Tell me about it, will you? I knocked off ten cases of binoculars. That was all I could fit on a truck. How'd the kid work out? A little too good. What do you mean? He slugged the watchman. Bad? I don't know. Where's the kid now? I dropped him off at his house. Give him 20 bucks and told him I'd meet him this afternoon. What for? They didn't miss cut. Are you out of your mind cutting Look, your kid? Look, I got no intention of meeting him. I had all I wanted, that little guy. Well, what kept you so long? I had to get rid of the stuff. With a fence? Yeah. What'd you get for it? Thirty-five hundred. Thirty-five hundred? Yeah. Oh, baby, you must be dead tired. Let me fix you a nice breakfast and put you to bed. You busy, Jim? Oh, hello, Ken. How'd you make out? I think I picked up a couple of pretty good clues. Oh, good. The thieves gained entry to the warehouse by climbing through a small window. Yeah. There's plenty of soot on that windowsill. Whoever climbed in managed to leave a set of excellent prints. <laughs> Very considerate of them. <laughs> I also picked up some shreds of wool that were caught in the woodwork. Uh-huh. They uh, looked like they'd been torn from a sweater. What did you do with the evidence, Ken? Turned it over to Mr. Adams. He's sending it on to your lab- laboratory. Oh, good. Say, how'd you make out? Well, I finally got to talk to the watchman. Give you anything? I think so, yes. Say, what about that kid he saw? Well, he just got a fleeting glimpse of him before he was slugged. By the kid? That's right. He said he'd seen him before, though. That he was one of the gang of youngsters that played around the freight yards once in a while. Did he know his name or where he lived? No, but he knows one of the other kids in the gang. He gave me his name and the school that he attends. Say, did the watchman give you anything on the truck? No. 
Did he see anyone else? No, the slugging occurred too quickly for him to see anything but the boy. And that kid becomes real important. That's right, Ken. Maybe you better go over there. Okay. And if I get anything that looks good, Ken, I'll call you at headquarters. A little after two. Oh, the afternoon. Yeah. Did you sleep well, honey? Yeah, yeah, fine. Can I get you anything? Uh, not right now, thanks. Well, if you need anything, dear, just let me know. <laughs> What's the joke? Uh, this new deal. I don't get it. From bum to king and one easy lesson. What are you talking about? That 3,500 sure made a big man out of me. Oh, no. Honey, stop that talk. You know that it... Oh, that must be the delivery. What delivery? Well, while you were sleeping this morning, I went out. I bought a few things. Oh? Like what? Oh, some dresses, some hats. Huh? Just where do you see them. Okay, okay. Mr. Prentice live here? That's right, Sonny. Come right in. Okay. Wait a minute. Where's your packages? What are you talking about? I want to see Phil Prentice. Who's that, Norma? It's me, mister. Tommy Winfield. Huh? Tom- hey, are you the little punk? Out of my way, lady. <laughs> Hiya, mister. What are you doing here? Came to find out why you didn't meet me. How'd you know where I lived? I tailed you here after the job. I uh, figured it would be a good idea to know where to find you, just in case. Phil, throw him out of here. Take it easy, lady. Come on, Junior. Out you go. Wait a minute. Look out, Phil. He's got a gun. That's right, lady. Where, where'd you get that cap pistol? I bought it with the 20 bucks you gave me. Now, if you think it's a cap pistol, just make a bad move, and I uh, think you'll change your mind. Phil, take that gun away from him. Phil! He ain't got the nerve. He scares too easy. I seen that last night. Phil, do something. There's only one thing he can do. Give me my cut. I'm keeping his gun on both of you till I get it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, how do you feel tonight? A little tired, eh? You've had a good dinner, you're contented, and don't want to be disturbed by anything. Well, if that's the way you feel, you'd better turn off your radio for the next 59 seconds... Because you are going to be disturbed by a question that's coming at you now. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That question is so important to your family's happiness that you ought to have an answer based not on guesses or hunches, but on facts. The Equitable Life Assurance Society will help you get these facts. It has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, Mr. Cross, that's something I really ought to know. Where can I get this fact-facing chart, and how much do they charge for it? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Little Tough Guy. In studying the problem of juvenile delinquency, one fact becomes apparent. Children, for the most part, are faithful imitators. 
and those who form the parade of delinquents are no exceptions. They are imitating their personal heroes, heroes who have gained temporary fame through crime. But the young people of America are not altogether to blame for having selected false idols. That is partly the fault of those who have daily contact with our young ones, for they have not made decency and honesty sufficiently attractive. Children will imitate what seems most colorful to them, and for that reason the path to take is clear. When every child is taught that the policeman is more colorful than the criminal he catches, then and only then will juvenile delinquency cease to be a major problem. Tonight's file continues. Special Agent Jim Taylor, attempting to learn the identity of the boy involved in the warehouse robbery, is seated in the principal's office in a neighborhood school. A youngster enters. Is the principal here? No, but uh, come in, Joe. I was sent down to see the principal. I know. I sent for you. Well, who are you? Well, my name is Taylor. I'm the special agent of the FBI. Huh? I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if I may. FBI? Joe, you play around the freight yards once in a while, don't you? Well, yeah. I'd like to find out about one of the boys in your gang. Uh-huh. I'd say he's older than you are, about uh, 16. Has dark hair, always wears a yellow striped sweater. Oh, that's... The... That's who, Joe? I, I don't know. Now, look, you just started to tell me why did you change your mind. I didn't. I don't know what you mean. Joe, he's wanted for questioning on a very serious charge. If you know who he is, it's your duty to tell me. But I don't, honest. Are you afraid to tell? Leave me alone. Afraid of what people might think of you for doing your duty? No. No. Look, son, you, you may not realize this, but you'd be doing that youngster a great service. You'd be saving him from greater trouble when he grows older. Now, don't be afraid of what you consider squealing, Joe. Now, come on. Let's have his name. Well, it, it sounds like Tommy. Tommy who? Tommy Winfield. Do you know where he lives? No, but he goes to this school. Is he here today? No, he's absent. Well, Joe, you've been a great help to me. You should be very proud of what you've done. Thank you, son. Look, Tommy, how many times do I have to tell you the fence didn't pay me off yet? You're lying. I happen to know he's telling the truth. That ain't the way them things work. What do you know about selling stolen goods? I made a big study on all of them things. Where? In kindergarten? Never mind the wisecracks. I know more about larceny right now than that husband of yours does. Well, that I wouldn't brag about. I'm giving you one more chance to get that dough up. Otherwise, this gun goes off. Oh, look, kid, will you believe me? Wait a minute, Phil. Uh. You'd... Better pay him off. What? This kid really means business. Now you're talking, lady. But normal. The dough's in a drawer in that desk. Which drawer? That top one there. This one here? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, I don't see any more. Oh, no. Now drop that gun. Oh, my. Pick it up, Phil. Right. Oh. Oh. Now, Junior, we give the orders. It broke my hand. Oh, ain't that too bad. What do we do with him? Let me think. I'm going to warn you right now. If anything happens to me, the cops will know who did it. What do you mean? Ah, he's throwing a blow. Oh. <laughs> now, look, uh, we're going to have to get out of town. This kid knows too much. Yeah. We'll tie him up in the bedroom. <sighs> then let's pack and get out of here. Fast. <laughs> Hi there, Jim. Oh, come on in, Ken. When did you get back? About a half hour ago. Oh, I stopped by for you at headquarters. Left a message there. Yeah, yeah, I just got it. Do you have any luck? Yes. I've identified the boy we were looking for. Good for you. His name is Tommy Winfield. Where'd you get your information? From the other kid? That's right. Winfield attends the same school. Did you talk to him? No, he was absent today, but I've been able to definitely link him with a warehouse robbery. How? Well, this boy's been in trouble before. His prints are on file in your department. And you picked up a set? That's right. I have them right here. I've just finished comparing them with the set that you picked up on the windowsill. They're identical, all right. Did you get his home address? Yes, I'm going out there right now. Phone. 
Fulton speaking. Hello, Ken. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. How'd you make out? Well, young Winfield wasn't at home, but I think I have a lead on where to pick him up. Good. Oh, by the way, I picked up a sweater that was on his bed. I think we'll find the wool will match the shreds you found on that windowsill. Fine. That ties that up. Yes. Well, I'm going out to look for him, Ken. I'll be in touch with you later. Okay. Your pack? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's go then. Is the kid tied up okay? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about him. Come on. Right. Go ahead. Oh, excuse me, please. Uh, you, Mr. Brennis? What's that to you? I'm Special Agent Taylor of the FBI. FBI? Oh, uh, well, uh, what can we do for you, sir? I'm looking for a youngster named Winfield. Tommy Winfield. Never heard of him. Oh? I found a note at his house that he'd written saying that if anything were to happen to him, you'd be responsible for it. Oh, why, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. We don't know any Tommy Winfield. Well, nevertheless, his note did say he was coming here to your apartment. Would you mind terribly if I went inside and looked around? Oh, now, wait a minute. Phil, uh, my husband was objecting because we're in a hurry. You see, we got to catch a train. It would only take me a minute. Okay, okay, go ahead and look. We'll go on anyway. Come on, Oh, Hold it, Mr. Prentice. Huh? I'd like you both to be here when I search the premises. Look, I told you, we've got to catch a train. Now, get out of the way. I'm sorry, Mr. Prentice. Get away, I said. Phil, you fool. You know, Prentice, if I were you, I wouldn't start to play rough. Oh. Now, you might as well know that I have a search warrant here that I got just in case I ran into this kind of trouble. Now, get back in there, both of you. Okay. Phil. Oh, what else can we do? Now, just walk in front of me. We'll take a look around here. Wait a minute. What's in here? It's a closet. Well, was I right? Let's keep looking. Go ahead. Hold it. What's this door? It's another closet. Oh, we'll take a look in there anyway. Now, keep out of there. Well. Uh, look, I-, I can explain why the kid's in there. Prentice, untie this gag. He pulled a gun on us, tried to stick us up. Yeah, sure, sure. That's what he did. Here, let me have it. Uh, it. Help me. You gotta help me, please. You're Tommy Winfield? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tommy, the little tough guy. Please huh? help me. Help me get out of here, please. You're just like the rest of them, Tommy. When the chips are down, you're not tough at all. <laughs> For his complicity in the robbery... Tommy Winfield was sentenced to a state reformatory. Phil and Norma Prentice were both sentenced to long terms in a federal penitentiary. The number one problem confronting the Federal Bureau of Investigation and every other law enforcement agency in the nation today is juvenile delinquency. If the children of today are allowed to run free and to become the criminals of tomorrow, then America faces a dark future. But that need not be our fate. We are the captains of our own destiny if we will take control. Children of today are no different than they have ever been. But they cannot be allowed merely to grow up. They must be raised. They must be given the advantage of parental guidance. The problem of juvenile delinquency today is basically the problem of delinquent parents. For that reason, we especially urge you, the parents of America, to keep a closer watch on your children during 1947. And if you do, you can really make it a happy new year. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, let me answer a question. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, 
the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Fugitive Guest. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Guest on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Father, what New Year's resolutions have you made this year? Going to cut down on smoking? Going to give more thought to your waistline? All right. But why not make a really important New Year's resolution? One that will mean greater happiness for your family. One that will not only carry through 1947, but for many years to come. Follow the example of so many fathers who start the New Year right by increasing their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society in January. Resolve now to give your loved ones increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Guest. This week sees the United States enter its 171st year of freedom. In those years, the country has faced many bitter struggles for survival, struggles that have included half a dozen wars. In every one of those wars, our freedom was threatened, but the combined efforts of all of our citizens brought us through to victory. Now, in 1947, it will take the combined efforts of every one of us to win another war. The war against crime. The crime wave cost the people of the United States hundreds of millions of dollars in 1946. And the cost will be increased this year unless we all, every one of us, fight the crime wave with as much concentration as if we were fighting a foreign enemy. Tonight's file opens in a small farmhouse located in a remote section of one of our eastern states. It is night. 
The occupants of this dwelling, Edward Gray and his wife, are sitting in front of an open fire. Edward? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Were you sleeping? Uh, I must have dozed off for a second. You want something, Louis? Well, the fire's getting kind of low. It could stand a couple of logs. Oh, oh sure. There. How's that? Fine, Edward. Thank you. <sighs> Listen to that wind. Mm, yes. And look, there at the window. Snowing pretty hard. Mm-hmm. How about the livestock? Now, don't worry about them. They're all safe in the barn. <laughs> Good. Edward. Hmm? I, I think I hear someone outside. Listen. Yes, there is somebody. Now I'll go look. Put on your coat, Edward. Oh, I won't need it. There's someone on the steps. It's a woman. Here, let me get you inside, lady. Oh, oh thank you. It's a woman. I found her on the steps. Good heaven, who is she? I don't know. I just had her here on the couch. Well, is she hurt? Should you get a doctor? No, doctor. Please. Let me get warm. Let me stay here. That's all I ask. She's passed out. Well, well just don't stand there, Edward. Let's, let's make her something hot to drink and put her to bed. In a large city a hundred-odd miles from the isolated farmhouse, Special Agent Jim Taylor in the local FBI field office is just answering a summons from the agent in charge. Come on in, Jim. Thank you, sir. I suppose you're all set for your vacation. Yes, sir. I shove off in about three hours. You're going up near Hendersonville, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Wonderful hunting up around there. So I've heard. I'm just going to dig into those woods and stay lost for two whole weeks. Jim. Yes, sir. I hate to ask you this. You can turn me down if you want to. But as long as you're going to Hendersonville... Yes, sir. There's some extracurricular hunting you could do on the side. <laughs> I knew I should have left yesterday. Well, let me give you the story. A female inmate in the county jail near Hendersonville, who was being held on federal charges of violating the National Property Act, escaped about two hours ago. Oh, who is she, sir? Her name is Doris Parker. She was also charged with knifing another woman in a fight over a man. I see. She's evidently quite proficient with a knife. She also used one on a matron to make good her escape. Well, have we anyone on the case now? Yes, Royce Thompson, our resident agent in Hendersonville. He's working with the local and state police. Well, that's sparsely settled country up there, sir. There's not many roads. If she stays in the car, they shouldn't have too much trouble. Finding... I know. Chances are she'll be picked up before you even get there. But in case there's a hitch, Jim... Why don't you drop in on the resident agent before you take that hunting trip? See if you can give him a hand. feeling? Much better, thanks. I thought you'd still be sleeping. Well, I got hungry, so I came down here and sort of helped myself to breakfast. Oh. That woman who was so nice to me last night, is she your wife? Well, Louise, yes. Isn't she around? Yes. She's in the front room there. I hope she doesn't mind my puttering around in her kitchen. Oh, she'll be glad you did. You see, well... Louise is bedridden. Oh. So you have to more or less help yourself. But she was in here last night. Oh, I carried her in. I see. Uh, look, Miss... My name is Ruth. Well, uh, Miss Ruth, I've been thinking, is there anyone you'd like for me to notify? Let them know you're here all right? I, I, we have no phone here. There's but... no one worried about me. Oh. I suppose you're wondering what I was doing out in the storm last night. Well, yes. I'm a waitress. 
At a hotel in Hendersonville. Got the day off, so I rented a bike. Thought I'd take a look at the country. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I rode too far. A storm came up, and I just got stuck in it. Well, I'll arrange to take you back into Hendersonville sometime today. Must you? What do you mean? I'm really not in any hurry. Uh-oh. Be right with you, Louise. Royce Thompson? That's right. I'm Jim Taylor. Well, well, hello there, Jim. Welcome to Hendersonville. Thanks. I heard you were coming down here. Yes, this is the first day of my vacation. I heard about that, too. Oh. Or anything turn up on that escape prison? Well, she hasn't been found yet, but I think you'll be out hunting real soon. How's that? Well, as you probably know, the Parker woman escaped last night from jail in the matron's car. Yes. The car was last seen on Route 45 heading towards Springdale. I see. This morning, one of the state troopers found evidence that a car had skidded off a small bridge over the Springdale River. On this same Route 45? That's right. The guardrail on the bridge was smashed, and there was a large hole in the ice where the car had evidently broken through. Have you been out there yet? Yes. Couldn't see the car, but I found a license plate on the ice nearby. It's the one we're looking for. And how about the Parker woman? Not a trace of her. You think this was a trick on her part, or is she really down there in the car? Well, we had quite a storm last night. It could be legitimate, but we'll find out soon enough. Oh, how's that? There's a diver going over there this afternoon. Well, that should tell the story. Have you checked into your hotel yet? No, I came right over here to your office. Look, why don't you go over and check in and make arrangements for your hunting trip? I've an idea that you'd be on your way this afternoon. Who's that? Me. Ruth. Oh. Do you mind having company? No. Got lonesome up there in the house. I think you'll find it kind of cold out here in the barn. I'm okay. What are you making? I'm just repairing this harrow. Oh. Hey. Hmm? You know something? What? This would be a swell place for a barn dance, (laughs) wouldn't it? Uh, We've had them here plenty. What? One of them regular old-fashioned ones? Uh Uh-huh. With an old geezer playing a fiddle? Uh, Sure. Oh. Oh, when Louise was well, there was always something doing around here. Really? Sure. Picnics, sleigh rides, barn dances. Do you like to dance? I'd love to. I got it. Ed. Huh? How long has your wife been like to you? Over a year now. That's a long time. Uh, I suppose it is. I hadn't thought much about it. Does she keep on like this? I'm afraid so. The doctor says she'll never walk again. It's pretty tough. She takes it fine. Oh, I don't mean for her. I mean you. How do you figure that? Oh, look. I can see the kind of a guy you are. You like to dance, have fun. Now you're going to spend the rest of your life playing nursemaid. Well, I don't mind that. Oh, who are you kidding, mister? Look, I... I Wait a minute. I really came out here to ask you a question. Seems like a real good time to do it. Well... I don't want to go back to Hendersonville. I'd like to stay here a while. Would you like me to? I... I gotta go do some chores. I come in, Royce? Sure thing, Jim. Just called your hotel. Well, I've been out all afternoon picking up supplies. Oh, any report from that diver? Yes, he located the car. Oh? It's the one we're looking for, all right. How about the woman? Not a sign of her? Uh-huh. I have expected that. Well, the car door next to the driver's seat was open, Jim. She could have made an attempt to get out and been pulled downstream under the ice. Yes, I know. In that case, with the river frozen over, we might not recover the body until spring. Royce, I just have a hunch that she isn't in that river. I think she sent the car off the bridge to take the heat off. That's very possible. Is that a map of this district there on the wall? Yes, yes. I've been using it for this search. Take a look at it, huh? Sure, sure. 
What do all these pins here represent, Royce? Well, most of them are the uh, roadblocks that were set up right after the escape. Mm -hmm. This is Route 45, and here's the bridge. Yeah. Royce, how much snow fell out there last night? At least a foot. Some places it drifted pretty heavily. Then if she did abandon the car, she couldn't have gotten very far. No, no, not unless another car picked her up. Has a house-to-house check been made? All along the highway, yes. Anybody live back up there in the hills? Well, I'd say a dozen farmers pretty well scattered. Have they been checked? Not yet, no. Are the roads passable up there? Yes, they were plowed today. Well, Royce, why don't you mark off the exact location of those farmhouses and we'll divide them up. There's still time this evening for us to go call on them. Finish your chores? Yeah. I waited for you. I sort of hoped you might come back. I went for a walk. I could have gone with you. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to think. What about? You're staying here. Well. Edward? Edward? Coming, Louise. Excuse me, please. You want something, Louise? Edward, where's that girl? In the other room. Close the door, please. Sure. Something wrong? I think so, yes. What is it? I was just listening to the radio. They were playing music when the announcer interrupted the program for a news bulletin. Yeah? It told about a woman who had escaped from the jail last night. Gave a complete description of her. Right down to the clothes she was wearing. Uh huh? Edward, that escaped convict is the woman we took in. Ruth? Yes. Well, it can't be. I tell you it is. You've got to notify the police. But Louise... The man on the radio said she's a very dangerous woman. You've got to get word to the police at once. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Get her in here. Ruth. Yes? Would you come here a minute, please? Sure. What do you want? Louise just heard something on the radio about a woman who escaped from the county jail. From the description, she... She thinks it's you. Will you please tell her you're a waitress in Hendersonville? Sure. Where are those clothes she wore last night? They're upstairs. Why? Will you go up and get them, please? What for? The escaped prisoner was wearing a prison dress. Please go get her clothes. Wait a minute. You don't have to. Now, will you get the police? Maybe he doesn't want to. Maybe he wants me to stay. Ask him. Edward. Louise. She stays. From tonight's file, to which we will return in just a moment we can see that one of the primary jobs of the FBI is to uncover the facts of a case. Armed with these, they can then take the proper measures that will inevitably lead to the solution of their problems. And the same thing is true of fathers. But instead of trying to get at the facts about his family's future, many a father lives in a sort of dream world. He refuses to ask himself this simple question. If I should die... How would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? If you really love your wife and children, don't shrug your shoulders to that question. Be fair to your family and get an answer based on facts. To help you, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. I guess you're right, Mr. Cross. That fact-facing chart is something I've been needing for a long, long time. How do I go about getting one, and how much will it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. 
the Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Guest. It is an established fact that honest citizens cannot mix with criminals any more than oil can mix with water. And for that reason, your FBI wishes to pass on some advice. Advice which, if heeded can save you untold misery. That advice is, do not, under any circumstances, condone the doings of a criminal. And by so condoning, expect that your sympathy will regenerate the criminal into a useful member of society. In dealing with criminals, reality must serve as your foundation. And reality tells you that over 50% of all persons arrested have a previous arrest record. That is not a theory, but a fact. A fact that is proven by the files of your FBI. Tonight's file continues at the farmhouse. Edward Gray is seated in the common room, gazing reflectively into the fireplace. The woman who calls herself Ruth enters. Ed. Yes, Ruth? How is she? My wife? Yeah. Is she still sore? She asked me to leave her alone. Well, that means you can be with me. Oh, please, Ruth. Oh, look. Quit worrying, will you? If you don't call the cops, there'll be no trouble. How do you know? Because they think I'm dead. Or at least they will when they find the car. What do you mean? I sent the car I was driving off a bridge. It went through the ice into the river. Oh. When they find it, they'll think I wound up in the river, too. What? There's a car stopping outside. What? You better get into the back room. Okay. Hurry up. Just a minute. Yeah? Hello there. You Mr. Gray? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Uh huh. Well, what can I do for you? Well, you may or may not know, sir, that a woman held on federal charges escaped from the county jail over in Hendersonville last night. Uh, I hadn't heard about it. We have good reason to believe that she's still in this vicinity. I see. I have a picture of her here. Take a look at this, please. Sure. Ever seen her? No, sir. I've never seen this woman before in my life. She's a pretty tough customer. I already used a knife on two people. Stabbed them? That's right. Well. Well, if by any chance she should turn up here, I'd advise you to notify us at once, please. Uh, yes, sir. I certainly will. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Gray. Good night. Ruth. Yes? There's a man from the FBI. I know. I heard him. I seem to think you're not dead. Yes. What do we do now? Oh, I don't know. Let me think. Yes, Louise? Stay here. I'll see what you want. What is it, Louise? Who was that who came to see us? Well. Tell me, Edward. It was a man from the FBI. Looking for her? Yes. What did you say to him? Answer me. Well, I told him that she wasn't here. Oh, why did you do that? Can't you see that she's using you, playing up to you just for her own protection? Louise, she's not... I'm not turning her in. That you, Jim? Yes, Roy. Yeah, well, you're just in time for some coffee. Well, well, where'd you get it? Uh, I picked up a thermos full on the way back. Got any luck? No, no, I didn't pick up a thing. How about you? No, I didn't get anything either. Well, that's that, I guess. Oh, thanks. Boys, let me check my list for you, huh? See if I missed anyone? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Clinton. Yep. Dixon. All right. Franklin. All right. Martin. Yeah. Henderson and Dillon. Yeah. 
How about Gray? Oh, I wanted to ask you about him. Do you know him, Royce? Yes, uh, casually. Why? Well, when I showed him the girl's picture, he was quite positive about never having seen her before. I'm always a little suspicious of someone that certain. Ah, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with Gray. He's lived around here for years. I know his wife, too. She's an invalid. You mean she's bedridden? Yes, yes, she has been for over a year. Royce, does anyone else live there with him? No. Are you sure? Yes, why? Come on, we're going back to Gray's farmhouse. Well, what you want? Just wanted to talk. About me, I suppose. Yeah. What you say? It's not important, Ruth. I want to know. Well, Louise said I was a fool to be shielding you. You were playing up to me so I wouldn't turn you in. You don't believe that, do you? Ruth, I don't know what to believe. What do you mean? The stuff that FBI man said about you, about you stabbing people, that, that wasn't nice to That was hear. a lie. Louise told me they said that about you on the radio, too. Oh, look. She's just trying to make trouble for me. And she's going to keep on that way unless we do something about it. Huh? Oh, Ed. Ed, I've been thinking about us. Now that the cops know that I'm not dead, we can't stay on here. We've got to go away. We? Yes. Ruth, I couldn't leave Louise. Louise? <laughs> She's a helpless cripple. She will be for the rest of her life. She's no use to you, herself, or anybody else. Don't talk that way, Ruth. Huh? All of a sudden, you're sticking up for her. She's my wife. Wait a minute. You're not backing out now. Don't forget, you're involved in this thing, too. You told that cop I wasn't here. But, Ruth... So you're not only leaving here with me. I'm making sure before we do that she isn't going to talk. What do you mean? I'll show you what I mean. Where are you going? In to see your wife. You come back here. All right. Stay where you are, brother. Why, you... The man from the FBI. That's right. Why'd you come back? How did you know I was here? You told me yourself. What? You see, after my first visit, I learned that Mr. Gray's wife was bedridden. That made me very curious. What do you mean? I had to find out who was pacing up and down in the next room while I was at the door. Oh. Thanks for the tip-off. For her guilt in violating the Federal Escape Act and the National Stolen Property Act, Doris Parker was sentenced to ten years in a federal penitentiary. Edward Gray was sentenced to two years in a federal penitentiary for harboring a federal prisoner. And so another file was closed by your FBI. Closed because of superior skill in the art of detection. The possession of such talent by a special agent is not a fortunate accident, but the studied result of long, hard labor. Labors which every agent undergoes as part of his training. Nothing in the training of a special agent is left to chance, because that is not the way your FBI works. Your FBI works to eliminate chance and to substitute certainty, and that policy has paid a dividend called protection, a dividend being collected every day by the people of our country. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Souvenir Gun. The 
incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Souvenir Gun, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At the beginning of the new year, there are few fathers who don't pause to reflect on the 12 months that have gone by to make plans for the future, plans that will promote the happiness of those they love. That's why so many fathers pick January as the time to increase their family's protection with the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes, the finest New Year's resolution of all is this. Resolve to give your family increased security through life insurance. Then keep that resolution by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative tomorrow. Tonight's FBI file, The Souvenir Gun. It is a fact certified by history that after every war, there has been an increase in crime. It is not a fact, however, that the new criminals are a result of the practice which the Army and Navy gave our younger generation in the art of murder. The hoodlums who are swelling the files of police departments all over the country are hoodlums because of circumstances. Wartime is a period of loose morals and easy money, a set of conditions which suits the criminal to perfection. Let us, therefore, stop pointing at the armed forces and blaming them for our current troubles. Let us stop finding reasons for the crime wave and start finding cures. The night's file opens in a clearing near a small cabin located in the hill country of one of our Midwestern states. A man is standing in this clearing, firing a pistol at a string of tin cans that are propped on a fallen log. Jack! Oh, hi, Evie. What's this? Not bad, huh? No. This is that German Luger I bought from a guy. I ain't missed one of them tin cans in the last 20 shots. Well, why should you? You've been practicing every day for the past two weeks. That sounds like a beef. It is. What's the matter, Evie? You really want to hear it? Sure. I'm bored. Bored stiff. Well, look, sweetheart, there's no law that says you got to stick around. Oh, Jack, this has nothing to do with you and me. Well? I just can't take this way we're living. Now, look, Evie, I told you why we... I know. You had to lay low for a while, so we hole up here in the woods. But what happened to the rest of the things you told me? What do you mean? About what a big guy you were going to be. I am going to be a big guy. The biggest. 
That's why I'm taking my time. Don't get it. Look, Evie, I'll lay it all out for you just once more. There's lots of different ways of making a living with a gun. Mm -hmm. Up to now, everybody, even Dillinger, has always made one mistake. That's what's licked them. I ain't making that mistake. What's that got to do with us staying up here in this broken-down place? Gives me a chance to practice and think. How much longer does it go on? I'm doing a job tomorrow. You are? Where? In town. Then we're leaving here? I am. You're not. What? This is just a small touch, sort of for practice. We don't make a big move yet. Look, Jack, I can't take much more of this. You want to call it quits? No. All right, then we do it my way. Now, watch me pop off that little tin can on the end. Jim Taylor? That's right. I'm Detective Sergeant Grant. Oh, hello there. Hello. I heard about you. Oh, I just in to see your agent in charge. He told me to talk to you. That's well. Pull up a chair. Thanks. Case came into headquarters this afternoon. There's an FBI angle in it. That's why I'm here. What's it about, Sergeant? A stick-up in a building over on State Street. Yes. Messenger carrying an envelope containing money and securities was waylaid right outside his office. I see. Armed man forced him into a self-service elevator, took him down the basement, tied him up, made a clean getaway. Uh How much cash was in the envelope? A little over $1,000. Hmm. What's our angle, Sergeant? Well, there's every indication that the robbers skipped across the state line. Oh, I see. The messenger give you a description of this man? Mm Mm-hmm. I have it here. We've already sent out an alarm on him. Good. Now, is there anything else I should know about? Yeah, we have two good leads. Oh, what are they? Well, the weapon the hold-up man used was a German Luger. Messenger knows guns. He recognizes. Another souvenir gun, I suppose. Yeah, it looks that way. We also found the messenger's envelope in a trash barrel in the basement. It was empty, of course, but there were several fingerprints on it. Can we get a set? You already have them. Oh? They're on the way to your lab right now. Swell. Sergeant, let me assemble all these facts on paper, then we'll go to work. Jack? Jack! Ah, good morning, Evie. I didn't know you were back. I got in late last night. Why didn't you wake me up? I didn't want to disturb you. Well, I wish you had. I was worried. What about? Well, a job. How'd it go? Well, how'd you expect? Went fine. How much did you get? Oh, about a thousand in cash. Well... A few securities. I got rid of them, just kept the cash. Baby, you can pack your things. We're getting out of here? Yep, we're moving into town. Oh, wonderful. I got us a suite of rooms in a good hotel. Jack, a suite? Wait till you see it. Real class. I spent our last hundred bucks for it. Our last hundred? I thought you got a thousand on the job. I did. Well, where's the other nine hundred? I loaned it to a guy. You what? That's why I did the job. You pulled a stick up so you could loan somebody else the money? That's right. Are you out of your mind? No, no, it's like an investment. Oh, brother. Now, wait a minute. Don't blow your top, honey. The guy's coming around to the hotel to see us tonight. You'll find out then how good an investment I made. Yeah, honey. Well, you finally got out of that tub, huh? Only temporarily. Oh, after two months of bathing in that mountain stream, I'm going to live in a bathtub. (laughs) Look, honey, that guy's on his way up. Oh, you mean the one you loaned the money to? Yeah, I want you to meet him. Oh. Hey, there he is now. Come on. Will I find out why you made the investment? Mm Mm-hmm. Just a minute. Hello, Jack. Hi, Ray. Come on in. Thanks. Ray, I'd like to meet the wife. Honey, Ray Nelson. How do you do? Hello. Well, when this happened, Jack? Getting married? Yeah. A couple of months ago. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. Sit down. Okay. Can I fix your drink, Mr. Nelson? Uh, no, thanks. Ray, I'll tell you why I asked you to drop over. It's about that dough I loaned you. The 900? Uh-huh. Well, something's come up that sort of puts the squeeze on me. I'm going to have to take it back. What? Sorry. But you just gave it to me last night. I know. You also knew that I had to use it to pay off a guy. I ain't got it, Jack. 
Oh, that's bad. Well, when you gave me the dough, you said I could keep it as long as I like. I told you something's come up. Jack, I just ain't got it. Mm. Well, in that case, maybe you can pay me back another way. How do you mean? Do a job with me. What kind of a job? I know where there's a safe that's loaded with dough. It's a real soft touch. No dice. Busting safes is your business. It used to be my business. What do you mean? I retired. Them big jobs are too tough. This one's a cinch. It's a roadhouse just outside of town. I've cased the setup. I got the whole thing planned. Jack, I... I just can't do it. Is that the answer I gave you when you wanted to borrow the dough? Is it? No. Then why don't you return the favor? Okay. That's better. Evie? Yeah, honey? You make that drink now. Okay. Well, drink to a good investment. Can I come in, Jim? Yes, come ahead, Sergeant. I got your message. Ask me to drop over. Yes, we received a report on those fingerprints. The ones on the messenger's envelope? That's right. They belong to a man named John Belmont, also known as Jack Belmont. Belmont? Mm-hmm. Never heard of him. Did he uh, have a criminal record? He's wanted by the United States Army. He deserted over two years ago. Well, yeah. we've had no report on him since. He must have been hiding out. Now that the war is over, he figured the heat was off, hmm? Probably. How did you get the report back from Washington so fast? By teletype. Oh, by the way, he deserted from this district. I see. Anything else on him? Oh, mostly routine stuff. There's one note here, however, that states he's an expert shot. Did he serve overseas? No. I wonder where he picked up the loot. He didn't have to go overseas to get that. No. Unfortunately, too many guns brought back as souvenirs are getting into the hands of men like Belmont. Yeah. Well, there's the story, Sergeant. But it still doesn't bring us any closer to apprehending him. That's true. One thing is certain... If he's come out of hiding, he'll undoubtedly attend another job. We've got to pick him up before he does. Okay, let's go inside. What about the car? We leave it here. Right in front of the roadhouse? I gave the doorman a fin. I told him we didn't want to get all jammed up back in the parking lot. Oh. Let's go. Now, you know the setup. Once we're inside, we head to the manager's office. Right. It's an old safe. You should crack it in no time at all. Uh-huh. Here we are. Go ahead, honey. Ray. Thanks. Okay. Now we head right down here past the bar. Come on. Hey, this is a real nice place. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could stay a while. Yeah, that'd be great. That's the manager's office right ahead. Yeah. Either you wait here, right outside the store. Okay. We're going in. What do you want? We got something for you, mister. Huh? This. There's the safe, Ray. Uh-huh. How's it look to you? Soft touch. You got the soup? Yeah, right here. How long will it take? Just a couple of minutes, but it'll be noisy. I'll cover that. You get to work. Right. Everything okay? Naturally. What do we do now? You and me are going to have a little dance. What? Come on, let's get out on the floor. Are you crazy? Come on. Well, we ain't done this in a long time, hmm? No. Let's dance over by the bandstand. Why? I want to talk to the leader. <laughs> what for? Got a request for him. Oh, Jack. Honey, fellas lead, girls follow. Oh, uh, mister. Yes? I got a request for you. I'll be glad to play it. What's the tune? Oh, no special tune, just so long as it's loud. Sorry, that's for squares. So is this. What? Don't rumble, mister. You do as I say, I'll keep the gun right under my coat. Now play loud. Beat it out, boys. Loud. Come on. Keep an eye on that door for Nelson, honey. Yeah. Can't you play any louder? More press, boys. Beat it out. How's that? Okay, keep it that way. Jack, the door's open. 
He's coming out. Well, all right, mister. Take it down. Count, boys. Keep it that way till we get out of here. <laughs> Thanks for the concert. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how the FBI brings to justice these criminals who have succeeded in pulling the wool over the eyes of honest citizens. Now, a word about men who pull the wool over their own eyes. I'm thinking particularly of many, many fathers in this country. In the back of their minds, they know there's a question they ought to ask themselves. But they keep dodging that question. They refuse to ask themselves... If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Please don't say to yourself, Oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's pulling the wool over your eyes again. What you're after now is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you finish with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, Mr. Cross, I'm ready to pull the wool off my eyes. How about telling me where to get this fact-facing chart and how much it'll cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now, back to the FBI file, the souvenir gun. Because we are a nation of collectors and souvenir hunters, almost every member of the armed forces brought back something to show the folks at home. Something to identify him even more than the uniform with the specific victories in his theater of the war. Many of those souvenirs were foreign weapons. Weapons which ranged from single-shot pistols to Japanese machine guns, which had been used to kill. Now, with the war over, those weapons are falling into strange hands and being used again as instruments of murder. Now, to protect yourselves, Your FBI asks those of you who have possession of souvenir weapons to comply with all laws where required and have them registered if you have not already done so. By doing that, you'll be doing your part in fighting the crime wave. Tonight's file continues. Several hours have passed since the daring roadhouse holdup. Detective Sergeant Grant is paying a late evening call at the apartment of FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor. Well, Jim, I hope I didn't wake you up. Not at all, Sergeant. I was reading. Good. What's on your mind? Well, I've just come from investigating a holdup at a roadhouse out on Route 16. Yes? Their safe was cracked open. Over $12,000 was taken. I think the man who engineered the job was our friend Jack Belmont. Really? Yes. Pretty... Clever job, too. Oh, what are the details? Well, two men entered the manager's office. Hmm. Before he could call for help, one of them slugged him with the butt of a gun. Could he describe the men? Just sketchily, but he caught a glimpse of the gun. Oh? He's certain it was a German Luger. Is that what makes you think it's Belmont? Oh, no, no. We have more than that. One of the men went back into the club. He and a girl went on the dance floor, threatened the orchestra leader with a gun, made him play loudly to cover up the noise of the safe being cracked. Oh, it was clever. From the description the orchestra leader gave us, the man who threatened him was Belmont. Had a girl working with him, too, huh? Evidently, yes. Now, Jim, I know this job doesn't come under your jurisdiction, We but... still want Belmont. 
Wait till I get some clothes on, Sergeant. I'd like to go back with you to that roadhouse. Evie, what time is it? Huh? What? I said, what time is it? Oh, it's almost eight o'clock. Are you sleeping? Uh Uh-uh. Just dreaming. What do you mean? Dreaming of that beautiful white bathtub back at the hotel. Oh. Jack, why'd we have to come back to this broken-down cabin? To meet Ray Nelson. Why couldn't he come to the hotel like he did before? Much better meeting him here. When's he coming? He's due at eight o'clock. You gonna plan another job? No. Aren't you working with him anymore? No. Why not? Honey, I told you before. My plan of operation in this business is to profit by other guys' mistakes. So? So the first thing I scratch is partners. They're liable to get nailed and talk. That's how other guys get trapped. Eventually, somebody working for them blows a whistle. Oh, you going to work alone now? Not necessarily. But I'm just picking one partner at a time. When we do the job, then I get another one. Yeah, but honey, aren't those ex-partners liable to talk? Not the way I'm handling it. What do you mean? You'll see. Yeah? Me, Jack. Right. Hi, Ray. Come on in. Oh, thanks. Hi, Mrs. Belmont. Hello. This is really a hideout you got here. Have any trouble finding it? Not with the directions you gave me. I'd hate to try to get out here on my own. Where's your car? Down at the foot of the hill. Uh, look, Jack, I can't stay very long, so let's cut up the dough, shall we? Ray, I'm afraid I got bad news for you. What? You ain't cutting in on that job. Huh? I'm keeping the whole thing. You mean you made me come all the way out here? The trip wasn't wasted. Wait a minute. Put that gun away. Sorry, Ray. Jack. That's how you handle ex-partners, baby. Now we'll take him down to the river, tie some weights on him, and he can have one of them baths you were beefing about. Body's right over here, Jim. When was he picked up? Early this morning. Uh-huh. He's moved right here to the morgue. This is it. Well, according to the coroner, he's been dead less than 48 hours. Uh-huh. Where was the body found? Near the municipal dock. Bullet wound in the temple. Yeah, he was obviously dead before he landed in the river. You say his name is Nelson? Yeah. Ray Nelson. How did you link him with Jack Bilmer? Well, the bullet in his head was found to have been fired from a German Luger. Uh-huh. So we took a chance, called in the manager of that roadhouse, look at the body. And he identified him as the other man? Right. The Belmont evidently double-crossed his own partner. Looks that way. Find anything in his pockets? Yes, his possessions are right here. Anything of special interest? Oh, just this card of matches. Here. Thanks. Some writing on the inside flap. Uh-huh. Two traffic lights turn left. One traffic light, turn right. Highway, nine and seven-tenths miles. Left, one and six-tenths miles. Cabin, top of hill. Right side of road. What do you make of it, Jim? Did you find out where this man lives? Yeah, right here in the city. Well, Sergeant, it's possible these are directions to a place that Belmont is using as a hideout. Yeah. This man, Nelson, could have gone out there, been killed, and dumped in the river. But his body was found right here in town. Yes, I know. But there's a pretty swift current in the river this time of year. He could have been dumped in from any place upstream. Jim, if you're right, these directions should lead us right to him. No, I'm afraid it's not that easy. Oh? We don't know where Belmont was when he wrote these directions down. Oh. Sergeant, do you know if Nelson had a job of any kind? Yeah, he had a part-time job in the pool room. Well, then there are three places we know of where he could have been when he took down these directions. His home, the pool room, or the roadhouse. Right. Sergeant, why don't you call headquarters? Give them these directions. See if they'll send out squad cars from all three locations. Okay. And we'll hop over there and wait for the results. Jim. Yes, Sergeant. First squad car's reported. One that left in Nelson's house? Yeah. Any luck? No, it led them to the state university. Well, we'll just have to wait for the next one. 
Here's a report on the second car, Jim. One that left in the pool room. Yeah, they drew a blank, too. What happened? Took him to the main street of Centerville. Just one more to go. I know. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Now, Jim, our hunch didn't work out. Third car checked in? Yeah, they didn't find a thing either. Let's see those matches again. Here. You gave them the right direction, but I felt sure that... Hey, wait a minute. What? Why didn't I think of this before? Come on, Sergeant. This time we'll make the trip. Jack. Yeah, honey? Will you stop shooting? What's the matter, baby? I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand this place. Look, are you going to start that again? Why can't we leave? I told you we got to lay low till the heat's off. That's all we ever do. Now, wait a minute. We got 12000 on that last job, didn't we? Well, what good does it do us? What good is stealing money if we're going to spend the rest of our lives hiding out? Why can't we have fun with it? Evie, I told you, I'm running this show. Then you can keep it. What do you mean? I'm getting out. Now, look. I mean it. I'm sick and tired of all Wait a minute. This. Look down the hill. What? There's a car parked down there. Where did it come from? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. There we are, Belmont. What? Put down that gun. Not a chance, mister. Oh. Jack! I've done some target practice myself, Belmont. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. How'd you get here? We got the directions from the pocket of a man named Nelson. He's dead. We found his body. The directions you gave him were written on this match cover. The place he called you from. Name is here on the matches. Joe's Bar and Grill. So you see, Belmont... You really let us hear yourself. Jack Belmont was turned over to the local authorities and convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to be executed. His wife, Eve Belmont, was sentenced to life imprisonment. This file was closed successfully by your FBI and the local police department of the city in which the crime occurred. In that respect, this case resembles many others. Cases on which your FBI worked long and hard, but on which they could not have been successful if it had not been for the cooperation of the local police department. Your FBI is very proud of its reputation, but it wishes to acknowledge now what it has repeated in the past. Your local police represent your first line of defense against crime. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sunshine Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sunshine Swindler, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has this ever happened in your home? You're sitting listening to the radio when... Hello? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? This is your FBI. Do you know who sponsors that program? Of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last week, I got my equitable representative to bring me that fact-facing chart for fathers they tell about on this program. And believe me, that chart's a real eye-opener. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all fathers full information about the Equitable Society's fact-facing chart that this father found so valuable. Tonight, FBI file, The Sunshine Swindlers. A criminal who commits a minor crime and who remains near the scene of his crime ordinarily is hunted only by a local police department. But the criminal who goes after bigger game, who regards the entire nation as his bailiwick, who commits a crime and then moves on sometimes thousands of miles presents a more difficult problem. The problem of finding one person in a nation of 140 million people. Every clue becomes an important one, for every clue might be the one which helps your FBI to bring the criminal to justice. But whatever the difficulties, however many times your FBI may have been frustrated, the search goes on, because to stop would be to admit defeat and to leave the way open for the criminal to choose another victim, a victim who might be you. Tonight's file opens in a house located on the shores of Miami's Biscayne Bay. In the living room of this residence, a woman is sipping a long, cool drink as a man enters. Hiya, Claire. Hello. What are you drinking? Rum and Coke. Does it taste good? Mm-hmm. Looks good on you, too. What? <laughs> Look at the front of your dress. That's the dribble glass. I've been waiting two days to nail somebody with that. You stupid. I got Get you. Get out of here. I nailed you good. Get out, I said. Greetings, I my dear children. I said greetings. Shut up. Claire. Look what that idiot just did to me. What happened? Another one of his practical jokes. Now, Charles, I've asked you. Oh, it was just the dribble glass. Dribble glass. Itching powder. Squirting flowers. That's all I get all day long around here. I'm fed up with it, see? Claire, control yourself. I'm fed up with this whole routine. Darling, please. For two weeks now, I've sat around this joint all day long while you've been out to racetracks, beach clubs, tea dances. Strictly business, my dear. Some business. Claire, if you... Prom- I'd like to remind you that on the first of the month, we blow this house and two cars we've rented. Claire, listen to me. I've made a score. Huh? You mean you've met a dame? Yes. She's exactly the type we've been looking for. You telling the truth? Word of honor. Where'd you meet her? At the beach club. 
Her name is Reynolds. Grace Reynolds. Any joke? Loaded. What's the story of it? From the Middle West, 40-ish, a widow. Hey, that's right up your alley. Precisely. What about Julie? She's practically illuminated. When do you see her again? We have a luncheon date at the beach tomorrow. Uh, let me have a pen and some paper. I want to write her a note. Here's a pen. Here's some paper. Thank you. Now, uh, I shall tell her how long and difficult the hours will be until we meet again. I want her to... What's wrong with this pen? Rubber point. <laughs> Now do you see what I mean? Oh, excuse me. Are you Ralph Mitchell? That's right. Well, your agent in charge told me to see you. I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, hello there, Jim. Sit down. <laughs> Thanks. That brings you here to Miami. Well, I've been working on a case in Baltimore. I'll, I'll give you a brief outline on it. Okay, fire away. Well, a gang of jewel thieves have been operating up there. Two men and a woman. Uh-huh. The victim was a wealthy Baltimore widow. One of the men became friendly with her, took her out several times. He posed as a broker. What about the other two? Well, they were allegedly his secretary and his chauffeur. I see. Well, one night he took the victim out in his car, drove to a lonely spot, took her jewels, and left her there. Hmm. What are your leads? Well, they'd been living in a hotel in Baltimore. I learned that from the victim. But by the time I got there, naturally, they'd already checked out. I presume you have a description of them? Yes. Yes, we've sent out circulars. Well, you should have one down here by now. When did the robbery occur? Two weeks ago. Any of the jewelry turn up? Not yet. No. I gather you think the gang is down here. That's right. Why? Well, yesterday I finally established the fact that they'd bought plane tickets to Miami. I see. Am I to work with you on this case? Yes. Good, good. Any suggestions on our first move? Well, naturally, we should get the circulars to all the hotels, rooming houses, real estate agents. Right. And there's one other lead I'd like to follow up. What's that? Well, when I searched their Baltimore hotel room, I found a catalog they'd left behind from an outfit in Philadelphia called the Palisades Novelty Company. Yeah? They sell a complete line of practical jokes. Well... Now, as you know, practical jokers are incurable. Now, if one of the gang left that catalog, he might just turn up at a novelty store down here to replenish his supply. Yes. So let's get to work on that angle at once. <laughs> Mrs. Reynolds. This is a glorious day. Glorious. Indeed it is. You know, I've just been thinking. Oh? What about? What a fortunate fellow I am. Oh, how do you mean? Oh, to have this beach, the warm sunshine, and above all, your charming companionship. Thank you. You know, Mrs. Reynolds... Oh, please... Call me Grace. May I? Of course. Oh, thank you, my dear. I hope in turn that you'll call me Richard. Very well, Richard. But much better. <laughs> you know, Grace, I have a confession to make. What, Richard? If I'd followed my original plan, right now I'd be winging offward in a plane. Really? Yes. I had every intention of leaving this morning. What changed your plans? Would you really like to know? Yes. Meeting you. Oh, Richard. Are you pleased? Why, excuse me, oh. Mr. Montgomery. What? Uh, oh, uh, hello, Miss Clare. I hate to disturb you, sir. Oh, that's quite all right. Uh, uh, Mrs. Reynolds, uh, this is my secretary, Miss Clare. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, what do you want, Miss Clare? Your New York office has been trying to reach oh, you. Oh, bother. They said it's important. Tell them I don't wish to be disturbed. Yes, sir. What about Charles? Uh, where is he? Here, here at the club. He's waiting for you. Tell him I won't need the car this afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, how's the market? Steady. Good. Uh, that'll be all, Miss Clare. Yes. Goodness, I'm keeping you from your business, Richard. My dear Grace, the only business I have is to be with you. Ralph. Hello there, Jim. You're just in time. Oh, what do you mean? There's a teletype just came in for you. Huh? There you are. Thanks. Go into my office, Jim. Okay. Any luck today? Yes, you picked up a lead. Don't know what good will do us, huh? What'd you find? Well, I went the rounds of the novelty stores. I took these sketches that were drawn up from the descriptions we had of the three jewel thieves. Yes? 
A man in one of the stores recognized this fellow here. Uh, that was the chauffeur. Mm, that's right. Uh-huh. He'd been in the store the day before, and he bought, of all things, some rubber handcuffs and a toy mouse. I see. He asked for a lot of other items, but they weren't in stock. Did he leave his name or where he lived? No. No, but I'm having the store put under surveillance just in case he does return. Well, Jim, that at least establishes the fact that they are here in Miami. That's right. Uh, what's in that teletype? Hmm? Oh, I asked Washington to check with the Palisades Novelty Company. Remember I found their catalog in that Baltimore hotel room? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I thought that if the catalog had been sent to someone in the hotel, we'd get a specimen of handwriting. But they had no record of any such request. You know, I don't understand why we haven't heard anything from the hotel and real estate people on that circular. No, I don't either. Ralph, if they're all down here, they're undoubtedly going to pull another job. We've got to catch up with them before they land the next victim. Claire? Oh, Claire. I'm in here. Oh. Hello, my dear. Hello. What's this? What? Uh, This broken vase. I threw it at Charlie. Unfortunately, I missed. Now, Claire. Look, I've taken all I can from that guy. This is the end. What did he do now? When I woke up this morning, my hands were clamped together with rubber handcuffs. When I went to brush my teeth, there was soap in the toothpaste. I drank coffee out of a dribble cup. All right, all right, darling. We have more important things to discuss. Nothing can be more important. Now, listen to me. We're moving in on Mrs. Reynolds tonight. So soon? My dear, I've had four days with her. With my technique, that's more than enough. What's the setup? We're going to work differently this time. I like it down here, and I think we'll stay a while. You mean after you take the jewel? Yes. How can you do that? I'm calling her now. Just listen, and you'll find out. I don't get it. Mrs. Reynolds' servants are off tonight. There'll be no one in the house. Yeah? Quiet. You'll hear the rest. Hello? Hello, my dear. Oh, Richard. How are you? Splendid, thank you. I just called to confirm our engagement for the evening. Oh, yes? I'll pick you up at about eight. That'll be fine. Uh, darling, do you by any chance have to be home early? No, of course not. Why? Well, I've dismissed my chauffeur for the evening. I thought after dinner we might take a ride in the moonlight. Just we two. Oh, I'd love that. Fine. Oh, by the way, Grace... Uh, would you do me a favor? Oh, of course. What is it? Well, this may sound silly to you, but would you mind not wearing your jewels? But why? Well, there's been so much talk of jewel thieves holding up cards lately. I'd just feel more comfortable if you'd leave them at home. Oh, very well, then. I will. Thank you. Oh, uh, have you a safe place to keep them? Yes, I have a strong box in my dresser drawer. Excellent. <laughs> Until eight, my love? Until eight. <laughs> Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Claire, I have such a tickling in my nose. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me look in that phone. <laughs> I thought so. <clears throat> look, sneezing powder. Charlie did that. Who else? That fool. Could have ruined everything. Why don't you get rid of him? I can't. We need him. We need him to get those jewels tonight. He's the best inside man in business. Do you need him after he gets the jewels? Oh, I see what you mean. Special Agent Mitchell. Hello, Ralph. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. I was hoping you'd call. Oh, what's up? A man named Hawkins got in touch with me a few minutes ago. He's a real estate agent here in Miami. Yes? He's been out fishing for a couple of days and just read our circular this afternoon. Oh, I see. He claims that he'd rented a house about three weeks ago to a man named Montgomery, Mm -hmm. who answers to our jewel thieves' description. Well, did you get the address? Yes. Where are you now, Jim? At my hotel. I'll hop right over there and pick you up. Me, Richard. Oh. Well, how did everything go? Okay. Have you got the jewels? Yep. Well, where are they? Right there in that tin box. Oh, that's wonderful. The box is locked. You'll have to pry it open. That will be a pleasure. Now, uh, give me the details. Very uneventful. Charlie went in. I waited outside in the car. Ten minutes later, he's out with the box, and we drove back here. Wait until I get something to open this box. 
Where's the Reynolds dame? Oh, I just dropped her off at her house. Ah, this should do it. Did she enjoy the moonlight ride? No jealousy, darling. It was all in the line of duty. Uh, by the way, where's Charlie? He went out and put the car away. Oh. You gonna do like you said? Uh, about what? Taking care of that jerk? Uh, yes. When? Uh, as soon as he comes in. I can hardly wait. Hey, what's that? The car pulling out of the driveway. Huh? Look! Look out the window! Why, Charlie, he's driving away. What in the world? Open that box, quick. What? Open it! Claire. Claire, surely you don't think... That's got it. Good heavens. It's empty. Not quite empty. What is that? A rubber mouth. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Had a hard day at the office, father? You're pretty well relaxed now. Anything important can be put off till tomorrow. Well, here's one mighty important question that shouldn't wait. If I should die... How would my family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? That question is so important that you ought to have an answer based not on guesses or hunches, but on facts. The Equitable Life Assurance Society will help you get these facts. It has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers that has these three advantages. First... It's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Mr. Cross, that's something I really ought to know. Do you mind telling me where I can get this fact-facing chart and how much they charge for it? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sunshine Swindlers. There are times in the lives of all of us when we accept perfect strangers and give them places of confidence. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI proves how foolhardy such a course of action can be. For the criminal makes his living on the misplaced trust of his fellow men. Your FBI does not ask you as decent citizens to reject every offer of friendship made by a stranger. But your FBI does advise you to use an ounce of caution. To check a stranger's story before you believe it. Some strangers you meet are perfectly honest. Are indeed worthy of your every trust. But their honesty lies not in their faces, but in their hearts. Tonight's file continues. FBI Special Agents Taylor and Mitchell, acting on the tip given them by the local real estate man, drove to the jewel thieves' home. They parked their car and quietly circled the outside of the house. They are now returning to the front door. There's something funny here, Ralph. Lights are all on, but we didn't see anyone inside. I know. Garage is empty, too. Hey, do you suppose they were tipped off? Not by the real estate man. He's a reliable citizen. Hey, look there. What? Didn't notice that before. Front door is open. Yeah. Well, I guess we just walk right in. Let's go. Well, I'd say they've gone all right. They must have just missed them, Jim. Look. Huh? There's a cigarette in this ashtray. Yes. What have you got there? Something that proves we've come to the right place? What is it? A toy mouse. Huh? I just found it in this tin box. 
The practical joker. That's right. Someone's coming up the front walk. Yes. It's a woman. Richard! Richard! Rich... Oh, I beg your pardon. Is Mr. Montgomery here? No, I'm afraid he isn't. Well, uh, are you a friend of his? Not exactly. I've got to see him. Something awful has happened. Oh, what's that? Well, I, I was out with Mr. Montgomery this evening, and when I returned, I found that all of my jewels were stolen. Uh-oh. He advised me not to wear them, and I didn't, but when I got home... Uh, just they... a minute, please. He was with you when they were stolen from your home? That's right. He used a new technique this time, Ralph. Yes. What are you talking about? Oh, I beg your pardon. We're special agents of the FBI. What? We came here tonight to pick Mr. Montgomery up. He's wanted for jewel theft in Baltimore. What? Have you notified the police yet? Well, no. When I found they were gone, I came right here. Well, suppose you give us all the details, ma'am. Then we'll get on the phone and send out a general alarm. Please, Claire, I'm trying to think. We can't just keep driving around the streets of Miami. I know. We checked the airport and the railroad station. I didn't think he'd abandon the car. But it's rented. So is this one, but it doesn't stop us from going wherever we please. Dirty double-crosser. How did he have brains enough to pull a trick like that? He undoubtedly overheard us talking about taking care of him and... Uh, say, wait a minute. What? I think I can guess where he's heading for. Really? Yes. Our Charles is a creature of habit. I'm sure that one cylinder mind of his will make him take the jewels to the one place that he's sure he can get rid of them. Where's that? Miller. The fence in New York. That could be. We're heading for Palm Beach. What for? To get a New York train. Well, they run from here, you know. Darling, our sudden disappearance may arouse suspicion. But if we take that much time, he may clear the jewels with Miller before we get there. It's too big a score. Miller won't handle everything in one chunk. So, darling... We play it safe and drive to Palm Beach. It's pretty discouraging, Ralph. Yes. Two whole days now, no trace of them. I know. You know, it doesn't seem probable that they would go into hiding here. They must have skipped town. In spite of our alerting airline, bus, and railroad terminals? Yes. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't have been more help to you, Jim. Oh, it wasn't your fault, Ralph. That's breaks of the game. If that real estate agent had given us that tip any sooner, we'd had the three of them behind bars. Uh, by the way, did you see these? Oh, what's that? Photostats I had made of the Beach Club guest registry. Hmm? All three of them signed in there, you know. Yeah, I mean, look at them. Huh? Sure, here. Thanks. We sent copies to Washington. They can check the handwriting. Something might come of that. I'd like a copy of these, Ralph. Sure. Might be very useful. Uh, when are you returning to your home office, Jim? Well, I'm supposed to report back tomorrow. But now that I have these handwriting specimens, I'm going to ask for permission to make a stopover in Philadelphia. Hello? Claire, this is Richard. Well? I've just been to see Miller. The fence? Yes, my hunch was right. Charlie was in there the day before yesterday. I knew he'd beat us to it. Now, don't get excited. The pattern worked out just as I knew it would. Miller bought less than half the jewels from him. Told him to come back next week. Did you find out where he's living? Yes, he's right here in New York. I have the address. Wait for me. I'll be right over to pick you up. <laughs> Hello, Charles. <laughs> Greetings from Miami. Oh, what are you doing here? We found out where you were living. We decided to surprise you and drop in. Richard, never mind the small talk. Let's get down to business. Very well, my dear. Look, I... Uh, I bet you you thought I ran out on you down in Miami, huh? You gave that impression. Well, it was just a joke. See, you know me. I'm all the time joking. This was your funniest. Well, now, Claire, you don't think I really tried to lamb off with them jewels. All we care about right now is the money you collected from Miller, plus the rest of the loot. Well, sure, sure. I, I got it right here, all of it. Wait. Huh? I want you to observe I have a gun here, just in case you try anything irregular. Oh, now, look. Quit stalling. Get it up. Okay. Here's the, here's the money, and here's the rest of the jewels. Thank you. Now, I have something for you. Oh! I 
I see no reason for our staying around here, Claire. Did you get everything? It appears that way, yes. Okay, let's go. You see, darling, this proves the old adage, all's well that ends well. After you, my dear. I'd advise you to stay right where you are. Who are you? What? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Richard. I have a gun here, so don't try anything. What are you doing here? I came to arrest that man on the floor. Finding you here was an added surprise. How'd you know where to find him? As you know, your friend there liked practical jokes. I learned that from a catalog he left in your Baltimore hotel room. So? So in Miami, I got specimens of his handwriting. I took it to the novelty company in Philadelphia and found out that he had written for another catalog from this address. Oh, that fool! Now, if you'll hold out your hands, please, I'd like to clamp on these handcuffs. Oh, and by the way, they're not made of rubber. For their guilt in violating the National Stolen Property Act, Richard Montgomery and Charles Day were sentenced to serve a 10-year term in a federal penitentiary. Claire Montgomery received a sentence of seven years. For his complicity in the crime, the fence John Miller was imprisoned for five years. And thus was closed another case in the files of your FBI. Files that are as full as they are because last year there were almost one and a half million major crimes committed in this country. It is difficult for the human mind to understand the gigantic proportions of one and a half million major crimes. So perhaps it would be more helpful to break that figure down. To tell you that it's been slightly over 26 minutes since this program went on the air. And in that time, in that period of less than a half hour, there have been 74 major crimes committed somewhere in the United States. 74 more jobs for your local police, your state law enforcement officers, and for your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Bowtie Murders. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bowtie Murders on... This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your
your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Would you be surprised if, a few minutes from now, your telephone should ring? Hello? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? This is your FBI. Do you know the sponsors of that program? Why, of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Why, just last week, I got my equitable representative to bring me that fact-facing chart for fathers they tell about on this program. Believe me, that chart is a real eye-opener. So, naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all fathers full information about the Equitable Society's fact-facing chart that this father found so valuable. Tonight's FBI file, The Bowtie Murders. Almost every criminal has his favorite place of action. The jewel thief chooses vacation resorts. The bank robber must, of necessity, pick a spot that boasts a place where people deposit money. The car thief loiters near unprotected parking lots. But in the family of criminals, there is one member who needs no specific location for his crime, who has no favorite haunt at which to practice his vicious art. That criminal is the killer. The night file opens in a modest cottage located on a quiet, tree-lined street in a town in Northern California. In the living room of this dwelling, shafts of late afternoon sun pick out the figure of a man seated at a piano. He is playing softly. Pardon me. Yes? I may be intruding, but I'm looking for someone. Well? Uh, Miss Peg Sterling. She used to live here. Oh, she still does. Well, may I ask where she is? She's out. When is she expected back? Soon. My name is Alan Harvey. I've heard of you. Really? You were engaged to Peg at one time, weren't you? That's right. Who are you? I'm George Danbury. I board next door. Oh. You've been away from here for some time, haven't you? Almost two years. Why did you come back? Well, this is my hometown. Only reason for returning? What do you mean? George! Oh, here she is. George, I wonder if you'd mind helping... Oh. Hello, Peg. Alan. Surprise? Yes. How are you, darling? Why, I'm fine. When did you get to town? Well, a few hours ago. I'm staying at the Central Hotel. As soon as I checked in there, I hurried right over here. I see. Well, aren't you glad to see me? Oh, of course I am. Will you please excuse me? Yes. I imagine you two would prefer to be alone. What's the matter, Major? You restless? <laughs> you want to go out? <laughs> okay, honey. One short run before dinner. Hello, Peg. Oh, George, you startled me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just coming in to see you. May I come in? Yes. Come ahead. Peg, I... I want to apologize for walking out as I did. Well, it was rather peculiar. I realize that. It was just that... Well, here's coming back. 
upset me terribly. Why? You didn't even know, Alan. I know that you were once engaged. Well, that was a long time ago. Only two years. That's still a long time. Not if you were in love. You did love him, didn't you? Yes. Oh, well, that isn't easily forgotten. Please, George. Where is he now, Peg? He went back to his hotel. Did you tell him? About us? What do you mean? That you're now engaged to me. No, I didn't. Oh, Peg, why not? Well, it was all so casual. I didn't have a chance. Please, let's not talk about it now. Oh, Peg, we must. There's something I have to know. Yes, George? Does his coming back make a difference with us? Does it, Peg? I don't know, George. I don't know. Some 50-odd miles away from the little California town, the San Francisco field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor has a problem, too. Oh, Jim. Oh, oh, hello, Paul. Are you looking for me? Yes, you're going to have to count me out of that bowling match tonight. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Jim. Taking a trip to Fresno. What's up? Well, I heard about an unsolved murder down there. Made me sufficiently curious to call the local police and get the details. Yes? From what they told me, it sounds like another job by the bowtie murderer. Bowtie murderer? Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, that's a pretty lurid title. How did he get it? By strangling his victim with a rope, then tying the knot in a neat bow. Oh, I see. Don't you remember him in that Indian reservation case? Uh, No. Oh, I guess that was before I transferred to this office. Oh, yeah, that's right. What are the details? Well, about 11 months ago, a woman's body was found on an Indian reservation on the outskirts of Yosemite Park. She had been strangled in the manner that I just described. Yes? There were no witnesses to the killing. In fact, the body wasn't found until a week later. We learned that she and a man had been on a camping trip. A honeymoon, as a matter of fact. Well, how'd you learn that? From the girl's parents, after we had identified the body. Well, could they give you anything on the man? No, she didn't live at home. She'd just written to her parents, telling them about the marriage and the proposed trip. Oh. Any clues at the scene of the crime? Just one. A set of tire tracks that was made by what was obviously his car. Well, did they lead to anything? No. No, we just have them on file. And nothing ever turned up on the man? Not a thing, Paul. He disappeared without a trace. Jim, this this killing in Fresno, did the police pick up the murderer? No, I got the jump on them, too. But you do think it's the same man? Well, I'll be able to answer that one better, Paul, when I get back from Fresno. What's the matter, boy? Major! Hey, Oh, Peg. Oh, that's you, Alan? Yes. I'm back here in the garden. Oh. Oh, now, Major, stop that. It's Alan. <laughs> you remember Alan? Well, hello there, fella. Oh, 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 good Don't boy. jump all over him. Oh, down, no, boy, I... down. Oh, down, oh, boy, quiet. <laughs> yeah, that's better. <laughs> you care to share a swing? Love to. Oh. Beautiful night, isn't it? Lovely. Hope you don't mind me dropping around. Well, of course not, Alan. It's good to be back. You know, Alan, you still haven't told me where you've been. Oh. Well, I won't bore you with a play-by-play. I've been in Europe, mostly, working for the government. How exciting. It's still good to be back. Peg. Yes? I want you to know something. I was a fool to ever leave here. Please, let's not talk about the past. But I want to. That's silly fight we had. My walking out was the biggest mistake I ever made. Alan, that's all forgotten. I'm completely over it. That's what I was afraid of. What do you mean? There's someone else, isn't there? Well... That man who was playing the piano this afternoon. Yes. Serious? We're engaged. Who is he? His name is George Danbury. He boards next door. How long have you known him? He moved in about ten months ago. He came here for his health. Where's he from? The East. What's his background? He's a musician. Where's he work? He gives concerts. He just returned from a tour yesterday. (laughs) Why all the questions? You're engaged to the man. I want to know something about him. Alan, he's the sweetest person I've ever known. Well, 
Thanks. Darling, you weren't exactly sweet. Look, what has sweetness got to do with being in love? We were in love. You'll admit that, won't you? Alan, let's not start to fight again. I'm sorry. Peg, are you going to marry the guy? Yes. Hello there, Paul. Oh, well, welcome back, Jim. How is Fresno? I've got quite a story. Well, let's have it. Well, first of all, I've definitely established that both murders were committed by the same man. Well, how'd you do it? With those tire tracks we found on the Indian reservation. But, unfortunately, I didn't come up with a killer. Well, what's the story on the second murder? Well, more or less the same pattern as on the first one. The victim and her newly married husband went on a cabin trip outside of Fresno. She was strangled. Bow tie knot. Her body was found several days later. Was the victim identified? Yes, she came from Los Angeles. Lived alone, met this man, married him shortly afterward, went on the trip. Well, how'd you find that out? Well, she wrote to an aunt in San Diego, gave her the details. Well, how about the girl's friends? Could they give a description of the man? No, she kept pretty much to herself. The Los Angeles police are checking, but so far they haven't gotten anything. How about a motive for these killings, Jim? Just doesn't seem to be any. What? No. Neither of the victims had any money. Well, you think he just wantonly killed them? I'm afraid so, yes. Paul, I believe we're dealing with some sort of homicidal maniac. And they're usually the most elusive and cunning of all killers. I know. Jim, tell me some more about those tire tracks. Oh, yes. Well, the Fresno police found an old tire that had been discarded near the camping site. Yes? They took an impression of the treads and compared them with the tire markings that we had found at the reservation. They were identical. This was a tire the killer had thrown away. Apparently, yes. And, Paul, it can be our first good lead. I've already contacted the company that made the tire, gave them the number on it. They'll look up the dealer was sold to and then contact me here. I didn't hear you come in, Mr. Harvey. The door was open. Where's Peg? She went out to the garage. I suppose I should congratulate you. What for? Peg told me last night that she's going to marry you. That's right. You're a lucky guy. Thank you. Danbury. Yes? Peg tells me that you're a concert pianist. Yes. From the east? I am. Where? New York. What brought you out here? Still help. You've just been on a tour? That's correct. Where'd you play? All through California. Specifically where? Uh, Harvey, why all these questions? I have a right to know something about you. You have a right? Yes. How? Peg is very dear to me. But I happen to be the one who's married. That's why I want to know about you. You've told Peg little or nothing about your past. Harvey, it's none of your business. I'm making it my business. You're not going to marry Peg. That was Peg. Yes. She's out back. I know. Peg. Peg. George. Back here in the garden. Yeah, I see her. George, come here quick. Oh, darling. <laughs> darling, what is it? Peg, what's wrong? Oh, Alan. Look, both of you. It's your dog. Major. Yes. It's cord around his neck. He was strangled to death. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, tonight I'm going to ask you to pull up that curtain. I mean the iron curtain that many fathers erect themselves so that they won't have to face facts vital to their family's future. Pull up that curtain right now and ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Please don't say to yourself, Oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's pulling down the curtain again. 
What you're after is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, Mr. Cross, I've raised that curtain. Tell me where to get this fact-facing chart, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Bowtie Murders. In almost every case in which your FBI finds itself involved, time is the important element. In tonight's case, time assumes a double importance. For when your FBI realizes that it is dealing with a homicidal maniac, a killer who may strike anywhere at any hour, then the race against time really becomes a race against death. The job then resolves itself into two questions. The first of which is whether or not your FBI can catch the killer. That is important. But even more important is the second question, which is, can your FBI make the arrest in time before the maniac strikes again? Tonight's file continues at the San Francisco field office of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Well, Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. I've been out working. Well, this teletype came in about an hour ago from the Los Angeles police. Mm -hmm. It's a description of the missing killer. May I see it, please? Sure. Here you are. Thanks, Paul. Now, they interviewed several people who were casual acquaintances of the victim. Yes, I see that. Killer used the name of Thomas Wilson. Oh, probably an alias. Mm -hmm. About six feet tall, blonde hair, 30 to 35 years old, educated speech, wears horn rimmed glasses. Well, I've already sent out an alarm on him from here. Oh, good. Now, how'd you make out with the tire company? Well, it's turned out to be sort of a tinkers to evers to chance. Oh, what happened? Well, I went to see the tire dealer. He's over in Oakland. Yes? According to his records, that tire was sold three years ago to a man named John Randolph. Well, did you get Randolph's address? Yes. He lives right here in San Francisco. I've already seen him. And? And he's not the man we're looking for. He sold the car the tire was on two and a half years ago to a used car dealer named named Wharton. It was a 1940 Chevrolet Coupe. Well, where is this Wharton? Well, he was right here in town, but he went out of business. Oh, fine. No, no, it's not as bad as it sounds. I've just come from police headquarters, and they helped me check Wharton's present whereabouts. Well, any luck? Yes, he still lives here. I've got an address on him. Good. He hasn't a phone, Harvest, so in order to find out how he disposed of that car, I'm going to have to go out and see him. In fact, I'm on my way right now. Am I intruding, Peg? Oh, of course not, George. Well, I, I thought you might want to be alone. No. I know how badly you must feel about last night. It was awful. Why would anyone do such a thing, George? Why? I can't imagine. Poor Major. Peg. Yes, dear? Uh, there's something I want to talk to you about. What is it? A conversation I had last night with Alan, just before you... Uh, you found Major. Yes? Well, he insisted upon questioning me about who I was, where I came from, what I did. What? He said he had a right to know. Oh, darling, that's ridiculous. Peg, does he have that right? Well, of course not. Why, why, I actually know less about him than I do about you. But I thought when your mother was alive, he boarded here at your house. He did. 
But he lived with us less than six months. Then he went away. Could I ask a great favor of you, Peg? What, darling? Would you mind not seeing him anymore? Well, I have one reservation. What? He called this morning. He said he was going away. Oh, yeah? He asked if I'd see him this afternoon before he goes. Do you mind terribly if I do? No. <laughs> You're a darling. Uh, but I have one reservation. What? That we get married before another old beau turns up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, darling. No, I mean soon. Tomorrow. All right, tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. And, darling, you know I have our honeymoon all planned. Where are we going? On a camping trip. Special Agent Palmer. Hello, Paul. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. Did you contact that used car dealer? Yes. How'd you make out? Well, I spent most of the morning with him going over his old record. Yes? We finally came across the name of the man who purchased the Chevrolet Coupe from him. Good. The uh, purchaser lives upstate about 50 miles ago. Of course, he may have sold the car, too, but anyway, I'm going to run up to see him. Well, did you get the motor number of the car? Yes. I sent it over to the license bureau to have them check it to see who the present owner is, but that'll all take time. But meanwhile, I'm going to drive upstate. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm looking for a man named Alan Harvey. I believe he lives here. Well, he used to board here. He moved out two years ago. Oh. Did you know him? I just met him the other day. You mean he's still around town? Well, he's leaving today. Do you know where I could find him? Well, he's gone out for a ride with my fiance, the girl who lives in this house. Oh. Well, my name is Taylor. Oh, how do you do, sir? I'm George Danbury. How do you do? I'm a special agent of the FBI, Mr. Danbury. Here are my credentials. I see. I wonder if you could describe this Alan Harvey for me, please. Well, I'll try. He's about six feet tall, has blonde hair. And about how old? Around 35. Does he wear horn rim glasses? Yes, he does. And does he by any chance drive a Chevrolet coupe? Yes. Well, from your description, Mr. Danbury, he could be the man I'm looking for. On what charge? Murder. Murder? Yes. The man I'm seeking killed two women, both times using the same technique. He strangled them with a cord that he tied with a special knife. Oh, wait a minute. Sort of a bow? Yes. Why? Well, my fiancé's dog was killed that way last night. While this man Harvey was around? Yes. And you say that she's out with him now? Yes. Where did they go? Well, uh, Peg said something about going out to Stony Point. That's a picnic ground. When did they leave? Over an hour ago. You know how to get there? Yes. How far is it? About ten miles. We'd better get going at once. <laughs> Yes, Peg. There's a storm coming up. Mm-hmm. Don't you think we'd better be starting back? No, please. But look at those clouds. Peg, this is our last afternoon together. I'd like to stay here and watch the storm. We'll get soaked. Not if we get in the car. Come on. Okay. You're not worried about what your boyfriend will say, are you? Of course not. George knows I came out here with you. Did he give you permission? Alan, please. Go ahead, dear. Thanks. We got in just in time. Look, it's starting to rain. Uh huh. Beautiful, isn't it? The rain? The storm. Ever since I was a kid, I've always loved to watch one. The massive black clouds, jagged streaks of lightning searing the sky. Hey, doesn't it excite you? Well, not exactly. I... I sort of get scared. Listen to that thunder. It gets inside of me. It, it fills me with its power. Alan. Can't you feel it too, Peg? Look, I think we should go home. No. Alan, I don't like this. You're not going home. Now, just a minute. You're not going back to him, Peg. Alan, please. You're staying here. What are you doing? Let go! No! Please. No! You're joking! Alan. Let go of her. You... Oh, 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 Peg. 
Peggy, are you all right? Yes. Danbury, put her in your car. Yes, sir. Well, I think we can safely say that Mr. Harvey's career of murder is ended. Alan Harvey was tried on the charge of murder. Because of his mental condition, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal institution for the mentally deficient. Your FBI succeeded in closing this case in its files because of one rule, which J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, long ago laid down. That rule, which is indelibly impressed upon every special agent when he goes through his course of training, is that no clue is too small to follow. Now, this case tonight is an excellent illustration of that point. For your FBI had only the factory number on the carcass of a discarded tire. But from that single clue, a killer was captured. And thus, once more, was your FBI able to serve in protecting you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Baby Big Shot. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. It's a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Baby Big Shot, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, right in your own home, the telephone may ring. Hello? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? This is your FBI. Do 
you know who sponsors that program? Why, of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. But just last week, I got my equitable representative to bring me that fact-facing chart for fathers they tell about on this program. And believe me, that chart is a real eye-opener. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all fathers full information about the Equitable Society's fact-facing chart that this father found so valuable. Tonight's FBI file, The Baby Big Shot. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is one involving juvenile delinquency, involving children who are criminals. Juvenile delinquency is a phrase that is misunderstood by many people, misunderstood because they regard any case in that category as being the result of a childish prank. But they are wrong. For your juvenile criminal of today is not a boy or girl whose ambition is to steal a package of gum from the corner drugstore. Your juvenile criminal of today is capable of any crime committed by his elders. A few weeks ago, a store in New York was held up by an armed robber who shot it out with a New York detective. The detective was seriously wounded. The armed bandit was killed. The armed bandit was aged 16. Tonight's file opens in a town in one of our Midwestern states. At a street intersection in the Midtown district of this community, two teenage boys exchange greetings. Hi there, Pete. Oh, hello, Frankie. I ain't seen you around the candy store lately. I don't hang out there anymore. Why not? That's strictly for kids. Oh. You uh, hitching rides? Uh huh. That truck there looks okay. Yeah, we're just gonna grab onto it. Mind if I come along, Pete? Come ahead. Hey, the traffic light's changing. Yeah, I know. Grab hold. Quick, right. <laughs> Pete. Yeah? You're hanging out with Lefty Davenport now, huh? That's right. Hey, how'd you get in with him? Hey, he heard about me. He asked me, and that's a real big gang he's got, huh? Biggest in town. How's chances? For what? For me. Oh, are you kidding? What's so funny? I'm as smart as you are. What? What about when we used to go to the stores together? I stole more than you did every time. You're crazy. Pete, why can't you send me into Lefty? Because in the first place, you're too young. I'm 14. Lefty's got a rule. You gotta be 16 or over, you can't join. Ah, that's stupid. Tell him that. Maybe I will. There's a traffic light. Stay back so the driver don't see you. Get off the back of that truck. Uh Uh-oh, the driver's seen us. What's the matter? You hot to hear him? Shut up, you jerk! Why, you... Come on, let's go. Okay. That's good enough. Pete, Lefty's gang hangs out in that old barge down on the river, don't they? That's right. Why? I'm going down there tomorrow to see him. Can I see what is Lefty? Yeah, go ahead. Pete? Oh, hello, Frankie. Lefty around? Well, wow, he's, uh, busy now. Why don't you oh, come... Pete? Ah, uh, just a kid. Wait, me. Wait, Pete. Pete. Wait a minute. Hiya, Lefty. Who are you? Frankie Morton. Look, punk, get out of here. Not till I talk to Lefty. I said Hold get out. Hold Pete. See what he wants. Now, what is it, kid? I want to join up with you. Pete, do you know him? Yeah. I told him yesterday he didn't have a chance. First place, he's only 14. So what? You gotta be 16. Is that so, Lefty? 
Yeah. Then all I can say is you don't know how to run a mob. Huh? What difference does it make how old a guy is? What he thinks, what he does, that's what counts. And I can outthink and outdo any guy you got. Let me throw him alone. alone. Hey, you mean I'm in? Just done a pass. I don't get it. I'm giving you a chance to go out and do a job. If it's smart enough and big enough, then we'll talk about your joining the organization. At the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting a visitor. Hello there, Tom. Hiya, Jim. Oh, it's good to see you again. Why well, won't you sit down? Thanks. Now, what can I do for you? Well, uh, first of all, I want you to know I'm not here because of any trouble. <laughs> good. I've come to ask a favor. Oh, it's here, Tom. I'd like you to come over to the high school and talk to the students. You mean make a speech? Well, yes. Ah, uh, Tom, look, I you know, know how busy you are, but let me tell you what I have in mind. Okay, go ahead. You see, Jim, as principal of the school, I can talk all year to the students on their responsibility to the community, but these days I'm afraid that isn't enough. Well, that's true enough. For some of the youngsters, good citizenship isn't as glamorous as crime and criminals. That's why I want you to talk to them. Well, what about, Tom? Your job of law enforcement. I think it has more glamour than any dozen criminal adventures. What do you say? Will you do it? Well, personally, I'd be glad to, Tom, but I'd have to get permission from my agent in charge. I see. He's out of town today. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk to him about it first thing in the morning and then get in touch with you. Who's that? Me, Pete. Where you been? I saw them bags we clipped the other day. How much you get? Forty bucks. Here you are. Thanks. That kid, Frankie, come here? Is he the one that was here the other day? Yeah. I didn't see him. I seen him this morning at school. Said he was coming over to see you. Said he was doing a big job. Yeah? What kind of a job? Uh, he didn't tell me. What's the, what's the story on him? Well, he lives with his mother. She's got a little dough. Is he smart? Uh, he steals pretty good. Yeah? Uh, he thinks he's a big shot, though. You know what he said to me this morning? What? He says, if you don't take him in, he'll form his own gang. <laughs> Is that a fact? Uh-huh. That sounds like him now. Let him in. All right. Hiya, Pete. Lefty here? Yeah, come on in. Hiya, Lefty, old boy. What do you want, Junior? I want to talk to you. What about? The other day you told me to go out and do something big, right? Uh-huh. Well, I done it. I got the biggest... Wait a minute. Deal you... What's this talk you were throwing at Pete this morning? What do you mean? You told me that if Lefty don't take in, you'll form your own mob. That's right. Look, Junior, for your information, we've got this town all cut up. Everybody has his own territory. Anyone moves in, we put him out of business. Fast. Lefty, just listen to my deal first, will you? Okay. What is it? A snatch. Kidnapping? That's right. Wait a minute. You can't do nothing like that. Too late, Pete. I already done it. You, you snatched somebody? Sure. Sent out the ransom note, too. I asked for two grand. What is this, a rib or something? No, you told me to do something big, didn't you? Who did you send the letter to? My mother. Huh? Who'd you kidnap? Me. Oh, Frankie, oh, my poor Frankie. Mrs. Morton. Yes? I realize how upset you are, but... Well, I'd appreciate it if you could answer a few questions for me. I'll, I'll try, Mr. Taylor. Uh, but when did you find the ransom note? As soon as I came home here. What time was that? Late this afternoon. Have you told anyone about the note other than the police? No, I haven't. Now, when did you see your son last? Uh, sometime yesterday, I think. Aren't you sure? Uh, it was yesterday, yes, yesterday morning. And he hasn't been home since? Oh, he must have been here last night. His bed was slept in. Well, didn't you see him? Well, uh, I wasn't home last night. I was visiting friends. Oh, I see. The two of you live here alone, right? Yes, that's right. Well, Mrs. Morton, tell me about your son's habits, what he does, who he sees. Well, he 
goes to school, high school. Yes. He does all the things that other children do. Who are his friends? I'm afraid I don't know. Where does he spend his time when he isn't in school? Out playing, I guess. Well, Mrs. Morton, can't you tell me something specific? Uh, I'd like to, but... Well, I'm afraid I can't. Look, Mr. Taylor, all I care about is getting him back. What can we do? Can you raise the $2,000? Oh, yes. Well, the note states that if you're willing to pay the money, you should take an ad in the morning paper. I'll do that right away. Good. I'd like to take the note with me, if I may, to send to our laboratory in Washington. Of course. And, Mrs. Morton, I want to assure you of one thing. Yes. In all kidnapping cases, our first concern is the safe return of the victim. Our every effort will be directed toward your son coming home unharmed. How'd you sleep, Frankie? Oh, hiya, Lefty. When'd you come here? A little while ago. How'd you like sleeping on a barge? Oh, okay. I uh, brought you some buns and some milk. Help yourself. Thanks. Hey, did you get a morning paper? Uh-huh. Did my mother take an ad? Yep. Swell. Well, that means she'll pay off. Mm, looks that way. No, I finally figured a way to get some dough out of her. What a routine I've been going through. Any time I wanted it before, I had to clip it from her purse. Say, you want one of these buns? No, what's the next move, kid? Well, I said in the note that if she took out the ad, then she'd get a phone call telling her where to leave the dough. Hey, I uh, just thought of something. Huh? What? That note you wrote. Won't your mother recognize your handwriting? No, I disguised it good. Besides, she's so busy going out all the time, I don't think she'd know what my regular handwriting looks like. Well, she'd know what your voice sounds like, so you can't make that phone call. Yeah, that's right. Maybe we'll have Pete make it. Think you can trust him? What do you mean? Well, you've seen how he acted about this snatch. He was scared stiff. Oh, I'd better get over that. Well, what if he don't? Who's that? Me, Pete. You still here, Frankie? Yeah. We're really going to go through with it, huh? Why shouldn't he? Lefty, that's awful big for us to handle. What did I tell you, Lefty? What do you mean by that? Frankie uh, thinks you're scared. Ah, he's crazy. Yeah, that's what I told him. I said you'd go right along with us. In fact, I even told him you'd make the phone call. What phone call? To Frankie's mother. What about? Telling her where to leave the two grand. Wait a minute. I couldn't do that. Why not? Well, she'd recognize my voice. Yeah, she don't even know you. Well, anyway, I ain't gonna do it. Oh. And the kid was right. It's too dangerous, Lefty. We could go to prison for life. Are you backing out? If you want to call it that, yes. It ain't that easy, Pete. Huh? You know too much. Lefty, I, I don't want no part of it. You've got nothing to say about that now. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, you're not. No. Oh. Frankie, you've got his territory now. Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Fathers, maybe you're planning to turn a deaf ear to this commercial. Okay, try and do it, for I give you fair warning that you're going to be asked a question that will have you sitting up straight in your chair. Ready? Here it is. If you should die... How would your family get through the critical years until the youngest child finished high school? How long would your wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? The more you love your family, the more serious thought you'll give to that question. The more determined you'll be to get an answer based on facts. To help you get them, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers, which has these three advantages. First... This equitable chart is simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this equitable fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture 
of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Say, that's something not one father in a hundred knows. Where do I get one of these fact-facing charts, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to see that you get this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Baby Big Shot. The future of America lies in the hearts and minds of our children. But the day will come sooner than you think when they will have to provide the sinews and the brains for our nation. It is proper, therefore, to look at those in whom our future lies. The record is not a very attractive one to examine, for it shows that of all the crimes that were committed in the United States in the last year, almost half were committed by those who are not yet eligible to cast a vote. That makes the future of the country look dark indeed. But the picture has a brighter side. Because we can change that wave of juvenile crime. It will take work, hard work, and long, tedious hours. But we can make the youth of this country tomorrow's good citizens instead of tomorrow's criminals. The choice is up to us. To all of us. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Mrs. Morton. Oh, hello, Mrs. Morton. I was just going to call you. Have you received any phone calls? No, I haven't. Well, the paper's only been out for a few hours. I'm sure that when the kidnapper reads the ad, you'll get some word. I hope so. Oh, I've gotten a report back from the laboratory in Washington on the handwriting in the ransom note. It didn't correspond with the writing of any known kidnapper in our files. Oh, I see. But it's the laboratory's belief that the note was written by a juvenile. A youngster? Yes. So, you see, I think it's very important that we find out just who your son's friends were. One of them could be behind this. Well, I'll make every effort to find out, Mr. Taylor. Fine, Mrs. Morton. We'll do some checking ourselves. And if the kidnapper should call you, please get in touch with us at once. Oh, I will. Fine. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. You busy, Jim? Oh, hello, Tom. No, come on in. Thanks. I made a special trip here to ask you one question. Oh? Can you make the speech? Yes. Good. I sort of wish, though, it were for a different audience. What? What do you mean? Oh, Tom, I'm working on a case right now that makes me feel that parents are in greater need of instruction in youth guidance than their children are. How would you like to tell a group of parents that? <laughs> I'd love to. We're having a parent-teachers association meeting this afternoon. Care to drop over? Maybe I will. I was coming by the school anyway. I want to enlist your help. Oh? Huh? What for? Well, there's a youngster mixed up in this case I'm working on, Tom. And it's just possible that you could give me a hand in finding out who he is. Glad to. Can I count on your speaking this afternoon? Yes. And so, ladies and gentlemen... I think we can safely say that the problem of juvenile delinquency today is a problem involving delinquent parents. If every parent made a sincere effort to learn how their child was progressing at school, where they were playing outside of school, and who their companions were, the problem would be lessened material, and the parents would be making a real contribution toward a better tomorrow for America. Now, there are countless suggestions offered... But the best solution for the juvenile crime wave is juvenile crime prevention. And this prevention, like charity, must start at home. That was excellent, Jim. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. Oh, uh, did I receive any phone calls? No, you didn't. Hmm. Carla, can you leave in? Yes. Well, perhaps we can go to your office then and start to work. 
Let's see if we can find out if the youngster I'm looking for is a pupil here at your school. Is that you, Lefty? Yeah. Did you make the call? Uh-huh. Did you talk to my mother? Sure. What'd she say? She said she'd get up the dough. You told her where to leave it. Of course. I said she should make up a package, put it under the Lincoln statue in Memorial Park before 10 tonight. Swell. Where's Pete? Ah, he started to come too, so I tied him up. Where'd you put him? Down below. Was he beefing? <laughs> Plenty. Hey, what are we going to do about him, Lefty? You know, even after we collect the dough, he can still squeal on us. Yeah, I know. So what happens to him? After we collect the dough, I'll, uh, take care of him. You mean you're going to... I said I'll take care of him. Now we've got to make plans for tonight. Come down into the living room, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Miss Swan. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you about the phone call. Please do. It came at exactly 4.30. I looked at my watch. Yes. As I told you on the phone, it was a man requesting that I leave the money under the Lincoln statue in Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. Oh, did it sound like a young man? A boy? No, no. He spoke very gruffly, as though he were attempting to disguise his voice. Well, then obviously you didn't recognize it. No, I didn't. Oh, what do I do now? Follow his instructions. And leave the money. That's right. Oh, nothing will go wrong. As I told you before, Mrs. Morton, we'll do nothing to interfere. We won't make a move of any kind until your son is safely home. I hope that'll be soon. Just... This has been just dreadful. Yes, I know. Mr. Taylor, I, I want you to know that, that this has made me realize what a failure I've been as a parent. Why, I couldn't even help by telling you who his friends were, what he did. If he's returned to me, Mr. Taylor, I, I swear I'll never neglect him again. Okay, Frankie. It's as far as we go. What happens now? I go into the park and pick up the dough. Uh-huh. You wait here. If I get the dough okay, I'll come back, give you the word, and you head for home. Uh, when do we cut the dough up? Uh, you stay home for a couple of days till the heat's off, then uh, meet me back at the barge. What about Pete? I told you I'd take care of him. Well, good luck, Lefty. Thanks, kid. See you later. <laughs> Just a minute. Hello, Mrs. Morton. Oh, Mr. Taylor, Frankie's home. I figured he would be. W won't you come in, please? Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. Yes, I'm sure you are. And I want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you, Mrs. Morton. Oh, where is Frankie? Oh, he's right here in the living room. Please come in, won't you? I'd like so much to have you meet him. Yes, I want to. Frankie? Yeah, Mom? Frankie, dear, this is Mr. Taylor. He's the man from the FBI who did so much to bring you home. Oh, Hiya. Hello, Frankie. I'm going to put him right to bed. He's been through so much. I'm okay, Mom. Oh, Mrs. Morton. Yes? We've recovered your ransom money. Huh? What? You caught the kidnapper? One of them, yes. You mean there was a gang? No. No, only two. Oh. I think I will go up uh, to bed. Oh, wait a minute, Frankie. I want you to hear this. Yeah, but I'm tired. I want you to hear who the other kidnapper was. Well? It was you, son. Mr. Taylor! What do you say? I'm sorry to say, Mrs. Morton, that your son was behind this whole thing. Oh, no. He wrote the ransom note. That's a lie. Frankie, our laboratory checked over compositions written by every student at the high school. They compared the handwriting with the ransom note. And even though you attempted to disguise your writing, certain key letters gave you away. Oh, this can't be. And in case you don't think that's proof enough, Frankie, your companion, Lefty, was picked up on the barge as he was about to dump a boy named Pete into the river. Oh. He confessed that you worked together. I'm getting out of Just here. Just a minute, son. Oh, Mr. Taylor, please. I'm sorry, Mrs. Morton. I wish this could have had a happy ending. But your son has to come with me to see the United States Attorney. Frankie Morton and Peter Scott were both sentenced to a reformatory until they reached the age of 21. 
Lefty Davenport was turned over to the local authorities and sentenced to serve a term in a penitentiary. And so another kidnapping file was closed by your FBI. Closed because of the invaluable aid given to a special agent in the field by the FBI laboratory in Washington. In this particular case, handwriting experts closely examined 700 essays. Closely examined every word on every sheet of paper in their search for the truth. Their reward was the reward every member of your FBI has when a file is closed. The satisfaction that comes with a job well done. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school. Years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Hijackers Incorporated. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. It's a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Hijackers Incorporated on This Is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you're between the ages of 35 and 45... Here's a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, statistics indicate that right now there are 10 million men and women in this country who are over 65 years old. By 1975, it is estimated that there may be twice as many. And we at the Equitable Life Assurance Society know that age group will consist of people who are in your age bracket right now. Yes, certainly the chances are good. You will be alive in 75. And in 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, Hijackers Incorporated.
Shortly after the middle of January, stories came out of the state of Florida that Al Capone had suffered a stroke. From other sections of the country came countless stories about Capone. Stories that portrayed him as a man who had once known greatness and who lay on a lonely deathbed, deserted by the many he once ruled. On January 25th, Capone died. Ordinarily, death is something to be treated with quiet solemnity. But the counterfeit nostalgia that was aroused by the passing of a man who stood as a symbol of evil was a reflection on the taste of those who shed their tears. Al Capone was a vicious criminal who lived on the blood of his fellow men. He terrorized entire cities with his mob of gangsters after World War I. He was a disgrace to America. But from his memory, let America learn a lesson and see to it that now, after World War II, we do not allow a new Capone to move in and take over. The night's file opens in a towering office building in New York's lower Manhattan. In the executive office of one of the suites in this skyscraper, John Baldwin, president of Baldwin Enterprises, impatiently summons his secretary. Ruth. Ruth? I'm coming, Mr. Baldwin. What's happened to this organization? I've been buzzing for you for five minutes. I was on the phone. Well, where's Walter Davis? He hasn't come in yet. I told him to be here at 11 o'clock. You know he's never on time. Well, he'd better change that. I'm sick and tired. Yes? Mr. Davis is here. Have him come right in. Yes, sir. Ruth, where's our last statement? I have it right here. Good. Excuse me, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, come in, Davis. Okay. Where have you been? I definitely asked you to be here at 11 o'clock. Giving your ulcer a little workout this morning, huh? Skip the levity. I want to talk to you. Okay. Go ahead. I've just been going over a statement of our quarterly earnings. Uh, give me the figures, Ruth. They're 20% less than the previous period. Well, Davis, what do you think of that? I'm not surprised. Why? The war is over now. Things are getting back to normal. Our expenses aren't. We still have 30 men on the payroll and at wartime prices. Want me to fire some? Of course not. Then that leaves it up to you. What do you mean? Mr. Baldwin, this is your business. I just work here. You know, we can't hijack trucks unless you locate them for us. I'd like to remind you that 10 of the trucks I located in the last two months slipped right through your fingers. You can't steal nothing when the law is standing right over it. We still made five successful pickups, and that ain't a bad average. You can still improve it. I have an assignment for you tonight. Okay. What's the setup? Truckload of imported olive oil. Uh, Ruth, what was that name I gave you? Al Franklin. Oh, yes. Walter, I want Al Franklin to do the job. Okay. I'll tell him. Now, I'd like to remind you that imported olive oil is a particularly valuable commodity. I can dispose of it for a substantial sum of money. So please, don't bungle this one. You, Walla? Uh-huh. You called here a while ago? Yeah, you didn't get an answer. Oh, I came in just as the phone stopped ringing. Oh. Well, anything doing? Yeah, Baldwin spotted a truckload of olive oil. He asked me to give you the job of knocking it off. Mm. What's the story? Uh, somewhere near 10 o'clock tonight, the truck stops at a diner just outside of Newark. Mm-hmm. One guy on the truck, he goes in to eat, you take over. I see. Do we uh, have duplicate keys? No, he just crossed the ignition wires. Hmm. Say, is uh, olive oil weights much? Yeah, a good score. Uh, what about us? Uh, do we steal a little too? Naturally. Use the regular routine. Stop off here at our drop first, unload a few cases, then move on down to Baldwin's warehouse. Right. And don't get greedy. Don't take more than ten cases. Remember, Baldwin's paying us to steal for him, not from him. The following day, in the New York field office of the FBI, assistant to the agent in charge, Edward Garland, has just summoned Special Agent Jim Taylor to his desk. You wanted to see me, Mr. Garland? Yes, Jim. Sit down. Thank you, sir. I've just been talking to the New Jersey State Police. Yes? 
A truckload of olive oil was hijacked last night outside of Newark. Oh? The truck was found early this morning by the New York police. It had been emptied and abandoned in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Any trace of the hijackers? No, they made a clean getaway. Any leads? Nothing as yet. That's the fourth hijacking over there in the past three weeks. Yes, I know it. I don't think there's any question, Jim, that we're dealing with an organized gang. The pattern has always been more or less the same. The truck movements were spotted, no violence. And in each case, the truck was found abandoned in Brooklyn. Right. Come in. Uh, Mr. Garland. Yes, Henry. Our Newark office just called. Yeah? They've located a witness who saw the hijacker drive the truck away last night. He believes he can identify him. Oh, Henry, why did he wait this long to turn in the information? He didn't know if the truck was being stolen until he read about the theft in this morning's paper. Oh, I see. Newark will get in touch with us as soon as this witness has gone through the files. Fine. Uh, Jim. Yes, sir? I want you to go over to Brooklyn and check that abandoned truck. Examine it carefully, then report back here to me. Good morning, sweetheart. Morning, Walter. Baldwin in? Yes, he's expecting you. How's his disposition? Terrible. That figures. <laughs> well, I guess I better go on in. Okay. How are you this morning, Mr. Baldwin? Hello, Walter. Well, everything worked like a charm last night. Franklin knocked off the olive oil, put it in your warehouse, drove the truck to Brooklyn, left it there. Yes, I know. Pretty good haul, too. Must be worth about 10 Gs. It could have been worth more than that. What do you mean? As you probably have gathered, I pay the informers who tipped me off about the trucks we later hijacked. Yeah? They generally let me know the approximate value of the load. Uh-huh. Lately, there have been several discrepancies between what I had been promised and what actually turned up at the warehouse. You mean they gave you the wrong information? That was my first impression. But then I noticed that in each instance where these discrepancies occurred, the man who had hijacked the truck was Al Franklin. Well... On last night's job, I obtained the exact number of cases of olive oil that were loaded in that truck before it started out. That's why I requested that Franklin do the job. Yeah? His delivery to the warehouse was 20 cases shy. 20 cases? Walter, I will not countenance thieves working in this organization. No. No, of course not. You're running a legitimate grifter. Exactly. Well, look, what do you want me to do with the guy? I'll handle this. I intend to conduct a thorough investigation... Find out if anyone else is working with him. I can do that for you, Mr. I'd rather do it myself. Arrange to have him meet me at the warehouse tonight. Well, Mr. Garland, may I come in? Yes, come ahead, Jim. Thank you, sir. Well, how'd you make out? Well, I spent about two hours going over the abandoned truck. Any results? I picked up a number of sets of fingerprints, but I have a hunch that they belong to the men who legitimately worked around the truck. Yeah, that's probably true. There were no prints at all on the steering wheel or gear shift. They'd all been carefully wiped off. What did you do with the prints you did get? I sent them on to the identification division in Washington. Good. Oh, have uh, you heard anything from Newark? Yes, they called about a half an hour ago. The witness identified a picture in their file. Oh? He seems certain it's the man he saw drive away in the truck. Who was it? A small-time hoodlum named Al Franklin. Has a long record. Hmm. Has he ever been mixed up with hijacking before? No, but he's always worked with an organized gang of some sort. Right. Any idea where he can be picked up? I just checked on that. And? I got a report that he's living right here in New York City. Did you get an address? Yes. I want you to get right over there. All right, sir. Uh, Jim. All right, sir. I'm certain that Franklin is only a small cog in this hijacking set, but he could tell us who the big fish are, so let's get him in here. I forgot it. Hey, what's with the hurry call? I had to see you. Yeah? What for? We got trouble. Tr- what do you mean? Uh, first of all, I told you not to get greedy. I said, take no more than ten cases. Okay, okay, so I took a few more. Yeah, so you took a few. You took twenty. That was too much. Why? Baldwin knows you clipped them. How? Look, he told me today he's been suspecting you right along. 
He found out how many cases the truck was carrying before he put you on his job. You mean it was a frame? That's right. He wants to see it tonight at the warehouse. Yeah? What about you? I'm clean. <laughs> you mean that's what he thinks? Yep. Well, what do I do? I got that all figured out. Yeah? You can't keep the date at the warehouse. I don't want him to find out about this little drop we got there. Mm-hmm. What then? Well, like I told you, Al, I'm clean. I want to stay that way. So? So Baldwin don't talk to you. Ever. <coughs> Sorry, Al. Turn in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now let's talk briefly about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. <laughs> Don't make me laugh, Mr. Cross. You know how taxes and the cost of living have gone up? Why, the only man who can be independent as he grows older is the fellow who's already got a big bank account. Ah, that's where you're wrong. Thousands of men, many of them earning much less than you are looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s Plan. Well, I'm from Missouri, Mr. Cross. You've got to show me how this plan works. The Independent 60s Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s, guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, able to do the things you've always wanted to do. Say, I'd like to know more about this. Then I suggest that you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's file, Hijackers Incorporated. This case history from the files of your FBI contradicts a fallacy of long standing that the ordinary citizen has believed and repeated. That fallacy is that there is honor among thieves. The simple truth is that honor indicates a certain strength of character and the possession of an ordinary set of morals. But your average criminal does not have the strength of character to resist the temptation to break the law, and he is possessed of no moral stability. Loyalty, the devotion of one human being for another, is beyond the understanding of the criminal. For his very business is taking what does not belong to him. He has rewritten the ancient proverb. And his version says, It is much more blessed to receive. Tonight's file continues in the New York field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just reporting to the assistant to the agent in charge, Edward Garland. How did you make out, Jim? Well, as you can see, I didn't bring Franklin back with me. Yeah. Did he live at that address? Yes. It's a rooming house. But he'd gone out about an hour before. Why didn't you wait for him? Well, Jennings came along with me, sir. I left him there. I wanted to follow up another lead. Oh, what was that? Well, the landlady let me into Franklin's room. I searched it, and lying on the dresser, I found an envelope marked storage. Yeah? It was open. I saw it contained a key. It was made by the Sheffield Key Company. They're right here in the city. An envelope marked storage? That's right. That made me think the key might possibly have something to do with the hijacker's loot. 
So I contacted the key company. Could they give you anything? Well, their records show that the lock the key fits was sold to the Phoenix Hardware Company. They're up on uh, West 24th Street. Did you check with them? Well, Henry's out doing that now, sir. I thought I should report back here to you. We'd better alert the local police in case Franklin decides not to come back to that rooming house. I've already done that. Oh, good. Yeah. I see you, Mr. Garland. Yes, come in. Oh, hi, Henry. How'd you make out? I've got a report on that lock. What is it? It was sold to a man named Walter Davis. The hardware store installed it for him. Uh, where? A small garage on West 56th Street. Mm-hmm. Did you get the number? Yes, sir. Here it is. Oh, Mr. Garland, we've had dealings with a man named Walter Davis before. I talked to him about oh, three years ago on that West Side Bank job. Oh, yes, I remember. We didn't get anything on him. He's a pretty clever operator. Henry, dig up a copy of Davis' record from the files. See if you can find out where he is and what he's doing. Yes, sir. Jim, sir. we're going to get a search warrant and go over to that garage. <laughs> garage obviously isn't being used. No. Try that key in this door. Okay. That's all right. Let's go in. Yes. Got your flashlight? Mm -hmm. Right here. Doesn't seem to be anyone around. No. Look, Jim. Huh? All those packing cases over there. Yes. Let's have a look at them. Right. Shine your flashlight on that label. Yes. Well, you've come to the right place. Cases of olive oil. Yeah, the same trade name as that shipment that was hijacked. Well, there's less than two dozen cases here. This can't be the main drop. No. Hey, look here. Cartons of inner tube. Well, that pinch is that a truck that was hijacked two weeks ago carried tires and tubes. I'm going out and call the office. Oh, wait, Mr. Gollum. There's a phone right over there. Oh, fine. Jim. Huh? Look here. A body. Yeah. Let's have a look at him. All right. Shot through the head. Say, that's Franklin. Al Franklin? Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. When that man in Newark identified him, I got his picture out of our files. Jim, would you get the office on the phone? Yes, sir. I want to find out what Henry's got on Walter Davis. He could be an important man in this case now. Yeah. FBI. Hello. Mr. Garland wants to talk to Henry Marshall. Just one moment. Okay. Hey, you are, sir. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Henry. This is Mr. Garland. Yes, sir. What did you find out about Walter Davis? I got his record from the files. I put it on your desk. He's living here in New York City. Did you get an address? Yes. You want me to pick him up? No, but arrange to have him put under 24-hour surveillance. Ruth? Ruth? Yes? What is it, Mr. Baldwin? Well, where were you this time? I didn't know you were back from lunch. That's no excuse. I got any calls? Yes, Walter Davis phoned about half an hour ago. Where is he? I've been trying to locate him all morning. He's at the warehouse. Did he say anything about Al Franklin? Just that he'd been looking for him and couldn't find him. I wonder why Franklin didn't show up at the warehouse last night. Maybe he found out why you wanted to talk to him. Who could have tipped him off? Mr. Davis. What makes you think that? Female hunch. Well, you could be right. Get Davis on the phone. Are you going to accuse him? No, not until I have proof. I want to talk to him about another job tonight. Have you got a truck spotted? Yes, so get him for me. I want to give him the details. Well, Mr. Garland. Yes, Jim. I have a full report on Walter Davis's activities. Good, let's hear it. Well, first of all, we've definitely linked him with Al Franklin. How? Well, they've been seen together around town. Well, that doesn't say he committed the murder. No, well, anyway, when he left his hotel today, Davis went to a large warehouse down on West 18th Street. He stayed there most of the afternoon. Did you check on the warehouse? Yes, it's owned by a man named John Baldwin. Baldwin's being investigated now. Our preliminary report on him is that he's a legitimate businessman. Oh, I see. Baldwin has leased the warehouse to a corporation. We're looking them up, too. Where did Davis go after he left the warehouse? 
Well, then he had dinner at a midtown restaurant. I left him there, and Jennings took over. Mr. Garland. Yes, Henry. A report just came in from the New Jersey State Police. A truckload of sugar was hijacked near Elizabeth less than an hour ago. Oh, Henry, has uh, Jennings checked in recently? Yes, he called ten minutes ago. Davis is still in the restaurant. Well, that eliminates him having hijacked the truck. Well, after reading over Davis' record, I don't think he'd be doing the actual work. But it still could have been done by one of his gang. Well, if that's true, the stolen truck could be heading for the warehouse that we trailed him to. That's just what I was thinking. Jim, I want to set up a cordon around that warehouse. If that truck should move in there, I think we could clean up this whole case. Yes, Jim, where are you? I've got the car in a parking lot right opposite the warehouse. Any action yet? No, sir, everything's quiet. Where's Marshall? I just spoke to him. He's cruising 11th Avenue. The other car is a station just as we planned. Oh, wait a minute. What is it? There's a cab pulling up to the warehouse. Well? It's Davis. He's going inside. Anyone with him? No. No, he's alone. But there are other people in there. I've seen them through a window moving around. I think Hold it, Jim. I'm getting another report. Jim. Yes, sir. The stolen truck is moving down 11th Avenue. It's turning into your street. Did Marshall pick it up? Yes. He's staying well behind it. Wait. There's a truck coming down the street now. It's slowing down. It's pulling up in front of the warehouse. The driver just blew his horn. It's evidently a signal. The doors are opening. We're going inside. That's all we need. I'll notify all cars. We're moving in. Start unloading, boys. I'll be with you in a minute. All right. Good evening, Walter. Huh? What are you doing here, Mr. Baldwin? They're waiting for you. Close the door. Okay. I thought you didn't like to be around the warehouse when we move stuff in. I don't. I made an exception tonight. How come? I want to talk to you about Al Franklin. Well? According to the afternoon papers, his body was found yesterday in a small garage on West 56th Street. Yes. Hey, no wonder he didn't show. Papers also stated that the authorities found numerous articles there that had been recently hijacked. Well, then you were right about him. Partially. I finally realized he wasn't smart enough to have been doing this alone, so I checked up on that garage. I found it had been leased to you. What is this? It's quite obvious, don't you think? Franklin was merely the stooge. By killing him, you hope to clear yourself with me. That's a lie. Walter, you know my attitude toward thieves. I'm afraid I'm going to have to deal with you just as you dealt with him. I'm going to have to... What's that? I don't know. Hey, what's going on? Where you are, Davis? Huh? What's the double here? I don't know this guy, Mr. Baldwin. I'm a special agent of the FBI. We're taking over your business, Mr. Davis. I must say, finding Mr. Baldwin here makes the evening a complete success. Walter Davis was turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted him of first-degree murder. The ringleader of the gang, John Baldwin, was sentenced to serve 15 years in a federal prison. Other members of his organization were also sentenced to long terms in the penitentiary. And now we have a statement about tonight's case from the files of your FBI by Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover said, and I quote, One of the serious problems concerning the law enforcement agencies in the United States today is the prevalence of hijacking. It has cost Americans in the past year millions of dollars. We of the Federal Bureau of Investigation are straining our every effort to break up the rings of hijackers. For just as your FBI is responsible within the limits of federal laws for maintaining your freedom of speech and your freedom of religion, and your other freedoms granted under the Constitution. So, too, are we charged with maintaining your freedom of the highways. We intend to make it plainer than ever before to those with criminal tendencies that we will operate in 1947 on the same policy as in the past. 
the policy that crime must not be allowed to pay. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the Independent 60s Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Death in the Desert. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Death in the Desert, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. BC, the American Broadcasting Company. BC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. How old are you? If you're between 35 and 45, then here is a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? According to Equitable Life Assurance Society's figures, since 1910 there's been a decided increase in the proportion of our population made up of men and women who've reached their 65th year. To be exact, the increase amounted to 68%. So the longer you live, the better your chance becomes of living longer, and the more likely it is that you will be alive in 75 and in exactly 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, Death in the Desert. months have passed since the end of World War II, but there is still a war going on in the United States, a vicious, sustained battle in which the decent people of the nation are pitted against unscrupulous criminals, criminals who man an army of six million. It may not have occurred to you that there were six million persons with arrest records in the nation, but it is a fact. Out of every 22 people, and that includes our men, women, and children, there is one person who has been convicted of a crime. 
That fact concerns you because in almost every crime, you are the victim. You, the decent, law-abiding citizen. Tonight's file opens in a remote section of desert country in one of our southwestern states. A young photographer, Cliff Douglas, and his wife are walking slowly across the wasteland. It is twilight. Cliff, look. There's our tent. Yes. Oh, I must say it looks pretty good. You tired, honey? Uh, yeah, kind of. Well, we shouldn't have hiked so far, I guess. Oh, I loved it. I think we got some pretty good pictures today. Yes. I'm dying to see how those shots on the mesa turned out. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, where are those rolls of film? I have them right here. Oh, good. Well, give me your hand, honey. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there. Home at last. Oh, yes. Hungry, Cliff? Starved. <laughs> well, you start a fire. I'll go down to the spring and get some water. All <laughs> right. What'll it be tonight? Beans or beans? Oh, I don't care. Surprise me. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, uh, where's that precious wood? Right beside the car. Oh. John! Cliff, come here, quickly. What is it? Come here to the spring. What's the matter, honey? Look, Cliff. That man there in the ground. Hey. He's bleeding badly. Yeah. Well, Cliff? He, he's still alive. What can we do? Oh, there's a bullet wound in his chest. Cliff, shouldn't we take him to a doctor? Well, honey, we're not exactly around the corner from a hospital. Um, uh, let me wash his wound. Take a look at it. I'll wet the scar. Uh, there. Thanks. Wonder who he is. How it happened. I don't know. From the looks of that wound, we may never get the answer. <laughs> In the town of Jasper, some 50 miles away from this desert camping ground, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of the local sheriff. Pull up a chair, Mr. Taylor. All right, thanks, Sheriff. You made good time getting down here. Well, I started out as soon as we received your call. Oh, any new developments in the case? No, I'm sorry to say there aren't. Well, Sheriff, I wonder if you'd mind reviewing the facts for me. I didn't get many details. Well, suppose I start right from the beginning. Oh, that'd be fine. At 12.30 this afternoon, three armed men entered the First National Bank here in Jasper. Mm -hmm. They took 12000 in cash. When a teller named Flynn attempted to send out an alarm, one of the men shot and wounded him. I see. The shot was heard on the street and a crowd gathered. When the bandits left the bank, they couldn't get to the getaway car and they were forced to separate. What happened then? Well, there was quite a bit of shooting. One of the bandits was definitely wounded while driving away in a stolen car. Uh -huh. How about the other two? As far as I know, they were unharmed. And what reports have you had on them since, Sheriff? Nothing at all. Did you set up roadblocks? Yes, we have all that completely covered. Uh -huh. Well, let's see. It's a little over six hours now since the robbery occurred. That's right. We're not too disappointed, though. Oh? Well, you see, time has a different meaning out here. The criminals have plenty of wide open country to roam in, and catching up with them is a matter of days, not hours. I understand. A share of the bandits still have the money, I suppose. As far as we know, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Hello? Hello, Sheriff. This is Tom Wayne. Oh, yes, Tom. A stolen car used by one of the bandits was just found out on Route 42. Near where? A little over six miles past Newton's Corner. Be right out there, Tom. <laughs> More bandage, Cliff? No, this should do it. How is he? Well, I've just about stopped the bleeding, but I'm afraid he's in pretty bad shape. Oh. Joan, you were right. I think we should take him to a doctor. Where? Well, Jasper's the nearest town. That's about 50 miles from here. Yeah, I know. Think you can find your way there at night? Oh, sure. Oh, coyote? Yes. Now, let's see how we're going to move this fellow to the car. You ain't moving huh? him. Huh? What? He's staying right where he is. Who are you? His brother. He's badly wounded. He needs a doctor. Yeah. I was just going to take him into Jasper. I know. I heard you talking about it. 
Well? He still stays here. Oh, but you... Shut up. Look, mister, don't... Shut up, both of you. Chris, he has a gun. That's right. Who put on this bandage? I did. When did you find him? Less than an hour ago. How do you come to be here? Well, we're on a camping trip. Oh. Hand me the wet cloth, lady. He needs more than that. I know. Well, then why don't you... Wait. I think he stopped breathing. Johnny. Johnny. He has stopped breathing. He's dead. Yeah. Cliff, I don't want to stay here any longer. Let's go away, please. Okay, dear. Wait a minute. Well? You're not going any place. You're staying here. The car's right over here, Jim. Driven right into a ditch, huh? Yeah, evidently on purpose. My deputy tells me the car was out of gas. Oh? You see all right, Jim? Yes. I have my own flashlight here. Oh, good. Here we are. Sheriff, car's already been gone over for fingerprints. Yes, we got some pretty good impressions. Oh, fine. I'll send them right on to our laboratory. <sighs> Plenty of blood stains on this front seat. Oh? You must have been pretty badly wounded. You know, Sheriff, from the descriptions you got on these three bandits, I'm almost certain that they're the Prescott brothers. You say they're wanted for another bank job up north? That's right. We've been looking for them for over three months now. Well, when it was driving this car, it couldn't have gone very far. Sheriff, does anyone live around here? No, this is just plain desert country. Oh, and there's plenty of places for him to hide. Uh, plenty of ways for us to find him. Hmm? I'd rather he was out here than sticking on the road. You going to start looking tonight? No, we'll wait till morning. I'll organize a posse as soon as it gets light. Sheriff, what if he did stay on the road and tried to commandeer another car? Well, we still have our roadblock. Now, I'll get the local radio station to send out an alarm warning motorists to beware of anyone walking the highway. Yeah. Yeah? Your office calling on your car radio. Oh, thank you. Come on, Jim. Right. Right. It may be word on one of the other two bandits. I sure hope so. I told my office to contact me out here if anything came in. Here we are. Sheriff Winslow. Hello, Sheriff. Word just came in from up near Crockettsville. A man named Camel was assaulted. One of his horses stolen. Could be one of the bandits did the job. And did this happen at Camel's home? Yes, sir. Then we'll drive over and see him. Oh. I'll get your coat. Hey, where are you going? To my car. Sit down. My wife is cold. I, I want to get her a coat. Sit down, I said. Sit down, Chris, please. Okay. Look, will you tell me why you're keeping us here? We're waiting for someone. Who? My brother. Your brother's dead. This is another one. Why would you be meeting him in a forsaken spot like this? Because we got separated today. We made it up. We got separated. We'd all meet here by the spring. Yeah, but what's that got to do with... Shut up. Somebody's coming on a horse. Flatten out, both of you. Down, I said. Ed. Was that you, Buck? Yeah. Johnny get here? Yeah, he got here. Oh, good. Not so good. Johnny's dead. Huh? There's his body. I seen him get shot when he grabbed that car. I didn't know that. Who are those two? I found them here. Where'd they come from? We're from down in Hastings. My wife and I are on a camping trip. That your car? Yes. Oh, that's a break. Ed. Yeah? Where's the money? Well, I haven't got it. What? I gave it to Johnny. He was bringing it here. I see no sign of it around. Hey, what is this? I'm telling you, Ed. Wait a minute. When did these two get here? Before you, Buck? Yeah. They found Johnny? Yeah. And then they also found a dog. Look, mister... What'd you do with it? I, I don't know what you're talking about. A bag holding $12,000. Now, let's have it. We ain't got much time. I didn't see any money. You're lying. He's telling the truth. Keep out at this. Why, you... Let go of me. All right, hold him, Buck. 
He's going to get a workout until he tells us what he did with that dough. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now let's talk briefly about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Now, hold on a minute, Mr. Cross. You must be talking to men who don't have families to support. I can't save a cent on my salary. Taxes, food, rent, clothes. People who talk about saving for independence these days ought to have their heads examined. No, you're wrong. Thousands of men, many of them earning much less than you, are looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Well, I still think it sounds a little too good to be true, but go on, I'm listening. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't need to spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss. Able to do the things you've always wanted to do. Well, now you're talking my language. Well, then I suggest that you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Death in the Desert. The social basis for human relationship in the world today is the family. And in ordinary conditions, human beings have no greater loyalties than to the members of their own family. But in the criminal, that is not an ordinary human thing. For his very means of livelihood depend on his constant violation of everyday conventions. As you can see in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, one of the basic tenets which he violates is that family loyalty comes second to personal possession. For your average criminal is motivated by only one thing, one quality he has in common with those of his fellows who live by the sweat of other people's brows. That common quality is greed. The night's file continues at the desert oasis. A half hour has passed. Young Cliff Douglas has been severely beaten by the brutal bank bandits. He's lying unconscious on the ground. His wife is bending over him. Cliff. Cliff. Oh, you poor darling. Poor, poor darling. Joan. Yes, dear. Joan, where are you? I'm right here, Cliff. Right beside you. Thank you. Well, it's come to, huh? Yes. Okay, get away from him. You're not going to start again. Get away. Oh, look, tough guy. Now, shut up and listen to me. I'm, I'm not... Oh. Now, listen to me. Something you ought to know about that money you took. I grabbed it from a bank. I shot a guy who tried to stop us. I'm only telling you this so you'll know that I'm playing for keeps. I tell you, I, I didn't see any dough. A buck? Yeah. What are you doing? Digging a grave for Johnny. We'll make it a big one. You're getting two more customers. Please, you've got to believe us. We don't know anything about the money. I've been listening that long enough. Now, uh, who wants it first? Well? Look, do anything you want with me. Leave her alone. Is, uh, that how you'd like it? Yes. Okay. 
And she gets it first. Ed! Ed! Yeah? What? Look, I found it. I found the bag with the dough. Oh, well, where was it? I found it when I was digging. Johnny must have buried it oh. before he passed out. Uh-huh. Yeah, looks like it's all here. All right, let's not waste no more time. I'd better get moving. Okay. We'll use their car. Come on, you get up. Just just take the car. We need cover. Somebody to front. You two are coming with us. No. Now, look, get into that car. We're heading south. Mr. Campbell, do you feel well enough now to answer a few questions? Yes, I, I guess so, Mr. Taylor. Oh, that's fine. Now, will you tell us about the assault, please? Well, I, I was out on the back porch when I heard the horses start to fret down in the corral. Oh, yes, go on. I, I went down there, and I found a fellow just starting to saddle one of them. Mm-hmm. I, I grappled with him, and, and then he hit me with what could have been the butt end of a gun. Can you describe the man? Well, he was pretty tall, as... About six, two, or three, and he had light-colored hair, I remember. That sounds like one of the bandits, all right. Yes. Well, Mr. Campbell, your wife said she heard the fight and came out just in time to see this man right over the hill in back of your ranch. Is there a road back there? Well, that's more of a trail, Mr. Taylor. It crosses a section of the desert. I'm familiar with it, Jim. Oh? Huh? It goes past Lone Spring, then hooks up with Route 55 down below. I see. Can we drive a car over, Chuck? Yes. Well, this man has about a two-hour start on us, but he's on horseback. Now, if he stays with the trail, do you think we could catch him before he reaches the other highway? Yes, I think we could. Then let's go. Cliff. Yes, honey? How much longer do you think this will go on? I don't know. Hey, what are you two talking about? My wife was wondering how much longer we had to put up with this. No kidding. Look, we've been driving for over two hours now. You must be out of danger. Why don't you get out and leave us alone? Just drive south and keep quiet. Where are we going? To Hastings. That's where we live. I know. You already told me. Why are you going there? (laughs) Me and Buck are going to live with you. This is Sheriff Winslow. Come in. Come in, headquarters. Yes, Sheriff. Tom, we're out here by Lone Spring. Yeah. We just found the body of one of the bandits, the one who was wounded. Oh. We also found a stolen horse. He was a bandit near here. We believe the other two men are now in a car heading south into Route 55. Well, we haven't got a roadblock set up that far down. I'll notify the authorities down there. Tell them to watch out for him. We're going to look around here a while, and I'll be in touch with you later. All right. Jim. Yes, sir. You examine the body? Yeah. It's one of the Prescott brothers, all right. I just alerted the police south of here to be on the lookout for the other two. Well, Sheriff, there may be more than two in that car. What do you mean? Well, I found evidence that there was a woman here. And possibly another man. Really? What kind of evidence? Well, the dead man's wound was bandaged with a woman's scarf. Mm -hmm. I also found some female heel prints around the ground. I see. There'd been a tent pitched here recently, too. I found the stake marks. Oh. And here's what may be a real clue, Sheriff. I picked it up down to the spring. What is it? An undeveloped roll of film. A roll of film? That's right. Sheriff, let's head back to your office. I think we've got some work to do. Sheriff. Oh, come in, Jim. Thanks. Well, any news? No, they evidently got the jump on us last night. Oh? Huh? They must have gotten to Route 55 before we alerted the police down there. I've just come from the camera shop. Yes? I had that roll of film developed. I got enlargements on each print. I have them here. Oh, good. Now, these first two are of the same woman. Here. You by any chance recognize her, Sheriff? No, I'm afraid I don't. She could be the woman who was at Lone Spring last night. Now, here's a couple of shots of a cottage. That look like any place around here? No, I've never seen it. 
Well, half the roll was shot around this cottage, the other half in the desert. I got the impression from the pictures that this place was the woman's home. I see. Now, this one's a long shot of the cottage. The hills in the background. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Let me look at that one. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I know those hills. Really? Yes, the three cone-shaped tops. They're down in Hastings. Hastings? That's a small town about 100 miles south of here. Sheriff, I think we'd better get down there at once. Buck. Yeah. Pass me them potatoes. You mean you're eating more? I like potatoes. Hey, you want some? No, thanks. What's the matter? You didn't eat anything. I'm not hungry. Your husband don't eat either. Well, how can we with you around? Now, now, look, don't start that smart talk again. Buck, hand me some bread. Here. Yeah. You know, I think we're going to stay here a real long time. Well, this girl can really cook. Wait a minute. Well, don't you want me to answer it? Yeah, yeah, you can answer it. People must know you're home, but just watch what you say, that's all. Oh, sure. Hello? Mr. Douglas? Yes? This is the police. I want you to pretend I'm your neighbor. Well, sure, George. Are the Prescott brothers there in your house? Yeah. We're just eating dinner. They're armed, I imagine. Yes. There's an FBI agent outside your dining room window. He's watching you right now. I see. When we finish talking and you hang up, I want you to count to 20. One, two, three, that tempo. Uh Uh-huh. The FBI man will be counting with you. Okay. When you reach 20, grab your wife and throw her to the floor. We'll do the rest. Well... That's fine, George. Thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Douglas. Goodbye. Yeah, what did George want? Oh, just neighbor talk. Joan? Yes, dear? Your beads are all tangled. Here, let me search. Oh, golly, look what I did. I'll pick them up. Well, I'll help you. Down, honey! (laughs) Where are those guns done? Are you kidding? Now, put up your hands. Go on, both of you. I'll get their guns. Thanks, Mr. Douglas. Well, are you two all right? Oh, yes. Thank you. Now I'll take your unwelcome boarders out of here. Ed Prescott and his brother were tried for their crimes and sentenced to serve 20 years apiece in a federal penitentiary. In ending the criminal careers of the Prescott brothers, your FBI once again proved the point that crime does not pay. But in tonight's case in the files of your FBI, the point was proven in an unconventional manner. Because this case was not resolved because of a clue left by the criminal through any mistake. This was a case that was resolved because a special agent, working on every available angle, found an innocent-looking roll of undeveloped film. No clue is too unpromising to follow to the very end. And because of that, this case was closed. It's quite true that the eyes of justice are blindfolded. But crime will never pay because justice has friends. Friends like the special agents of your FBI, who see very well. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. 
What income will it give me in my 60s? Your equitable society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Old Lady Larceny. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Old Lady Larceny, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. BC, the American Broadcasting Company. BC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Every now and then, yourselves this question. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, you know what tremendous advances medical science has made in the last generation... One result is that the percentage of men and women over 65 years of age is now two-thirds larger than it was in 1910. Twenty-five years from now, the percentage will undoubtedly be even larger. So, no question about it. The chances are good you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight, FBI file, Old Lady Larceny. There are certain incontrovertible facts about which no well-informed person can argue. Facts which are accepted to be as valid as the truth that the atomic bomb is deadly. But there are other facts which are equally true, which are not accepted. And for the most part, they concern people. There are currently some two billion people in the world. Despite what some would have you believe, the accident of geography has nothing to do with whether or not they are good people or evil ones. For no person anywhere in the world is composed exclusively of good qualities or bad. Everyone has a capacity for both. In some, the good is paramount, and public-spirited citizens are the result. Others give way to evil, and criminals are born. But because the two basic possibilities are present in everyone, good and evil do not have two different appearances. You cannot judge a person by how he looks to you. The safest thing to do is always to remember that the meanest man in the world may sing the sweetest song, and often does. (laughs) 
Tonight's FBI file opens in Los Angeles, California. Emmy Lake, an elderly white-haired lady, is seated in the living room of her modest apartment, which is located in the residential section of the city. She is busily knitting as the front door opens. Is that you, Paul? Yes, Emmy. Uh, I'm in the living room, dear. Oh. <laughs> you know, I was just hoping you'd come home early today. There's a movie at the Tivoli that I'm so anxious to see. <laughs> it's Van Johnson. Uh-huh. And there's one of those cartoons that you like playing there, too. You know that one with the rabbit in it? Uh, you do like that rabbit, don't you? I, I guess so. Paul, don't you feel well? Huh? Well, you look so down in the mouth. Is something wrong, dear? Yes, Emmy. Well, what is it? I've been fired. What? Mr. Sutter said my services were no longer required. What? Why, that can't be. What, what happened, dear? He said that I was too old. My hand was too shaky. That's ridiculous. He said he was getting a younger man to do the job. Well, I never heard of such a thing. Why, Paul, you're the best forger in the business. He doesn't seem to think so. Well, I do. There isn't a man in the entire profession that can handle a pen like you do. Thank you, Emmy. I mean it. For oh, land's sake, you've done nothing else for the past 30 years. I know. That's why it's pretty hard to take. Well, I, I'm not going to stand for it. What can you do? Well, I can have a talk with Mr. Sutter. Oh, now, Emmy, what's done is done. Oh. Let it be. I will not. I'm going over to his hotel to see him right now. Please. Now, now, now don't you argue with me. Uh, just hand me my shawl. <laughs> In the Los Angeles field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is busy working at his desk. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Ned. I'm going out for some lunch. You care to join me? No, thanks. I've got to write up this report. What are you working on? Well, I guess you might call it a continued story. Hmm? An old friend has come home to roost. Really? Who? All I can call him is Mr. X. He's a check passer. He's turned up periodically here in town for a couple of years now. Well, haven't you got anything on him at all? No, he's a pretty clever boy. No, I've gotten his description a dozen times, but he has no distinguishing features that set him apart from any one of a thousand honest businessmen. Hmm. What's his technique? He works hotels, uses legitimate credit cards. His forged checks have the signature of the real owner of the card. Well, what does he get these cards? Oh, I understand they can be purchased by the dozen from pickpockets who in turn have lifted them from the owner. How large are the checks? Never more than $100, and that's what makes it tough. These small operations are always the hardest to track down. Is that check there his most recent effort? Mm-hmm. That's it. What about fingerprints, Jim? Well, the ones that I've sent to Washington in the past have been treated with fumes, but so many people had handled the checks, it was impossible to get any clear prints. I see. I'm sending this one on to the laboratory now. Well, maybe we'll have better luck this time. I hope so. Well, I'd better get down to lunch. Can I bring you up anything, Jim? Yes. The man who's passing these checks. <laughs> Mrs. Lake. Oh, just a minute. Well, hello there, Emmy. Hello, Mr. Suda. Come on in. Thank you. Well, say, I haven't seen you in a long time. Mm, I know. Sit down, won't you? Uh, thanks. I suppose you've come here to talk about Paul, huh? Yes. He told you what happened? Indeed he did. And, Mr. Sir, I think that it was a wicked thing for you to do. Now, Emmy, I want you to hear my side of it. I have a business to maintain, Emmy. And unfortunately, in business, there's no sentiment. Well, you certainly have proven that. Well, those last three checks he wrote for me were so bad, I was almost ashamed to pass them. I don't believe it. Emmy, look, his hand shakes like a castanet. Mr. Sutter, even if he forged with his left hand, he'd do better than any of these come lately could with a right. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with you. Don't you realize how many years he spent in this profession? Are you aware that one of the first signatures he forged was President McKinley? I know that, Emmy. Well, then he certainly deserves more respect than you gave him today. Look, you're just wasting your time, Emmy. My mind is made up. I have no further use for it. You, 
You're a cruel man, Mr. Trevor. Oh, now, Emmy, I think you'd better be running along. Oh, well, very well, but... But I think I should warn you. You're going to regret ever having done this. Paul is going to prove to you that he's better today than he ever was. <laughs> How's the check passing business, Jim? Oh, hello, man. Anything turn up? Something is right now. Oh? This teletype. Looks like it's loaded with information. There we are. Well, what's the story? Well, that last check I sent to Washington's the one I've been waiting for. Evidently, it wasn't handled too much because there are only a few fingerprints on it. Good. The laboratory has identified one set as belonging to one George Sutter. Alias Thomas Sutter, alias Thomas Clay, alias William Clay, alias William Brooks. Well, he's sort of a one-man club. Yeah. What's his record? He's a confidence man. Bogus check passer. He's had several convictions. Anything else on him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says that he always made Los Angeles his headquarters. Well, you already suspected that. Yes. Teletype also states that in the past he's maintained an account in one of the Los Angeles banks under one of his aliases. Well, if he follows that pattern, it's a definite lead. Yes, I know. I think I'll check with all banks at once. Paul? Yes, Emmy? Uh, where are you? I'm out here in the kitchen. Oh, oh goodness. I, I thought you'd gone out. Eh? You see Mr. Sutter? Yes. What did he say? He talked nonsense. Pure nonsense. I'm very provoked with him. And now, don't you go getting upset. I made some hot tea. It's right oh. there on the stove. Oh, that's nice. And I set out some of your favorite cookies. Oh, you're a dear. I'll just... Uh, well, Paul, what... What in the world are you doing? You're just experimenting with something. What? I'm drawing a picture. Oh, my, what a handsome face. It looks familiar. Who is it? Alexander Hamilton. Well, what in the world are you drawing him for? His picture's on a $10 bill. Oh, Paul, surely you're not trying to counterfeit money. Well, just thought I'd try my hand at it. Well, you just tear that right off. Well, isn't it any good? Well, of course it is, but that isn't the point. I'm not going to have you starting at the bottom in a new business just because of that mean Mr. Sutter. I mean, I got to do something. You're going to stay right in your own line. Now, you give me that picture. Very well. There. What can I do in my own line, Emmy? Well, I gave that a great deal of thought all the way home. Yes? And I thought up a way for you to show me that your work is better than it ever was. Tell him. Mm, yeah, I've got a plan. Uh, now, here. What do you Special Agent Kern. Matt, Jim Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm around here in Mr. Hood's office. Yeah? I just located a bank account in the name of George Sutter. That's one of the check passers' aliases. Yes, I remember. They gave me an address on him, but I doubt if it's any good. Why? Well, it's over three years old now. The bank tells me that he's been calling there in person every two or three months to pick up his statements. I see. However, I'm going over there and check it anyway. Uh, meanwhile, Ned. Yes? Mr. Hood has assigned you to the case, too. He wants you to go over to the bank. Uh, First National. Look over Sutter's account. Huh? Okay. After I've checked the Sutter's heaven, Sutter, I'll meet you there at the bank. Doing what the journey, journey, la 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 how did you make out? Oh, fine, just fine. Did you get the money? Yeah, indeed, I did. Look, yes, look at it. Good. An awful lot. Yeah, $5,000. You certainly are a clever woman. Goodness, you're the one who deserves all the credit. Uh, are we all packed? Yes. Good. Where are the bags? Uh, right over there. You know, Emmy, I've just been reading this travel folder. Uh -huh. Las Vegas must be a beautiful place. Oh, yes, I'm sure we'll have a good time there. 
I guess we'd better get started, hmm? Uh, well, not yet. I want to make a phone call first. Oh, all right. Oh, I bought you a present on the way home. Really? What is it? One of those lifetime pens. Oh, Emmy, you shouldn't have done that. Nonsense. It's a good investment. Central Hotel. Oh, oh, hello. I'd, I'd like to talk to Mr. George Sutter, please. One moment, please. Uh, well, I hope he's in. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Sutter. Who's this? Uh, this is Emmy Lake. Oh, hello, Emmy. I called to tell you that Paul and I are leaving town. Uh, we're taking a little vacation. Oh, good. Before we go, I thought that you should know one thing. Yeah, what's that? Well, uh, you know how you said that Paul was an old has-been? Yeah. Well, he forged a check the other day that I deposited in my bank. Well... The check cleared today. And the signature was so good that we were able to get $5,000 out of the victim's account. Well, why are you telling me this? Well, call your bank, Mr. Sutter. Huh? You were the victim. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Cross, who are you kidding anyway? My whole salary is eaten up by taxes and current expenses. So when you talk to me about saving for future independence, I say it can't be done. Ah, but it can Thousands of Equitable Society members whose income is no larger than yours are looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Better give me the lowdown on this plan, Mr. Cross. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second... You can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a method of reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss. Able to do the things you've always wanted to do. You know, I think I ought to look into this plan. Then I suggest that you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Old Lady Larceny. The Bible, besides being America's best-selling literature, is also a handbook on the proper way to conduct your daily life. For if there is one certain moral to be drawn from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it is the biblical quote that all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. The swindler who made his illicit livelihood by cashing worthless checks in turn found himself the victim of a similar maneuver. But society has not benefited because one charlatan robbed another. So for your FBI, this case goes on apace. And it will go on until the guilty criminals are arrested and made to realize that the power and the majesty of the law are greater than the power any criminal assumes for himself. Tonight's FBI file continues in downtown Los Angeles in front of the First National Bank. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just parking his car. Hold it, Jim. Oh, hello, Ned. No need for you to get out. I've gotten all the information. Oh, fine. Head off Fifth Street. We've got a stop to make. Right. How'd you make out? 
Well, I went to the address the bank gave me. As I sort of expected, Mr. Sutter doesn't live there anymore. Uh In fact, he moved away two years ago. No forwarding address, I imagine. No. Oh, what happened at the bank? They received a phone call from Sutter just before I arrived there. Really? What about? Checking up on his balance. Huh? It seems they had just cleared a check for $5,000 on his account the day before. Drawn against his account? Yes. <laughs> and this will hand you a laugh. Huh? He was quite upset about it. He claimed that the check was forged. You mean someone turned the tables <laughs> on him? <laughs> Evidently, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Hey, did uh, Sutter say anything about coming into the bank? No, but I've alerted them in case he does. Oh. Did you find out who drew this $5,000 check? Yes, a woman named Emmy Lake. She had an account at the Hillside Bank. What do you mean, had? When Sutter's money cleared, she took it and closed out her account. Oh. Did you get her address? Yes, that's where we're going now. Oh, dear. Yes, Emmy. Just look at those mountains. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. Real majestic. Oh. Uh, what time are we due into Las Vegas? Oh, about now. Oh, it's a pity. I'm enjoying this so. Do you know what it reminds me of, Emmy? What? Our honeymoon. Oh. Remember that horse and wagon we stole? <laughs> Indeed, I do. That little hotel we went up to in the mountains? <laughs> yes. Oh, what greenhorns we were in those days. Paid for everything with cash. <laughs> no, I know. What, what are you writing? I'm just breaking in my new pen. Whose signature is that? The president of the railroad. I copied it off the timetable. Well, what are you going to use it for? Well, we've ordered lunch sent in here, haven't we? You mean you want to sign for it? I was considering it. Oh, no. Don't, Paul. After all, we're on a vacation. Doesn't seem to be anyone home, Ned. No. Wait a minute, there's someone coming down the hall. Uh Uh-huh. Can I help you, gentlemen? Oh, yes. We're looking for a woman named Emmy Lake. I believe that this is her apartment. It was her apartment. They gave it up earlier today. They? She and her husband. They went off, bag and baggage. Do you work here in the building? Yes. My husband's the superintendent. Have you any idea where these people went? No, they didn't say. Well, we're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. I see. Oh, I wonder if we could look around the apartment, please. Surely. I, I have their key right here. That's fine, thanks. Are the lakes in trouble? Well, this is just an investigation. Go right in. Thank you. Go ahead, Nan. Right. I hope they didn't do anything wrong. They're such a nice old couple. Is this their furniture? No, it belongs to the building. I've already cleaned the place up. I don't think you'll find anything. What did they leave behind? Some food and newspapers and waste paper. It's all in a barrel out back. I see. Maybe you'd like to look at it. The other man did. Oh? What other man? A fellow who came here just before you did. He seemed awful anxious to know where the lakes were, too. What'd he look like? Wait a minute, Ned. Well, uh, he... I have a picture of Sutter here. Madam, could you tell me, was this the man? Yes, that's him. Did he find anything in that barrel? Yes, a, a, a travel folder. I, I don't know what that meant to him. Did you see the folder? Not well enough to tell what place it was from. As soon as he found it, he ran right out of here. He had a cab waiting outside. Did you by any chance hear him tell the driver where to go? Yes, I did. He said the Central Hotel. Mm-hmm. Ned, it's pretty apparent that this old couple have beaten Sutter to his own game. They took that $5,000 from his account and have run out of town. And Sutter figures that travel folder will lead them to them. That's about it. Let's get a complete description of Mr. and Mrs. Lake, then we'll drive right over to the Central Hotel. <laughs> What happened, Jim? I just checked with the hotel clerk. Yes? I showed him Sutter's picture. He recognized it all right. Good. Is he in his room? No. Checked out half an hour ago. Oh, what a break. Uh-huh. Wait. Uh, how about checking the travel desk? Sutter I might have... just talked to them, Ned. He didn't get any transportation from them. If that old couple had a travel folder, they're probably heading for a resort. Yes, I know. 
But there are plenty of resorts. If we'd only got... Hold it. Huh? Ned, I've got an idea. Come on. Emmy. Uh, yes, dear? Uh, can we take a little walk around the grounds? Well, I think you've had enough exercise for the day. Uh, we're going right to the cottage now. I'm not tired. Well, you certainly should be. Four games of shuffleboard. And I enjoyed it. Oh, and I was very proud of you, dear. That man you beat was less than half your age. Oh, I was just lucky. That's all. Well, I called for some tea and cookies while you were playing. The hotel is sending them over. Oh, good. Go ahead, dear. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Sutter. Surprise? Uh, well, yes. What are you doing here? Well, I went to your apartment and found the travel folder you threw away advertising this hotel. Oh. Then I called here to see if you'd made a reservation. When I found out that you'd taken this cottage, I took the next plane. Well, that was a very sneaky thing to do. You know why I'm here, of course. Uh, vacation? No, money. I want my $5,000. Well, now, look. Now, uh, now I... just a minute, Paul. I'll handle this. Uh, Mr. Sutter, we are not giving you back that money. Oh, no? No. And if you don't like my attitude, you you can call in the police. I'm not that stupid. Well, then how else are you going to prove that it's yours? By taking it away from you. Mr. Sutter, you can't... Hold everything, Sutter. Oh. What? Oh, oh, are you the young man with the tea? No, ma'am. I'm from the FBI. Huh? FBI? F Goodness, well, what are you doing here? I followed Sutter. How'd you know I'd be here? I knew that you were looking for this old couple. I also learned that you found a travel folder that told you where they were. So I went to your hotel. Their record showed that before you checked out, you'd made a long-distance call here to Las Vegas. So I took a plane right up. Well, this certainly was a short vacation. Oh, I think I can arrange for a long one. For all of you. <laughs> George Sutter, the bad check passer, and his erstwhile confederates, Paul and Emmy Lake, were tried for their many crimes in a federal court. They were all sentenced to long terms in the penitentiary. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI was closed not only because of the superior investigative work on the part of a special agent, but also because of the aid he received from two sections of FBI headquarters in Washington. The first of those sections is the laboratory, which is filled with skilled technicians all working towards scientifically exterminating the criminal. Their work with iodine fumes brought out the latent fingerprints on a check, and from there the prints went to the identification section a section which checks 20,000 sets of fingerprints every day for local police departments throughout the nation. There is no question but that the thousands of special agents throughout the country form a network of infinitely skilled specialists. But it is equally true that their task is made immeasurably easier because of the work the Washington headquarters does for them. For them, and thus for you. The American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States.
Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Innocent Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another exciting story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Innocent Thief, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Were you born between 1900 and 1910? Then here's a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, just think of all the advances in medical science since you first saw the light of day. Sulfur drugs, insulin, and dozens of others. Since 1910, there's been a 68% increase in the proportion of people over 65 years of age in this country. With this percentage growing greater all the time, there certainly is a very good chance that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 14 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance, with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Innocent Thief. Nineteen forty-seven has not yet run through a quarter of its allotted number of months. But already there is evidence that the number of spectacular crimes in the nation is on the rise. A community fund is stolen from a strong box in the Midwest. A schoolgirl is kidnapped from her home in the West. A bank in Virginia is robbed for the first time in its 65-year history. There's no end to the recital. But the pace of the crime wave is quickening. A major crime is committed somewhere in the United States every 21 seconds. And in the course of those crimes, innocent people are involved. Innocent people who are used as pawns by the criminals. That is why the crime wave is a problem belonging not only to your FBI, but also to you. Tonight's file opens in a roadhouse located in the outskirts of a large eastern city. It is after midnight. For the past half hour, a floor show has been in progress. Sonny Everett, master of ceremonies, is just bringing it to a close. Well, folks, that about concludes our little show. But before I leave, I must tell you about a funny thing that happened to me on the way to the club tonight. Oh, will you hear this? It'll kill you. A fella came up to me and said, can you spare something for a cup of coffee? I said, sorry, Mac, all I have is ten pennies. He says, that's okay, buddy. I'll buy drip coffee. Well, folks, I could keep you screaming like this for hours, but right now, everybody dance. Well, May. Huh? 
What'd you think of it? Oh, Steve. What'd you think of the show? You really want me to tell you? Bad, huh? Awful. I'm gonna murder that agent. What a routine he gave me. He said that MC was the greatest performer since Lou Parker. Huh. Look at him. Heading right for the bar. That's where he performs best. He's been Forget drunk. Forget him, Steve. But Forget honey. Get a load at table twenty seven. Huh? Guy with the two dames. Oh. Look at that jewelry. Wow. Yeah, real heavy. Thought you might have overlooked it. As a matter of fact, I did. That's what that comedian is doing to me. Look, the guy's calling for a check. Uh uh-uh. uh. Where's Vinny? Over there with the blonde. Oh. Then. Then. <laughs> he hates to walk out on that. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me, Steve? Yeah. Uh, sick of gander at table 27. Huh? Oh, the, the skinny guy with the two old tomatoes? That's right. Hey, look at the ice they're packing. Huh? I want you to look at it. When they leave here, I want you to be right behind them. Walker, let's yes? have another round here, will you? Look, Sonny, we got to close up. Don't you want a nightcap? No, thanks. Then bring a drink for me and May. No, none for me, Sonny. <laughs> well, just so nobody's offended, I'll have one. Okay, but this is positively the finish. I got some news for you, kid. I was finished the day I opened on this joint. Chaser. There you are. Thanks. May? Yeah? You mind if I call you May? No. Say, what's your boyfriend Steve got against me? He just doesn't like your act. What? He doesn't think you're funny. Who does he think he is? The guy that's paying you. Yeah, in the dark he's paying me. I took the biggest cut of my life to work this dump. Well, that'll certainly teach me a lesson. Well, settle it with him, will you? Yeah, there's plenty I've got to settle with him. Billing, for one thing. I was right in my contract. Star billing. And look what happens. Look outside. There's dancing, liquor, steaks, French fried potatoes, and Sonny Everett. <laughs> the least he could have done was coast army with the French fried potatoes. Hey. Well, hey, it just yeah. shows you one thing. Come here, will you? you okay, work then. your head off for a guy, get all special material, and what happens? No appreciation. How'd you make out? Come on, in the office. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. May, where's Steve? He went into town. What for? To deposit tonight's receipt. Tell me, how'd you do? Well, take a look. Hey. Yeah. I uh, had some trouble, though. What kind of trouble? Well, I done the job okay, but on the way back here, a state trooper got on my tail. You saw the stick? No, no, I, uh, I was speeding. Well, that was smart. Well, I lost the car. We still could have gotten your license. Yeah, but I didn't use my own car. Who did he use? The comedian. Sonny Everett? Yeah. Where's the car now? Outside in the parking lot. Oh, that trooper's liable to come by here. No matter whose car you use, he could still... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Wasn't that Sonny Everett out at the bar? Yeah, why? You stay here. I've got an idea that'll fix the whole thing. In the nearby city in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is also discussing the jewel robbery. I was just about leaving here, Ross, when the report on the robbery came in. And this will be an all-night session for you, huh? Works that way, hmm? What are the details on the job, Jim? Well, a man and two women were driving home from a roadhouse out on Route 24, a place called the Columbia Inn. Yeah? They came to a lonely intersection, observed the stop sign, a car pulled up beside them. The man jumped out, pointed a gun at them. Was he alone? It appeared that way, yes. He ordered the women to strip off their jewelry. They obeyed. Then he took their car keys and drove away. Well, what was the value of the jewelry? Well, it's estimated between twenty and $25,000. Wow. Uh, could they describe this man? No, he masked his face with a handkerchief. But they did describe his car. Well, what about it? A dark blue or black coupe. The right front fender was smashed, the right door heavily dented. Any further leads on the bandit? Well, a state trooper reported chasing a black coupe in that vicinity. He was after him for speeding. Well, what happened? He lost him when he went across the state line. That's why we were called into the case. Mm-hmm. Did he get the license? Yes, it's being checked now. Oh, excuse me, Russ. Right. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Sergeant Leo, Maywood Police. Oh, yes, Sergeant. You fellas looking for a black coupe? Yes. Right fender and door pretty well banged up? That's right. License number 6N274? 6N274. 
Ten, two, seven. That's the car, Sergeant. Well, we picked it up in a ditch just outside of town. The driver was still behind the wheel. Injured? No, just drunk. Huh? We're holding him here. Well, thanks, Sergeant. I'll be right out there. Okay. Everybody go home? Yep. Let me get back yet? Uh-huh. You nail that stuff? Yep. Then, where is he? He went out again. What for? He's trying to be a genius. What are you talking about? After he grabbed the jewels, the cop chased him. He ducked the cop and he came back here. Yeah. But he was afraid that the cop might come here after him. That's where the genius Look, comes Look, get in. to the point, will you? He used Sonny Everett's car for the job. Huh? So he's framing Everett. He's going to make it look like he did it. How? Everett was drunk. Yeah. Then he took him out of here, and he's going to leave him in his car by the side of the road. Oh, that's stupid. I tried to stop him. Where's the jewelry? He took it with him. What for? Steve, I don't know. Do you see he was coming back here? No, he's going home. Well, I'm going into town and see that guy right now. <laughs> Right in here, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Sergeant. Go right ahead. Thanks. Everett. Come on, Everett, wake up. Come on, come on, wake up. Oh, okay. This man's from the FBI. He wants to ask you some questions. Huh? He wants to ask you some questions. You mean I'm on again? Never mind the comedy. Was that funny? Mr. Everett. The police tell me that you maintain you know nothing at all about the jewel robbery. That's right. Yet you were found in the car that was used by the thief. The victims have definitely identified it. I know. That car is registered in your name. That's right. It's it's mine. That's pretty incriminating evidence. I know. Uh, There's one other factor, Mr. Taylor. Yes, Sergeant? This man is the master of ceremonies at the nightclub the victims attended just before they were robbed. Oh. Well, Everett, what have you got to say to all this? Oh, the, the same thing I... I've been saying for the last two hours. I, I don't know anything about it. It's not a very original answer. Look, all, all I can tell you is this. I, I ain't thinking too good, but I remember being at the club. I, 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 was, I was drinking, drinking a lot. But from there on, it's a, it's a blank. Next thing I knew, I, I was picked up in the car. I see. Look, mister, I, I think I can underwrite one thing. The only stuff I ever stole in my life was bows and jokes. I I didn't cop that jewelry. Sergeant. Yeah? You didn't find any trace of the jewelry around the car? No, we didn't. Well, I guess that'll be all for now. Let's go back to your office, Sergeant. Very well. Uh, what, a, what about me? You stay here. Well, gee, can't I even call my agent? In just a minute. Well, Mr. Taylor, do you think we should prepare formal charges against Everett? No, I wouldn't yet, Sergeant. Why not? Well, for one thing, I have a feeling the circumstantial evidence against him is too pat. And don't forget, the victims didn't think that he resembled the hold-up man at all. Then what'll we do with him? Well, let's find out what time that nightclub opens. I want to take Everett out there and see if we can find anything that'll help prove his innocence. going to go to bed. I got the stuff. The ice? Yeah. Sure. It's right here. Let me see. There you are. Oh, not bad. Yeah. Look at the rocks in that pin, huh? Mm-hmm. Stuff must be worth 20 G's easy. Mate tells me you had trouble. Yeah. I, I want to hear about it. Well, I, I got in a little jam, but by some real smart thinking, I got out again. You mean by framing the act? That's right. Pretty clever, huh? You don't think you'll get away with it, do you? Why not? The guy was blind drunk. Lots of drunks remember things. He's liable to be singing to the cops right now. What can he tell them? 
That you planted him in the car? Oh, who'd believe that? The cop. My word is as good as his. But your record ain't. You made a real sucker move, then. You uh, think I ought to blow town or something? No. What else, then? I got that all figured out. Well? Wherever you go, you're liable to be picked up. And no one use any. If you're picked up, you're liable to talk. Oh, you're crazy. And if you talk, that gets me in trouble. Now, look, Steve. This is the only way to settle it. Now, wait a minute, Steve. Thanks for being stupid. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Okay, Mr. Cross, sounds swell, but I'm no rich man. What with taxes and high prices, I haven't saved a cent. So how can I afford to do anything about being independent 20 years from now? You'd be surprised what you can do. In the Equitable Society are thousands of men earning no more than you do, and they're looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Well, if that's a fact, I'd like to hear some more about this plan. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a practical method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss. Hey, this is beginning to interest me a lot. Well, then get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Innocent Thief. To escape just punishment, the average criminal will offer anyone as a sacrifice to the law. His friend, his benefactor... Or his mother. All that's important to the criminal is that he escapes detection. Because to the criminal, there's really only one crime he can commit. And that crime is getting caught. His very livelihood depends on his taking what does not belong to him. And the selfish instinct, the wild greed that drives him to commit the crimes he does also drives him to attempt to escape blame by sacrificing an innocent person's good name. So your FBI advises you never to meddle with criminals. And when you find a criminal, do your duty and call your local police department. You owe that to your fellow Americans and to yourself. <laughs> Our FBI file continues. Twelve hours have elapsed. Special Agent Jim Taylor and Sonny Everett, the innocent suspect, have gone out to the Columbia Inn. They're just entering the owner's office. Sit down, fellas. Thank you. Mr. Harrison, where's May? Oh, she'll be right in. Mr. Harrison, you already know about the holdup. Yeah, I read about it in the papers. Well, then I suppose you know the police are holding Everett here as a suspect. Yeah, that's tough. You looking for me, Steve? Uh, come on in, May. Close the door. Okay. Now, this is this is Mr. Taylor. He's from the FBI. Oh, How do you hello. Know? And you know Sonny, of course. Yeah, sure. Hi, May. The suspect in a holdup. He's oh. trying to clear himself. He thought maybe you could help him. I'm glad to. How, Sonny? 
Well, May, I'm trying to piece together what I did last night. When I was first arrested, I couldn't remember anything. Parts of it have come back. Maybe you can fill me in on the rest. Well, I'll try, Sonny. Well, after the last show, I started drinking. Then Steve here went out. That I remember good. Uh-huh. Then you came along. I was talking to you and the bartender. That's right. Then Vinny came in. Huh? He called you back here. You talked a while. And then he came out and took me to my car. Oh, wait a minute. That ain't so. But I remember. Then he left here early. He never did come back. When you went out, Sonny, you went out alone. But, May, I know Vinny was here. Look, who was drinking? You or me? Well, where is this man, Vinny? Perhaps we can talk to him and get his version. Well, he won't be in tonight. He works here, doesn't he? And that's right, but he called a while ago and said he was taking a few days off, uh, going out of town. Mr. Taylor, I bet anything that guy's trying to duck out. Of what? Of being nailed for the robbery. Ah, oh, just a minute, He's son. the guy that framed Hold it, Hold it, Let me handle this, please. Mr. Harrison, did Vinny say where he was going? Well, no, he didn't. Well, we'll just have to wait until he returns. But he's liable That'll be you. all for now. Thank you both for your cooperation. Special Agent Scott. Hello, Ross. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. How'd you make out of the roadhouse? The owner and his girl tried their best to implicate Everett. They wouldn't back up his story? No, not a bit. Well, what about this man Vinny ever talked about? He wasn't there. He presumably has gone out of town. I see. I talked to a parking lot attendant, however. He said he saw Vinny carry Everett out to his car last night. Everett couldn't even walk. Well, that certainly should prove his innocence. Yes. Well, have you any idea where this Vinny can be found? Well, Everett knows where he lives. We're going over there now. <laughs> No, oh, come on in. How's business? Fair. Yeah, it's the weather, I guess. Well, if you're looking for an excuse, you can blame it on that. Honey, rainy nights, you never... Look, let's face it. This ain't exactly a gold mine. Yeah, that's right. Well, why do we hang on to it? For the suckers we promote. That score last night wasn't bad. It wasn't good either. What do you mean? Well, gee, you had to kill Vinny to come out even. That was his fault. That don't make no difference. Look, Steve, let's get out of this, huh? How? Well, you taking those jewels to the fence yet? No, I was going over there now. Well, look, if the payoff is good, we can take the dough, go away, and give this joint back to the Indians. Vinny can't be home, Mr. Taylor. Even my audience couldn't sleep through that. Well, then I'd better try this key. You think it's all right? Oh, I picked up a search warrant on the way over here. I mean, do you think that the key will fit? Oh. That should answer your question. Come on. All right. It's a very small scatter. I, uh, I've been here before. Everett, were you and Vinny friendly? <laughs> Are you kidding did you ever catch my act? No, oh, I'm afraid I haven't. Well, the routine is roughly like this. I open with a few fast topicals, segue into a patter tune, and I do my imitation. Now, ordinarily, Mr. Taylor, if the audience uh, Everett, is just a... uh, you were going to tell me whether you were friendly with Vinny. Well, I was coming to that. Oh. An act like mine, and what do you think a bum like that Vinny does? Sleeps through the imitation. Then you weren't very friendly. Friendly? Jackie Gleason has got a routine about guys like him. Uh, his opening Wait joke starts a... Huh? Come here. Look in this drawer. What is it? Women's purses, two of them. Well, what about them? Well, judging by this card, I'd say they completely exonerate you. How? Here's the name of one of the women who was held up. This is her purse. Then Vinnie did do the job. Yes, and he... Uh-oh, hold it. Hey, what's with the Jolson? With the what? Down on one knee. Oh. I'm just examining this spot on the floor. Well... Been scrubbed with water, but around the edges it looks suspiciously like blood stain. What? Yes. I couldn't say for sure until it's analyzed, but I've seen enough of it in the past. Hey, do you think Vinny was knocked off or something? Well, that would be quite logical. Ever did Vinny smoke cigars? No. Why? It's one here in this ashtray. Steve was the only guy who used them. Oh. Any idea what kind he smoked? Some fancy Cuban kind. He was always flashing them. Hey, look at this band. Would this be it? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's what he smoked. Look, Mr. Taylor, catch me up on this. I'm about 20 lanes behind you. Well, up to now, of course, it's all conjecture, but... Putting all the elements together, it's highly possible that Vinny was murdered. Huh? And it's also a pretty good guess that Steve is the one who killed him. So that's it. Where's the body? Well, I imagine Steve would be clever enough to make sure that was cleverly disposed of. Then how can you prove Vinny was murdered? Well, without a corpse, it's just about impossible. But I would... Wait a minute. Huh? I've got an idea, and it might work. Everett, is that really a good act you do? Oh, now, look. You're going to get a chance to prove it. Hi, honey. Well, I thought you'd never get back. What's wrong? Nothing. I was just worrying about you carrying all that jewelry. There's so many thieves around. Don't ever worry about me. Did you see the fence? Yeah. What do you offer you? Eight thousand. For all that? Well, you said it ain't worth much more than twenty. I thought this was going to be a real big score. Uh, maybe it's just as well. Why? I've been thinking over that going away deal. Yeah? It'd be the wrong move to make right now. Our best bet is to stay here and the heat on. Oh, no. Now, look, honey, that's what we're doing. Oh. I'll get it. Hello? Is that you, May? Yeah? This is Vinny, May. Huh? I said this is Vinny. No. I just called to see how things were going out there. It can't be. I just wanted to find no. out. No! What's the matter? That was Vinny. What? Vinny! No, Look, May. I know his voice. You told me he was there. That's right. But he just talked to me. Honey, believe me, I killed the guy. I took his body and buried it right out in the back of the joint. Thanks. Huh? FBI. You heard his statement, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I did. What is this? I understand you thought Sonny Everett did a very bad act. Well, his impersonation of your late friend Vinny on the phone just now was good enough to send you to the chair for murder. Steve Harrison was turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted him on the charge of first-degree murder. May, his girlfriend, was prosecuted for complicity in the jewel robbery and sentenced to a long term in prison. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI emphasizes a very important point about the workings of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Of the people arrested last year by your FBI, 97% were convicted when they appeared in court. Your FBI is justifiably proud of that record because it implies a thoroughness in the gathering of evidence. But your FBI is also very proud of the several cases in its files that resemble tonight. Cases in which your FBI not only apprehended the guilty parties, but also lifted the suspicion that had been placed on an innocent victim. For that, too, is part of protecting you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Divorced Child. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. 
Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Divorced Child, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you between the ages of 35 and 45? Then here's a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Let's see now. In 1975, there will be 20 million people in the United States who have passed their 65th birthday. That's twice as many as we have today. And those 20 million will be drawn from people who are between 35 and 45 today. So the chances are very good that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 14 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Divorced Child. The number one problem facing every law enforcement agency in the United States, including your FBI, is juvenile delinquency. That is a sobering fact. For from the younger generation must come the men and women who will run the nation in a few years. For that reason, it's up to everyone to do his or her share in fighting the problem. For we dare not leave the heritage of a morally corrupt generation to the world of tomorrow. It is a sad but undeniable true fact that the basic reason for the prevalence of juvenile delinquency today is the laxness of some parent. Parents who believe that it's possible to allow their told children just to grow up by themselves. Nothing could be further from the truth. Tonight's FBI file opens in a residential suburb of a large Midwestern city. In a comfortable home on a quiet, tree-shaded street, Midge Morgan, age 16, is sitting in her room. Her mother enters. Midge? Oh, hi, Mom. I thought you were going to the bridge club. Well, I... I am. Late, aren't you? Uh, that doesn't matter. Um... Uh, Midge? Yeah? Uh, there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, look, Mom, it is the way I left the bathroom this morning. Uh, I could... No, dear, this is really serious. Oh? Uh, it's about your father and me. Well? Uh, well, uh, this trip he's taken, he... He didn't go away because of business. What do you mean? Uh, we're getting a divorce. Mom! Oh, I know this is a shock to you, oh, darling. Oh, Mom, you're kidding. No, I'm sorry to say I'm not. Oh! No, now, dear. Oh, you can't do it, Mommy. Don't you see? You just can't. Now, Midge, dear, it won't be too bad. Your father and I have arranged everything in a very friendly fashion. Oh, no! We, uh, we knew you had to be considered, too. So we agreed that we would share you. What does that mean? Why, you'll live with him six months of the year and me six months. 
I want to live with both of you together. <laughs> but, darling, that's impossible. Why? Because... Because your father and I are finished. Oh, Mommy, isn't there anything I could do? No, dear. If you've had a quarrel or something, I could patch it up. Honest, I could. Oh, it's beyond that, darling. Oh, please, Mom. <laughs> now, please, dear, don't carry on like that. You're only upsetting me. <laughs> Midge, look. Maybe after a while you'll have a new daddy. What? Yes, someone who'll take care of us both a lot better than your father has. You mean you already have someone else in mind? Mommy, have you? Well, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> now, he's a very nice man, dear. I don't want to hear anymore. Midge, where are you going? I'm getting out of here. Midge, Midge! Private booth here? No, no. Um, sit down. Okay. Uh, would you like some of my coke? No, thanks. I just had too frosted. Hey, is something the matter with you? Why? I've been watching you for the last ten minutes. You look really down, girl. I am. Well, now just put your head on Aunt Taffy's shoulder and tell all. What is it, sugar? Oh, Taffy, I'm just miserable. Man trouble? Oh no, it's it's my mother and father. What about them? They're getting a divorce. <laughs> Is that all that's bothering you? <laughs> Kathy, it's horrible. Oh, Mid, you're so provincial. Huh? It happens to everybody. Oh, no, Taffy. Honey, my father and mother have been divorced for over two years. They have? Sure. When it first happened, I felt just like you do. Really? Yeah. And then one day I figured out something. I figured if they could divorce each other, I had a perfect right to divorce them. And that solved everything. What do you mean? Well, from then on, I've lived my own life, and nobody's bothered me. But what about your mother? Uh, she's so busy going out all the time, she doesn't know what I'm doing. Gee. Mitch, believe me, you should do the same thing. How? Look, what are you doing tonight? I, I don't know. I'm not going home, that's one sure thing. Perfect. Let me get you a date. Who with? Oh, none of these squares around here. I know some older fellas, very sophisticated types. Would you like to meet them? Sure. Why not? Well, oh, but I'm not dressed for a day. Oh, you can wear something of mine. Finish your coat and we'll go over to my house and call them up. Kathy, mm -hmm. do you see them? No, but they're in the club here someplace. Gee, what a mob. Oh, oh, there they are. Frankie! Hey, Frankie! Shall we go over there? Are you kidding? Make them come to us. We sees you. Uh-huh. And he's coming, too. Which is my date, the tallest one. He's cute. Uh, hi, Annie. Hi, here, Frankie. Hello, Taff. Oh, hi, Andy. I want you both to meet a girlfriend of mine, Midge Morgan. This is Frank Shelton hi. and Andy Bristol. How do you do? Pleased to make your acquaintance. Well, how's about we sit down and go against a couple of beers? You got a table? Yeah, right there. Oh, look, well, we're going to powder our noses. We'll be right back. Okay. Come on. Will you excuse us, please? Huh? Oh, oh, sure. Order us a couple of beers anyway. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, Andy, what do you think? My date? Yeah. Not bad. Uh, looks a little square, though. Look, if she's a friend of Taffy, she's okay. What'll we do with him? Well, we'll stay here a while and make the rounds. We ain't got no car. Don't worry, we will have it. In fact, I can take care of that right now. What do you mean? Stale one. Oh. Well, what about the dames? You stay here and feed him some beer. Now pick up a heap and be back in an hour. In the nearby city at police headquarters, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with an old friend, Detective Sergeant Bill Collins. This is a kind of a dirty trick to play on you, Jim. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you're supposed to be having a night off, so you wind up sitting around here listening to my trouble. I'm glad to do it, Bill. You know that. Now, let's have your story, huh? Well, as you know, my sole assignment for the past few months has been juvenile delinquency. Yes. It's a full-time job, believe me. I'm sure it is. One element I've come across has an FBI angle. Oh, what is it, though? Stolen cars. Hmm? 
Two of them were picked up here in the city this morning. They'd been stolen in the suburbs and taken across the state line. Stolen by youngsters? Well, it appears that way. Were they apprehended? No, but I'm sure kids did the job. Huh? Why? Well, for one thing, they weren't stolen for profit. They'd been used overnight and then abandoned. Oh, I see. And in both cars, the upholstery had been slashed, clocks broken, acts of pure vandalism, typical of misguided kids. Mm -hmm. uh, did the local police where the cars were stolen have any leads on the car thieves? No. Nope. Bill, have you had your dinner yet? No, I haven't. Neither have I. So let's go get something to eat, huh? We can talk this thing over and figure out how to proceed. <laughs> How about another beer? Well, yes. <laughs> Swell. How about you, Taff? Huh? How about another beer? I want something stronger than beer. What's more, I want another date. Look, Frankie, you'll be here. You've been saying that for the last hour. Oh, Taff, you're being a bad sport. Pop, we're supposed to be having fun. That's what you told me. <laughs> Remember? Some <laughs> fun sitting here and watching hey, there you. there he is get... now. Well, it's about time. Hiya, kids. Hi, Hi. Frankie. Where have you been? You've got some nerve. Relax, sweetheart. I've been out getting us some transportation. Want a beer, Frankie? No, not here. Let's go someplace where there's real action. Oh, wonderful. I've got a good mind to go home. Look, Taffy, I don't want no trouble with you. You understand? Ah. Uh, Andy, you paid up here? Yeah. All right, then let's go. Come on, Taffy. Oh, okay. Where are we going? Oh, uh, we'll hit the river club first. Oh, Taffy, I'm having such a wonderful time. No more worries. Oh, I should say not. Go ahead. Okay. Where's the car? Right over there. That big convertible? Yep. Oh, nice going. What are we riding in? This little job right here. Frankie, gee, that's snazzy. Where did you get that? Stole it. <laughs> oh, it's a comedian. <laughs> All right. Pile in, gals. Hello? Hello, Jim. This is Bill Collins. Oh, hello, Bill. I'm sorry to bother you at home, Jim, but I just came back here to headquarters. I found a report I thought I should pass on to you. Oh, what is it? It came from out in Blackton. A car was stolen out there about an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Go on. It belonged to a Dr. Brown. Uh, he stopped at a patient's house, and while he was inside, his car was taken. I see. He saw the thief from a window. He described him as being about 18 years old. Bill, was the thief alone? Yes. The doctor attempted to follow him in his patient's car, but he lost him right after he crossed the state line. Oh. Was he heading in here to town? Well, it appeared that way, yes. Bill, has an alarm been sent out? Yes, we've alerted all local police, given them a complete description of the car. You say you're at headquarters, huh? Yeah, that's right. I'll be right over. Open the door, Richard. Open the door and let me. <laughs> open the door, Richard. Richard, why don't you open the door? <laughs> That's so funny. Everything's so funny. Hey, Frankie, where are we going? Around the corner. Hey. I love going around corners. Now where are we going? Where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go home. Well, it's 4 a.m., kid. Everything's closed. Hey, I know a place that's never closed. Where? New York. Oh, silly. What do you mean, silly? What's wrong with New York? <laughs> it's a thousand miles away. What's wrong with that? He's right. Let's go to New York. Hey, do you mean that, Taffy? Sure. Let's go right now. Okay. Hey, wait a minute, Frankie. Huh? Important detail department. Uh, money. We'll get money. Whee! We're going to New York. Oh, honest, Taffy, are we really going? Sure. Oh, wonderful. What are you slowing down for? Pull into this gas station. Oh, you know, that is very smart of him, Taffy. Huh? If we're going to New York, we have to have gas. <laughs> is it open, Frankie? Yeah, this is an all-night place. Come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> Here's the guy. Yeah, what can I do for you? Uh, first, I want you to check the right front tire. Okay. Well, yeah, looks okay to me. Oh, oh. Frankie! Get up. Search him first, Frankie. He may have a stow on him. That's what I'm doing. What is this? What's happening? Shut up. But he hit him on the head. we got to get to New York, don't Midge, we? Let the boys do it their way. But I don't like this. I'm getting out. Uh, here's a real good roll, too. Oh. Wait a minute. 
Where are you going? I'm getting out. Get back in there. But I don't want to... Get back, I said. <gasps> now, let's get out of here. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Well, that's easier said than done, Mr. Cross. Frankly, I haven't saved a cent since prices and taxes started going up, so when you talk about independence 20 or 30 years from now, you're just not talking my language. Ah, uh, but I am. Right now, in the equitable society, are thousands of men who once had your viewpoint. But now, they're looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Independent 60s, you say? All right. How does this plan work? The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second... You can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a practical method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, able to do the things you want to do. Boy, I'd sure like to hear more about this. Well, then I suggest you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Divorced Child. In a statement to the listeners of this program a few weeks ago, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, said that one prevalent reason for delinquent children is delinquent parents. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is ample proof of that fact. Do you know the friends of your children? Do you know where your children are going when they leave the house? Do you know how your children are getting along at school? Those are questions that you who are parents should be asking yourselves. For the danger is not in the child who is occupied in healthy endeavor, but the future juvenile delinquent is the child who has too much unsupervised time on his hands. There are various agencies like schools and local youth organizations which can help you guide your child, but they can only do just so much. They cannot do a complete job because there is no substitute for parents. Tonight's file continues at the gas station. An hour has passed since the holdup. The attendant has regained consciousness and is being interviewed by Detective Sergeant Collins and Special Agent Jim Taylor. You say that the car was a gray convertible. Yes, that's right. Were you able to get the license number? No, everything happened so quickly. By the time they pulled away, I was unconscious. I'm right? certain it's the doctor's car, Jim. Yes, Sergeant, it must be. Can you describe the young man who assaulted you? Well, I'd say he was around 18 or 19 years old. Yes? Yeah? He had dark hair, was about my size, and wore a sport coat. Can you think of anything else about him? Uh, no. Who else was in the car? Two girls and another fellow. Could you describe them? Uh, no, sir. I'm afraid I couldn't. Oh, excuse me, please. Oh, certainly. Go ahead. Bill, where's that girl's scarf? I have it right here. The attendant oh. says he found it by the gas pump. Huh? That's right. Yeah. It could have belonged to one of the girls in that car. Oh, yeah. Yes, he's right here. Sergeant Collins. Yeah? This call is for you. No, thank you. Well, how's your head feel? Oh, well, not too bad. You had a doctor look at it yet? Yes, an ambulance is here. I'm going to drop by at the hospital for an x-ray later. Oh, good. Uh, now, this scarf that you found, do you think it was dropped by someone in that car? Yes, I'm sure it was. I just cleaned up around here ten minutes before they came. Uh -huh. Right, Tom. How much money did they get from it? Over $300. Yeah. Well, yes, Bill. 
Uh, that was headquarters. The stolen car was just found abandoned out on Route 30. No trace of the occupants? Not yet. They're going over the car now for fingerprints. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill, what time do the laundries open in this town? About 8 o'clock, I believe. Why? Well, there's a laundry mark on this girl's scarf. We could do a quick check with the laundries, and we should be able to learn the identity of the owner. Good morning. Huh? I said good morning, Mitch. Oh, Oh, Taffy. That's right. Oh, Taffy, my head. It hurts so. Oh, I feel awful. That figures. Why? Honey child, you have what is known as a hangover. Hangover? Darling, you weren't drinking milk. Oh, where are we? In a tourist cabin. How did we get here? We came here last night, remember? Last night? Yes. Oh. Oh. No, I do remember. The gas station, that man, that man, the boys robbed. Quiet. Oh, that was terrible, Taffy. Will you shut up? Where are they? Andy and Frank? Yes. They dropped us off here, then they went out to dump the car. Thank heavens. What do you mean? We're rid of them. Rid of them? They're coming back here for us. They're what? Look. We're all going to New York, remember? Oh, no, Taffy. The boys are picking up another car. And you want to go with them? Sure, why not? Well, I don't. Taffy, I want to go home. To your mother? Yes. I thought you couldn't put up with her getting divorced. Anything is better than this. I'm not going with you. Look, honey, you haven't got much choice. What do you mean? We were all in that stick-up last night. But I didn't want any part of it. I even tried to get out of the car, don't you remember? Oh, that makes no difference. You're in just as much trouble as the boys are. Oh, this is awful. Oh, look, Midge. Everything's awful because you've got a hangover. There's a lunch wagon across the highway. We'll go over there and get some breakfast. I'll guarantee you that after you've eaten something, you'll feel altogether different. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Morgan? That's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? Yes, that's right. Here are my credentials. Uh, I see. May I come in, please? Well, yes, of course. Mrs. Morgan, I've come here to talk to you about your daughter. You know where Midge is. You found her. She isn't here? No, she didn't come home all night. Just ten minutes ago, she called and she was crying. She said she was in trouble and she was going to New York. But before I could uh, question her any further, she hung up. Did she say where she was? No. Why are you here? Well, I'm sorry to say I have reason to believe that your daughter was involved in a gas station holdup. Oh. At about four o'clock this morning. That can't be. Do you recognize this scarf? Yes, it belongs to Midge. It was found at the scene of the holdup. One of the girls in the car dropped it. Uh, but Midge couldn't be involved in anything like that. You just said that she hadn't been home all night. Yes, but this is the first time it ever happened. Midge is a good girl. She never stays out. She wouldn't have last night if... Uh, well, if... Well? Well, yesterday afternoon, I I had to tell Midge that her father and I were getting a divorce. It, it was a terrible shock to her, and she ran out of the house, and that's the last time I saw her. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear. If she's fallen in with bad company and gotten into trouble, then it could even be my fault. Yes. I'm quite sure that it could, Mrs. Morgan. What can be done? How can I find her? Now you say she called approximately ten minutes ago? Yes. Have you received any calls since then? No. Well, it's possible that the phone company will cooperate with us in helping to trace that call. Oh, I hope so. I'll get to work on it at once. Colin speaking. Hello, Bill. Jim Taylor. Yes, Jim. I just interviewed the Morgan girl's mother. Yes? Yeah? called home about 10 minutes before I got there. I traced the call. It came from a diner on a Route 28. I see. I'll give you the location. Meet me out there. Any luck, Jim? I just talked to the manager of the diner. Did he have any information? No, he just went on duty. His night man went home about an hour ago. And uh, he's the man to see. That's right. Did you get his address? Yes, I have it right here. Let's go. Well, I talked to the counterman. What's the story? I described the Morgan girl to him. He remembers her all right. She came in with another girl. 
Now, what about the two young men? No sign of them. Did uh, he notice if they drove up? No, he said they came on foot. And I have a hunch that that tells us where to find them. Frankie, you gonna leave the car right here? Sure, we'll be pulling right out. Let's go in and get the gals. Okay. I hope they aren't disappointed about this heap. Why should they be? Well, it ain't got the class the other one had. It'll get us to New York just as good. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> Hi, kids. Oh. <laughs> Hiya, Frankie. Andy. Hi. <laughs> What's the matter with her? Ah, uh, she just got a hangover. That isn't it at all, Taffy. Well, what is it? I don't want to go to New York. What's got into you? I want to go home. Now, don't go starting that again. I already told you why you couldn't. Come on, let's get out of here. Okay, come on, Nick. I'm not going. Now, look, we ain't leaving you here. I'm not going, I said. Oh, what'll we do, Frankie? She's coming if we have to drag her out. Now, get up. No. Get up. Let go of me. Stop your yelling. Hey, Frankie, none of that. You'll keep out of this. Stop pushing her around. Look, I'll give it to both of you. Lay off of this, son. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? Huh? I'll handle them, Jim. Good. Come on, you. Come on, you too, young lady. Oh, thank heaven you're here. Are you the Morgan girl? Yes. How did you find us? Well, I traced your call to the diner across the highway. When I heard you'd come in there on foot, I knew you were somewhere in this neighborhood. Then I remembered this tourist camp. Oh. All right, Miss Morgan. Let's get out of here. Frankie Shelton and Andy Bristol were sent to a reformatory. They will remain there until they are 21 years old. Their companion, Taffy, was placed on probation for five years. Midge Morgan had no charges placed against her. And thus, your FBI and the local police help straighten out another delinquency problem. If your child is headed for trouble, he might be as fortunate as Midge Morgan and he might escape with only official censure. But that would be a foolhardy gamble to take, for not many juvenile delinquents are that fortunate. Your FBI sincerely trusts that you will not depend on the chance that your child will be rescued from trouble before that trouble develops, and will be given a second chance. Be a good parent, and help your child grow up so he'll never need a second chance. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Pirate. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner... Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Fugitive Pirate, on this is your FBI. This 
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. For the next 30 seconds... I want to talk to listeners between the ages of 35 and 45, to men and women who occasionally find themselves thinking, Will I be alive in 1975? Well, the answer is that a good many million of you will be alive in 75. In that year, this country will have 20 million people over 65, and that's twice as many as we have today. So, as you plan your future... Remember that there is a mighty good chance that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Pirate. This is the year when man may finally use the secret of atomic power for peaceful purposes. When man's conquest of machines will surpass his every previous achievement in the field of invention. But while some men are delving into the scientific unknown, there are others who are still plying their same old selfish trade, benefiting no one but themselves. True, they have borrowed some of the equipment of America's technical progress for their activities. But basically, they have not changed. Their motives are as primitive as the jungle. These people are criminals. The night's file opens in a cottage located in a sparsely settled section of the Florida coast. It is night. In the living room of this modest dwelling, we find John Douglas and his wife, Lucy. John? Yes, dear? Sounds like the storm's letting up. Yep. Should blow over before morning. What are you doing? I'm working on some figures, and I'm not very happy about them either. What's wrong? Well, Lucy, what was the weather and all? I was only able to work ten days last month. According to my arithmetic, we only cleared enough to make the final payment on our boat. Jim, that's wonderful. I don't think so at all. Why not? Well, you've been skimping and saving for a year so I could buy that boat. You needed it to make a living. Yes, I know, but I hope by now to be able to do something for you. Oh, John. I want to buy some clothes and things for the house. You will, John. I know you will. I can wait. Sure. Meantime. I... Oh, who's that? I'll see. Pretty late for company. Let me... Well, let... let me in, will you? Uh, sure. Here, here. Let me give you a hand. Thanks. Just lean on me. Uh, yeah. Take it easy. Oh, what's wrong with him, John? Well, I don't know. We'll see. Who is he? Never seen him before. Uh, sit here, mister. Yeah. Okay. He's wearing a life preserver. Yeah. What happened to you, mister? Uh, a boat sunk a couple miles out. Hit a reef. It's been... It's been tough get, getting in. Oh! Well, uh, Lucy, you go fix him something hot to drink. Oh, sure. I'll get these wet clothes off him right away. <laughs> That same evening at an FBI field office some 20 miles away, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at a typewriter just finishing a report. 
Jim, have you seen Mr. Barton? Oh, yes, Mark. He's down at police headquarters. I found a message at home for me to report here at once. This is my night off. It was. You've been assigned to work with me. Something big? Yes. Jewel robbery at one of the large estates on Bayfront Drive. Have you been out there? Just came back. What's our angle? The two men who did the job posed as FBI agents. Oh. What are the details? Well, a family named Claremont was giving a big party tonight. Yeah? Two men dressed in dinner clothes presented fake credentials. They asked to see Mrs. Claremont alone. I see. She took them into the library. One of the men threatened her with a gun, forced her to hand over her jewels. She was then bound and gagged. The men ran out. How much were the jewels worth? Over $50,000. When was the robbery discovered? About five minutes after the men left. But by that time, the thieves had made a clean getaway. They stole a car belonging to one of the guests. Any further word on them? Yes, the car was just found abandoned at a dock about three miles from the house. Who turned that up? Local police. Oh. They also found a witness who saw two men get out of the car and into a boat alongside of the dock. Stole a boat too, huh? No. No, the witnesses said they seemed to know their way around it. Evidently, it belonged to them. They drove off in it? Yes. Witness caught the name of the boat, however. It was the Sea Maid Second. I imagine you've already alerted the coastal authorities to be on the lookout. That's right. Have you got a description of the two men? Yes, I've already put it out on the teletype. Well, what do we do now? Just hope that we get a quick report on that boat. Morning. Oh, good morning. When did you get up? A couple minutes ago. Seen these clothes by the bed, so I put them on. That's what they were there for. How do you feel? Okay. Well enough for breakfast? Sure. How about some eggs? Uh, I just got them right fresh from the hen. Swell. Sit down. I'll, I'll have something for you in a minute. Can I watch? Oh, if you like. Where's the fellow that was here last night? My husband? Is that what he is? Yes. Kind of old for you, ain't he? He went to the store. He'll be right back. <laughs> I see. What do you folks do here? My husband has a boat. He dives for sponges. You mean he dives with one of them helmets and suits? Yes. Well, that's good to know. Is that you, John? Yes, Rosie. I'm, I'm out here in the kitchen. Oh. Uh, how about that stranger? Is he up? Oh. Good morning. Good morning. How you feeling? Okay, now. Uh, Lucy cooking up some breakfast, is Yeah, you? yeah. Well, that should put you right back on top. Sure. Yeah, uh, I guess you'll excuse me now. I got to get down to my boat. Wait, I'll walk away with you. Have got time, man? Go ahead. Yeah, just holler for him, Lucy. All right. Go ahead. All right. Mister? Douglas is the name. John Douglas. Oh. Uh, Mr. Douglas, your wife tells me you're a diver. That's right. Got all your equipment there in the boat? Yes. Then I got a proposition for you. Just listen to this. Morning, Mark. Oh, hello, Jim. What did you do, stay here all night? No, I, I just came in about 20 minutes ago. Anything break? Yes, I was just on the phone with the sheriff up at San Marino. And? The body of a man was found washed up on the beach there early this morning. From his description, he sounds like one of the missing jewel thieves. Then something must have happened to the boat. Well, according to the sheriff, that's been pretty well established. How? Well, there'd been quite a bit of debris washed up on the beach from last night's storm. It included a life preserver and a number of cushions on which was stenciled the name Sea Maid Second. How did this man die? Drowning? Mm -hmm, that's right. What about his companion? Sheriff found no trace of him. How about the boat? Any idea of where it sank? No, not so far. But the sheriff down there will get in touch with us if anything else breaks. How are we doing, Mr. Douglas? Well, we should be getting near that reef. That is, if you remember the position right. Look, I told you there was a boy no more than a hundred feet from where the boat sank. I heard the bell ring. Well, uh, he'll soon be there, then. Okay. 
think uh, I'll go below, see if your wife will rustle me a little food. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hello? Hello. I'm kind of hungry. There's some sandwiches. Help yourself. Okay. We'll be getting there soon. Ain't you excited? Why? Why? There's over $50,000 worth of jewels in that boat. The deal I made with your husband, half of that goes to him and you. I know. And you still ain't excited? No. Why not? Something wrong with this whole thing. I already told you I was working on a boat. There were jewels in that boat. The owner ran it on a reef and it sank. According to the laws of the sea, if we salvage the jewels, they belong to us. What happened to the owner? When we went down, I lost track. I still wish we'd never agreed to come. Okay, okay. Got anything to drink? There's some water in that jug. Oh. You know something? You know what's the matter with you? You just don't like nothing. <laughs> I guess that's what comes from hooking up with an old guy. You get mixed up, scared. That's not true. What you need, sweetheart, is a young guy. Now, look. Hey, hey, move on deck. We're near the boy. <laughs> okay. See you later, honey. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sheriff Brewster down at San Marino. Hello, Sheriff. Something's turned up down here I thought you should know about. Oh, what's that? I got a report that a man swam ashore last night and went to the house of a resident down here named John Douglas. Well. Sounds like the man we're looking for. Yes. Have you contacted Douglas? No, I just got the report. He told the story to a neighbor of his. Hmm? He doesn't have a telephone, so I'm going to get out there. Sheriff, I think I'd better come down to San Marino. I'll get a car and leave here within ten minutes. What's the story on your husband? Huh? Did he talk to you? Yes, just a few seconds ago. What did he say? He, he's down about 40 feet walking along the reef. Well, did he find anything? Shh. Yes, John. I've located the boat. Good. Did you find the boat? Yes. Fine. I'm on deck. Going down into the cabin now. Right. What's he saying? Tell me, will you? He's going down into the cabin. Good. He shouldn't have no trouble from now on. The jewels are in the bag right under one of the bunks. I hope he remembers that. He will. Want a cigarette? No, thanks. <laughs> you don't like me much, do you? No. Why? I don't trust you. No, that ain't the real reason. You're just scared to like me. Lucy? Yes, John? Found the jewels. I'm coming up. Very well. What's he saying? He found the jewels. Hey. He's coming up. Swell. Start the winch. Okay. Will it take him long to come up? No. And they don't give us much time, does it? For what? For getting us straightened out. Look, I think we should settle something once and for all. What? Huh? You seem to have worked out an idea that because my husband is an older man and you're young, that makes you more attractive to me. Well, you're wrong. All wrong. I love my husband very much. <laughs> no kids. Give him a hand. Help him over the side. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll take that bag. Let me help you with that helmet, John. Yeah, let's see if it's all here. Yeah, yeah, real pretty. There you are, John. Ah, thanks. Nice work, mister. Oh, it wasn't hard. You better head right in. It's getting dark. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Sorry, but, uh... We ain't going back to your place. We ain't? What do you mean? 
You just get on that wheel and go where I tell you. Now, just a minute. You heard me? Oh, John, he has a gun. Your gun. That's right. I found it in your cabin. Now, kindly do like I say. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk briefly about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Wonderful idea, Mr. Cross, but what am I going to use for money? With taxes and living costs the way they are, how are we going to save for independence 20 years from now? Well, right now in the Equitable Society, we have thousands of members who earn considerably less than you, but they're looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s Plan. I'm open-minded. How does this Independent 60s Plan work? The Independent 60s Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it, because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a practical method of reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, doing the things you want to do. Mr. Cross, this is beginning to sound pretty good to me. Well, then I suggest you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Pirate. The shocking lack of decency exhibited by the criminal in tonight's case in the files of your FBI should not be as shocking as it is. For it should be understood that in order to be a criminal, you must develop a new sense of morals, a different set of rules by which you live your life. No longer are you interested in doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. No longer do you care about the poverty and hunger that attack other people. For in the mind of the criminal, there are no other people worth thinking about. The criminal lives for himself. And in his depraved mind, there are no values beyond those that serve his petty personal needs. That is why you must do whatever you possibly can to end the wave of crime. For only one set of morals can survive, yours or his. Our FBI file continues aboard John Douglas's boat. It is night. Douglas and his wife are standing by the wheel. The jewel seat is seated behind them, giving orders. Just keep heading due south. I'll let you know when to turn in the shore. Look, uh... John, he has the gun. You've got to do as he says. Oh, very well. This is pretty dangerous, though, running on this darker night with no lights. If we ain't got lights, nobody sees us. That's how I want it. You didn't tell us the truth before, did you? About what? That sunken boat and the jewels. <laughs> no, I didn't. I knew it. What's the real story? Well, I guess there's no harm in telling you. My brother and I struck up a party the other night. Made a getaway in that boat, hit the reef, and sunk. Where is your brother? I don't know. When the boat went down, we both did the best we could, but I'm sure he made it. Bill's tough. He's real tough. Mm. Police must be looking for you for that robbery, huh? Sure. But they ain't looking for you. You're the best protection I got. That's why we're sticking together till I'm in the clear. <laughs> Sheriff, 
Hello. I'm Jim Taylor. Oh, hello there, Jim. I've been waiting for you. Sit down. Uh, thanks. I've got quite a bit to report. Oh? Been out to see this man, Douglas? Yes, but I arrived too late. What do you mean? Well, a neighbor told me that Douglas, his wife, and the man we're looking for had all put out to sea in Douglas's boat early this morning. And haven't returned yet? No. I think I got the motive for their going, too. Oh, what's that? Well, Douglas is a professional diver, and he has full equipment. I see. Now, if the jewel thief's boat did sink, which certainly seems logical... The thief enlisted the diver's aid to recover the jewels. All right. Oh, did you get a description of Douglas's boat? Yes, I've already sent out an alarm on it. Good. Oh, is anyone out at Douglas's house waiting for the boat's return? Yes, I left two deputies out there. Oh, uh, by the way... Yes? I found these pants in his cabin. Huh? They obviously belong to the thief. Let me ask you them, please. Sure, yeah. Tuxedo pants. There's a label in the waistband. Oh, yes. French and Company. They rent tuxedos. Yes, I know. Their shop is just around the corner from our office. Well, I've called them already. The store didn't answer, but I've got French's home phone number. And? Well, he was out to a movie. Wasn't expected home until midnight. Midnight, huh? Let's see. It's 10.15 now. Mm Mm-hmm. Sheriff, this could be a valuable lead. We might find out from Mr. French who the two thieves were. I think I'll drive back to town. All right, you can swing due west. Head for that light. That's Midway Lighthouse. That's right. Right at the mouth of South River. That's where we're heading. Up South River? Mm-hmm. We can't do that. Why not? The river's dangerous enough in the daytime. I'm not running up it with an old lights at night. You just do like you're told. Look, this boat's all we have. We don't want to lose it. I'll guide you up the river. This is home base for me. I know it like a book. How far up you aim to go? About 20 miles. 20? That far up is nothing but swamp. We stopped just before we hit the swamp. River City. That's my home. Why can't you get off at the mouth of the river? Because it's safer this way. I made a deal with my brother that if we got separated, we'd meet at home. I want to keep that deal. I'm not running up there without lights. Oh, yes, you are. My boat means too much to stay me. Stay at that wheel. No, I ain't going to stay at the no. If you didn't have that gun. Yeah, but I do have it. Now get back to the wheel. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Yes, Mark? Are these all the clothes that the two men left here at the store when they rented the tuxedos? Yes. Let's start going over them, huh? Right. You take that suit, I'll take this one. Okay. What about hats? They didn't wear any. Didn't wear any neckties, either. Hmm. Well, these suits are pretty well worn. Uh-huh. Well, there's nothing in the jacket pockets. No, nothing in this one, either. Oh, here's the label. It was bought at Rand Brothers here in town. Yes, so was this one. That doesn't give us much, though. Both suits must be, oh, four or five years old. Yeah. And Rand Brothers do too big a business to remember any individual customers. Any dry cleaning marks in yours? No, I don't see any. Well, let's look at the trousers. Okay. Well, Mr. French gave me a pretty good description of the men. Had he ever seen them before? No, but he said they looked enough alike to be brothers. Mm. Nothing in these pants pockets. No dry cleaning marks. I'm drawing a blank here, too. Well, there's the underwear and socks. Uh, look for laundry marks. Right. Well, Mr. French did say one thing that might be important. What's that? Both men looked and talked as if they came from back in the swamp country. I see. Ah, these things must have been home laundered. There's no laundry marks. No, I haven't got any either. Well, let's take a look at the shoe. Okay. Here you are. Thanks. Mm-hmm. This pair was bought at a shoe store in River City. So are these. Uh, hey, wait a minute. What? That pair you have, are they mates? Yeah. Are both soles worn? Yes, why? Here, take a look at these. The sole on one of them is practically new. Say, that's strange. Yes. None of the witnesses said anything about either man being crippled or that they limped. I know. Mark, I've got a hunch. Let's get to a phone. Head over there for the left bank. It's safe to go that close to shore? Look, I took you all the way up the river okay, didn't I? Mm-hmm. See that little dock? Yes. Pull alongside. 
this where you live? Yeah. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, don't see no lights on in the house. Maybe I beat Bill back here. Wrong side. Uh-huh. Well, get off. Uh-uh. Not yet. Why? I got something to tend to here first. We've done as you asked. We've brought you home. Now get off and leave us alone. Uh-uh. It ain't gonna be that easy. What do you mean? You both know too much. All we know is that we want to get away from here. Sorry, but I got to make sure you keep quiet. What are you talking about? I got to kill you. Put down that gun. There you are, Philipson. Who are you? Call the alarm, Mr. Douglas. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Come on, Philipson. Come on, get on your feet. I don't know what brought you here, mister, but I'm sure glad you come. Phillips himself was responsible for that. What do you mean? You left your clothes behind at that rental shop, Phillips. And when I examined your shoes, I saw that they'd been bought in River City. And the sole of one of them was practically new. So what? That meant that either you or your brother had trouble with one leg. So I contacted the doctors here in River City and gave them your description. One of the doctors remembered treating you for a broken ankle. He gave me your address. All right, Phillips. You're coming along with me. Charles, alias Chuck Phillips, was sentenced by a federal court to serve five years for impersonating a federal agent. At the conclusion of this term, he will then serve a 25-year sentence imposed by local authorities for robbery and assault. The two Phillips brothers thought they had committed the perfect crime. And for a while, it must have seemed to Chuck as if they had. But no crime is perfect. For somewhere in the devious machinations which produce crime, there is a clue left on some unsuspected point. Many times it is not an apparent clue. But while it is true that crime as a business has not progressed in 50 years, it is equally true that in the field of scientific investigation of crime, there has been great progress. In tonight's case, for instance, the very manner in which a shoe had been worn was the undoing of a criminal who had planned very carefully. But that small clue was turned into the criminal's capture by superior knowledge of a special agent. Superior knowledge he had received as part of his training as a member of your FBI. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Vicious Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society 
We'll bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Vicious Shakedown, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you were born between the years 1900 and 1910... Here is a question which you may have asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, since 1910, the proportion of oldsters in our population has gone way up. In fact, it has increased by 68%. So the chances are getting better all the time that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 11 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Vicious Shakedown. There is a widespread theory about criminals that they lack intelligence and courage. Now, that theory is wrong, and has been proven wrong so many times that there's no question about its being incorrect. Many criminals have IQs which show high intelligence, and if their brain power had been directed along legitimate lines, there's no telling how far their careers might have gone. But legitimate fields take effort to conquer, and if there is one truism about the average criminal... It is that he'll go to any ends to avoid honest work. The schemes he brings forth from his tortured brain are sometimes simple, sometimes involved. But always there is the same goal, getting something for nothing. Tonight's FBI file opens in a gymnasium and health club located in the business district of a large eastern city. In a small room in this establishment, a muscular rubber is giving a young man a massage. Too heavy, Mr. Hanford? Oh, it feels good, Tom. Up around the back of my neck a little, huh? Sure. Ah, swell. Big night last night, Mr. Hanford? Murderous. Now, take it easy around the head. Thanks. Common complaint today. Everybody's got hangovers. We all out together? Well, to tell you the truth, Tom, I don't know where I was. Huh? This is a new thing with me now. I have so many drinks and then I draw a blank. Hey, that's bad. I know, but it's all behind me, Tom. I'm on the wagon as of today. That won't do you no know, harm. When are you getting married, Mr. Hanford? Two weeks. Hey, that's swell. Yeah, kind of like it myself. Well, that just about does it. My time's up. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I feel fine. Now, you just relax there a while, Mr. Hanford. All right. You should fall asleep. Uh, when would you like me to call you? In an hour. Take it easy. Okay, Tom. <clears throat> Who's that? Hello, Mr. Hanford. Hmm? Who are you? My name is Bell. Frankie Bell. What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. What about? Personal matter. Mind if I sit down? Oh, look, I'm trying to get a little sleep. That can wait. Huh? Say, what's this all about? I'm a friend of Marie's. Who's Marie? Are you kidding? Look, I'm asking you a question. I suppose you don't remember last night, either. No, I don't. And I've had a... Enough... Hold it, mister. Last night, you and Marie got married. What? You heard me. Is this a rip or something? 
Think so? Take a look at this. Hmm? Marriage license. Is that your signature? What? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll also find your name on the register at the Central Hotel. You and Marie spent your honeymoon there. Oh, no. No, none of this could have happened. Well, I don't know anybody named Marie. You just met her last night. It was a real quick romance. But look, I'm already engaged. I'm getting married in two weeks. Mister, you're already married. I don't believe you. Okay. Suppose you check up on this marriage license. Take it. It's a photostat copy. Marie has the original. You can also check the register of the Central Hotel. Then you'll hear from me later. Some more coffee, Paul? No, thanks, Mother. No, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is for us to be having breakfast together. You mean novelty, don't you? Well, yes. Anyway, I'm grateful. You know something? So am I. <laughs> oh, um, Mother. Yes? Did you hear me come home night before last? Night before last? Yeah. Why, Paul, you didn't come home at all. Oh. I thought you stayed at the club. Oh, of course. Uh, that's right, I, I did. Mm, why do you ask? Nothing important. Oh, goodness, I almost forgot. What? This special delivery letter came for you early this morning. Here you are, dear. Thanks, Mother. I didn't know if it were important enough to wake up. Oh, quiet, but... please. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Is something wrong? No. But, darling, there Excuse must Excuse me, be... Mother. I'll, I'll see you later. Several hours later in the local FBI field office, Paul Hanford's mother is being greeted by Special Agent Jim Taylor. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Hanford? Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Now, what can I do for you? Well, this is a matter concerning my son. Yes? He doesn't know I've come here to see you, but I... I just had to. Well, what is it, Mrs. Hanford? Paul received a special delivery letter this morning. When he read it, I could see that it upset him very much. Yes? I tried to question him about it, and he left the breakfast table and walked out. I see. In his excitement, he left the letter behind. I did something, Mr. Taylor, that... I've never done in my life before. I I read his letter. Well? It was sent anonymously. It demanded that he pay $50,000 to straighten out some matter. Mm. It also said that if he didn't pay, his impending marriage would be ruined and he would suffer bodily harm. Did you bring that letter with you, Mrs. Hanford? Yes, I have it right here. I see it, please. Here you are. Thank you. Has anyone else handled it other than you and your son? No. Fine. I want to have it analyzed for fingerprints. Mr. Taylor, as I told you, my son doesn't know I've come here. You did the right thing in coming. This is an extortion letter. Now, whether the basis for the threat is real or imagined, the sender has broken the law. It's our job to find him. I'd like to go over and talk to your son at once. sleeping? Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe I was. I don't know how you do it. Uh, what do you mean? Sleep at a time like this. What are you talking about? Waiting for that guy Hanford to call. I swear to you, all afternoon I've been so nervous I've broken two fingernails. Oh, Marie, just relax. Oh, I can't. It'll all come out okay. What makes you so sure? I spent two months laying this thing out. Nothing can go wrong any place along the line. And he'll think he really married me? The license is legitimate, ain't it? Yeah, but you married me with that license, not him. I worked ten hours a day practicing his signature. You'll think he signed it. Same thing with the hotel register. And you honestly think he drew a blank that night? Maybe that Mickey I fed him took care of that. Well, I still can't believe he'll call. He's got to call. Look at the spot he's in. With his girl, you mean? That's right. She's a big catch for him. He can't afford to strike out there. Frankie. Hmm? Maybe he never got your letter this morning. Oh, look, will you stop putting a whammy on this? That could happen. Marie, the post office people have been around quite a long time. They're real dependable guys to do business with. Did you give my number in the letter? No, stupid. I called that health club. Left a message for him to call here. Oh. Say, I just thought of something. What now? With us being already married, and then getting married again the other night, 
Does that make us bigamous? Nope. Just me. Why? Because you've got two heads. Oh, that's cute. Oh, gee, do you think... Shut up. Hello? Uh, Mr. Hanford calling you, Mr. Bell. Put him on. Right. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Hanford. Are you the man that came to the health club? That's right. Well, I received your letter this morning. Well? I'd like to see you. Come around here. What's your address? Garden Apartments. 82 Maple. What time? Six o'clock. Very well. See you later, Mr. Hanford. Well, honey, what'd I tell you? Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. After you, please. Very well. Uh, let me take your hat. Surely. Here. Is that you, Mother? Yes, Paul. Your son? Yes. Uh, come this way, please. Thank you. I'm here in the living room, Mother. Paul, I brought home company. Oh, really? Darling, I want you to meet Mr. Taylor. This is my son, Paul. How do you do? Hello. Paul, Mr. Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. Oh? I asked him to come here because... Well, because I read that letter you received this morning. Oh, I had to, Paul. I, I saw how it upset you. <laughs> Mother, you don't have to make a Supreme Court case out of it. There's nothing too terrible about reading a letter. Mr. Hanford, have you any idea who sent it to you? Yes, I have. Really, Paul? It was that clown, Chuck Davis. You know, that boy I play squash with? But, but why should he... Mother, the whole thing was a practical joke. What? How do you know? Well, Chuck's a practical joker. I suspected him immediately. I confronted him with the letter today, and he confessed all. Oh, thank heaven. So, I'm afraid, Mr. Taylor, you're on a wild goose chase. Oh, goodness, that's so. I do apologize, Mr. Taylor. Oh, that isn't necessary... I'm delighted that it turned out the way it has. Most extortion cases haven't this happy an ending. You handle many of them, do you? Well, enough to have worked up a very strong loathing for all those who send threatening letters. How many do you catch? Well, I don't want to sound immodest, but we bat pretty close to a thousand. I see. Well, I guess I'd better be running along. <laughs> Frankie, that must be him. Could be. Who is it? Paul Hanford. Okay. Hi, Mr. Hanford. Hello. Come on in. Very well. Paul! Huh? Paul, baby! Who is she? That's Marie, your wife. Oh. Honey, don't you remember me? No. Well, that certainly isn't Marie, that... uh... Mr. Hanford came here to talk business. Let's give him a chance. Okay. Now, first, Mr. Hanford, did you check on the marriage license in the hotel? Yes. And? It could be my signature when I've been drinking. I've told you right along. We're wasting time. I can see that I probably got drunk and married this girl. And you've apparently set a price for her calling the marriage off. Let's get right down to that. Right, it's a pleasure to do business with you. How much? You got my letter? 50 G's. Well, that's out of the question. Well, what's your idea of a payoff? Well, I have it right here with me. Two thousand dollars. Two thousand? Why, you Quiet. Think... Look, Mr. Hanford. Two thousand don't even get you inside the ground. But that's all I can raise. Don't give me that. I'm telling you the truth. Look, your mother's got scratch. Your girlfriend is loaded. Well, that has nothing to do with me. Well, and the best I can do for you is knock ten percent off the cash. The best you can do? That's right. Well, how do you figure so strongly in this? I'm an old friend of the family. Oh. Well, then I'd advise you to take this 2000 Don't you do it, Frankie. Don't worry, sweetheart. I won't. Very well. You leave only one course of action open. What's that? I'm going to the FBI. What? On what ground? That was an extortion letter I received today. They'd be very happy to prosecute you for sending it. Is that a fact? Yes. Now, will you take the 2000 No. All right, then. I'm going to turn you in. You're not going to... Oh, Frankie, I'm glad you hit him. What a piker. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file 
which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Mr. Cross, that's just a beautiful dream. By the way, taxes and living costs have gone up. I don't save a cent. So when you talk about independence when I grow older, I say, what am I going to use for money? Well, the plan I'd like to tell you about was designed to order for men in your financial position. Men who haven't got money to burn, but who do look forward to complete independence in their 60s. It's called the Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s Plan. Sounds interesting. Let's hear more about it. The Independent 60s Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and a practical method of reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, doing the things you want to do. Say, this is right up my alley. I think I'll look into this plan. Then get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Vicious Shakedown. People have gotten to understand almost everything in the world, except other people. It would seem on the face of it that anyone with normal intelligence would realize that you cannot do business with a criminal. Yet year after year, honest citizens continue to become involved with lawbreakers. Now, there's a basic truth which every citizen should memorize. Memorize because it would save him untold agony. And that truth is that if you deal with criminals... You must get hurt. Tonight's file continues in Special Agent Jim Taylor's apartment. It is after midnight. He's just preparing for bed as... Hello. Hello, Mr. Taylor? Yes. Uh, This is Mrs. Hanford. Oh, yes, Mrs. Hanford. I'm terribly sorry to disturb you. It's all right. I called your office and they gave me your home number. What's on your mind? I'm calling about Paul. Yes? Terrence is worried about him. He left here right after you did this afternoon. He was presumably going to drop off at the health club for a minute. Then he had a dinner date with Christine, his fiancée. Yes, go on. After that, he was taking us both to a concert. He hasn't kept ever any of these appointments. And you haven't heard from him? Not directly, but I called our lawyer. I learned that Paul had gone to see him this afternoon right after he left the house. He asked for $2,000 said he needed it desperately. I see. Did he get the money? Yes. Well, Mrs. Sanford, I'll come right over to your house. Come right into the living room, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. I, I'm very grateful to you for coming over. It's my job, Mrs. Hanford. Well, not to cater to a nervous woman's fears. Well, I'm sorry to say that it looks like your fears are justified. About the extortion note? That's right. Your son's getting that 2000 from your lawyer certainly makes it appear that he wanted it for a payoff. But he told us this afternoon that the note was a practical joke. Yes, I know. That was just to alleviate our suspicion, I imagine. Where can he be now? That's the important thing. We've no idea where he's gone. Yes, I know. Or did he mention anything to your lawyer as to where he might be going? No, he just said he was going to his club, the health club. Mm-hmm. Have you called there? Yes. What did they tell you? That he'd called in earlier in the afternoon. What for? To see if he'd gotten any messages. And had he? I I didn't ask. That could be very important, Mrs. Hanford. Why? He could have been contacting the club because he expected a message there. Oh, I see. Will you let me have the number, please? I'll phone them at once. Oh, I... 
Frankie. He's coming, too. Yeah. Should I get him some ice or something? What for? That lump on his head. Leave him alone. He may grow a few more before we're done. Oh, my, my head. It hurts, huh? Yeah. It feels as if... No. It's you. That's right. I'm still here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me... Let me get up. Should you, Frankie? Yeah, he can sit in that chair. But look, mister, don't try anything because something new has been added since you left us. This gun. I see it. Well, you think you're ready to talk business again now? There's nothing to discuss. Oh, yes, there is. We had a board of directors meeting. We decided to cut the price. To... to 2000 No. 25000 Not interested. We decided something else in that meeting. Really? Mm-hmm. Strategy. How to make you pay the 25 Gs. That's not possible. Not even if we called the newspapers, gave them the story on your marriage to Marie? They wouldn't listen to a cheap hoodlum like you. Now you're forgetting I got proof. But that would take too much time. I got an even better way. That's to call your girlfriend, Christine. I'm not listening to any of these shakedowns. Do you know something, Frankie? I bet he don't think you'd have nerve enough to call her. You think I should show him? Yeah. Give me that address book. Sure. Here. Hey, that's my address book. Yeah, yeah, I know. I borrowed it when you passed out. Let's see. Uh... Yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, the number is Main 72932. 2932. That's right. Get her on the phone. Okay. Uh, wait. Huh? Never mind. Call her, baby. Hello? Oh, there's never anybody on that switchboard. Yes? Hello, this is Mrs. Bell. I... Marie. Oh, oh. Yes, Mrs. Bell. Mrs. Bell. Do you still think you should make that call? Hang up, stupid. Frankie, Shut I up. didn't... Start packing. Leaving town, folks? Yes, on your two Gs. But before we go, I'm making sure you keep quiet. <laughs> This is the apartment right here, Mr. Taylor. We got a key? Yes, sir, but like I told you, the Bells left here five minutes ago. They had bags with them like they were going away. I'd still like to see the apartment, please. Good thing. Uh, this should do it. Did the Bells say where they were going? No, sir. Do you know if they took a cab? But they didn't say there aren't many this hour in the morning. Here we are. Go ahead, sir. Hi. This furniture belongs to the house. They rented the place this way. I see. Yeah, what's that? I don't know. Sounds like it's coming from behind that door. It's a closet. Someone in there. He's locked in. Yeah, I got a key that should fit that. Good. This guy in here could be the one you're looking for. Mm, Mr. Hanford. There. Hey, found a gag. Yes. Untie that gag, will you? I'll get these ropes. Sure thing. See the missing guy? Yes. There you go, mister. No. Thank you. I'll have your legs untied in a minute, Hanford. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. Where are the bells? Gone. Where to? I was hoping you'd have the answer to that one. Yeah, that does it. Oh, swell. Oh, Hanford. Yeah? Your practical joke didn't turn out so well, did it? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor. Whatever your problem was, you were a fool to attempt to handle it yourself. I know that now. Did you pay these people any money? They forcibly took 2000 from me. Get away money. I imagine so. I guess I can kiss it goodbye. I don't imagine they'll be easy to find. Is something that might help. What is it? Let me get to a phone. Frankie! Frankie, what are you doing? Putting the bags in the trunk compartment. What for? They will have them, stupid. Yeah, but if the car won't start, you only have to take them out again. The car will start as soon as we get that wire connected. When will that be? Marie, you heard the man yourself. He said he was going up to the front of the garage to get a new wire and be right back. But he hasn't come back. Uh, Look, Frankie, my complaint is we've kept the car in this garage for over two years. We certainly deserve better service than this. Oh, shut up. Hey, hey I, I hear someone coming now. Uh, well, it's about time that you got here with that... Frankie! What is it? Come here. Huh? It's Mr. Hanford. Hello there, Frankie. How'd you get here? Mr. Taylor, I'll let you explain that. If 
Found a bill from this garage in your apartment, Frankie. I called here just before you arrived. The attendant was kind enough to stall you until we could get here. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Frank Bell and his wife, Marie, were both tried and convicted for extortion. They were sentenced to long terms in a federal penitentiary. And so the careers of two more shakedown artists were ended by your FBI. But ended only after the potential victim had placed himself in great jeopardy by attempting to deal with the criminals himself. You wouldn't ask a plumber to pull a tooth for you, nor would you ask a dentist to fix a leaky pipe. And yet you will, you do, ask yourself to perform a job of dealing with criminals when there is at your disposal every type of law enforcement agency you need. Remember this, and do your part in curbing the crime wave. When you receive any kind of threat, notify your local police or your state law enforcement officers or your FBI. Crime is their business. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Tonight, instead of the customary closing commercial... I should like to read to you a telegram I have just received from Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Mr. Parkinson has wired me, and I quote, Today in America, many life insurance men have the right to add to their signature the letters CLU. Those three letters, CLU, stand for Chartered Life Underwriter. They designate a man who has taken advanced courses in the scientific adaptation of life insurance to the needs of American policyholders. Tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of the founding of the American College of Life Underwriters, which awards those CLU degrees. Therefore, Milton, in my name, will you call the attention of our vast listening audience to the fine service performed by the American College of Life Underwriters during its first two decades and wish this distinguished institution... Continued success during the years ahead. Signed, Thomas I. Parkinson, President, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Hand-Packed Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpecked Thief on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
Tonight, while you're listening to this program, your telephone may ring. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Uh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my Equitable representative told me about a special life insurance plan for men on the way up. Believe me, that's a great idea. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Thief. Crime as a business is in the midst of a great boom at the moment, with more than 5,000 major crimes being committed in the United States every day. But do not labor under the delusion that those are 5,000 successful crimes. The prison population of the country is larger today than it has ever been, and it continues to grow. Even those engaged in a life of crime who have not yet been caught do not live the life of ease that popular fiction would have you believe. For the criminal, in choosing his career of crime, has automatically sacrificed many of the comforts which you law-abiding citizens take for granted. The night file opens in a small apartment located in the residential section of San Francisco. One of the occupants of the flat, Phyllis West, is just answering the front door. Hello, Phyllis. Oh, hello, Mom. Come on in. Thanks. I was doing some shopping in the neighborhood. I said I'd drop by and see you. Gee, I'm glad you did. Where's that husband of yours? Wait. Well, he's here. Where? He's in the bedroom. Still sleeping? Well, yes. Phyllis, do you know what time it is? Right, it's two right. o'clock in the afternoon, and he's still pounding the pillow. Well, he, he didn't get home until very late. Was he working? No. Any sign of him getting a job? He told me he'd got some things lined up. Oh, he's been handing you that for a month. Phyllis, I'm going to have a talk with him. After all, you're my daughter, and I won't hey, stand Phyllis, by... have you seen my... Uh... Oh, hello, Mrs. Bartow. Good morning. Phyllis, have you seen that new striped tie? Yes, it's in the hall closet. I'll get it. Just a minute. Let him get it himself. Huh? She's not doing any more waiting on you. What is it? Sit down. What's Sit the... down, I said. Okay. Now, I want to have a talk with you. Please, Mother. You keep out of this. Young man, when my daughter married you, it was against my better judgment. But I agreed to the match because she believed you had a very bright future. Well, you've been married three years now, and what's happened? Well, I've been doing things, Mrs. Bartow. You've barely made enough to live on. Well, I just haven't got the brain. Oh, stop. Sixteen-year-old kids are stealing better than you are. No, that ain't so. Look at the papers. Every day they say crime waves are getting bigger and bigger. That's just publicity. Well, whatever it is, you're not cashing in on it. Oh, lay off, will you? Why, when my husband was alive, he stole better in depression years than you could with a boom on. All right, I've heard enough of this. Hal, where are you going? I'm getting out of here. I haven't finished with you, young man. Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> Bartender. Hey, bartender. Hello, Al. Huh? Oh, hello, Duke. Sit down. Thanks. Hey, where's that bartender? He's busy, loading in some ice. I need some whiskey, Duke. You seem to be doing okay now, Al. Oh, I'm just getting started, boy. What are you celebrating? This ain't a celebration. It's a wake. What's wrong? Everything. <laughs> Can't be that bad. Duke, I, I've just been thinking about something. Want to hear it? Sure, why not? Years ago, way, way back when I was a kid, I lived with my uncle. That's on account of my mother and father were dead. Uh-huh. 
Well, my uncle was a nice enough guy, strictly a nine-to-five character, you know, legit. Yeah. I guess I'd still be with him if it wasn't for one thing. What's that? He had a stupid wife and a mean mother-in-law. I figured, well, there you are. That's what happens to legit. So I ran away and became a thief. I see. Figured I'd, I'd get action, you know, high living, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been a thief for over ten years, and what have I got to show for it, huh? Stupid wife, mean mother-in-law. <laughs> you do need a drink. <laughs> That's why I'll buy you one as soon as the bartender gets back. Look, Duke... <laughs> Duke, do you happen to know my mother-in-law? Oh, yes. What a nagger. I remember her when her husband was alive. She is a forceful woman. All the time she's at me to do something big. Got to have me to be a star or something. Gee, I, I, I make out all right, Duke. I crack as good a safe as any guy in the business. <laughs> Just haven't got the brakes, that's all. Well, I'm glad I ran into you. Why? You may be just the man I'm looking for. What do you mean? I've got a job lined up. It's a real big job. One that would actually make your mother-in-law proud of you. No kidding, Duke. Mm-hmm. What's the setup? Yeah, well, let's get a drink at the bar. Then we'll go someplace private and talk. Two days later, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor is just completing a phone conversation. Sheriff, I guess I have all the details now. Yes, I'll be up there in half an hour. Right. Bye. Morning, Jim. Oh, morning, Elliot. If you're not busy, we could go over that Wilton file. Well, not right now, Elliot. I've got to run upstate. What for? Well, Sheriff up in Canton just called. They had a bank robbery up there last night. Really? What's the story? The thieves gained entry through a skylight on the roof. Uh Uh-huh. They cut the alarm wires, then blew the vault. How much did they get? Let's see, um, $18,640. Whoa. Any leads, Jim? Well, Sheriff said there were a few clues, but the bandits themselves made a clean getaway. Oh. I'm going up there now. Uh, can I do anything for you here at this end? Nothing that I know of now. I'll be in touch with you later. Just a minute. Oh, hello, Mom. Gee, I'm glad you're here. As soon as I got your message, I ran right over. Well, what's wrong? It's Al. Well? I'm worried about him. What did he do now? He didn't come home all night. Oh, is that all? Mother, he's never done this before. I hope he makes it a habit, permanently. Mother, you shouldn't say those things. I love Al. I know. Have you tried to locate him? How? Call saloons, pool rooms, bookmakers. Oh, he wouldn't be at any of those places. How do you know? He wasn't when he called. When did he call? Last night, about midnight. Said he was going to do a real big job. One that we'd both be very proud of. That eliminates pool rooms and bookmakers. Huh? Just call the saloons. He must be drinking. Oh, he was very serious. Look, I've heard his routines before. This time, he's not getting away with it. I'm waiting here until he gets home. Jim. Oh, hello, Elias. When would you get back? Just a few minutes ago. How'd you make out up there? Well, I didn't come up with anything definite on the identity of the bank robbers, but I did get a couple of fairly good leads. What are they? It appears that two men did the job. How'd you arrive at that? Well, as you know, the bank was entered through a skylight on the roof. Yes? They used a ladder to get onto the roof. It was still propped against the rear wall of the bank. Oh? Ground was pretty soggy back there, and at the base of the ladder, there were two distinct sets of footprints. Did you take an impression of them? Yes. Cast it there on my desk. Oh, yes. I also measured the strides. The laboratory should be able to give us the approximate weight and height of the men. What else did you get? Well, apparently only one of the men climbed the ladder. There was only one set of muddy footprints on the roof. The other man acted as a lookout? Evidently. This first man broke the skylight glass to gain entry. Oh, I found this piece of material that could have been torn from his coat. It was caught on the broken glass. Any fingerprints, Jim? Yes, I picked up several distinct prints in the skylight. They're in that envelope there. What'd you get inside the bank? Well, the cracksman muffled the safe before he blew it open, but that won't do much help to us. Why not? He used army blankets, and they're on sale now to the general public, so they'd be pretty difficult to trace. Well, Jim, it looks as if you've got everything but the bandits themselves. I'm hoping the laboratory will fill that in for us. (laughs) 
Phyllis. What? Will you stop that crying? I, I can't help it. Look, nothing's happened to him. He'll be home. No, he won't, Mommy. I'm sure of it now. Al's left oh, me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I know he has. He just got fed up with you picking on him the way you do. Now, just a minute, Phyllis. You've been very the... mean to him, Mommy. He's a very sensitive fellow. Look, for the last time, I'm Al, to... is that you? Yeah, honey. There, you see? What did I tell you? Oh, Al, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. Well, what's the matter, baby? I've been worried to death about you. Now look, I told you I was going out on a job. Now, let's have the real story. What do you mean? Where you've really been. I took a bank last night. <sighs> you what? Done a bank job, knocked off 18000 Oh, I don't believe it. No? Take a look. This morning's paper right here, front page. Let me see Baby, right here, you see? What? Daring upstate bank robbery. Uh -huh. Let me look. First National Bank of Canton was robbed last night of over $18,000. Daring bandits gain entry through Skylight. Daring bandits, that's it. Oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, <clears throat> what have you got to say, Mrs. Bartow? I'm stunned. That should sort of make you change your mind about me now, huh? <sighs> Of course, doesn't it, Mommy? Well, uh... You were all the time at me to do something big. Is that big enough for you? Yes, I guess it is. Okay. <laughs> Baby, I'm hungry. Oh, you must be. Well, how about fixing me some food? I'd like a little attention around here. Mrs. Bartow. Yes, uh... Get out in the kitchen. Give your daughter a hand. Oh, uh, yes, of course I'm... Hey, wait a minute. Well? You say you got $18,000 for the job. That's right. Where is it? I'm getting it tomorrow. Your what? Well, the guy I'd done the job with took it back to his hotel. See, some of it was in securities. He's taken them to a fence. I don't believe it. I'll call his hotel and prove it. Hello? Did you get me to Central Hotel? Who is this guy you've done the job with? Uh, Duke Shelton. Duke Shelton? Yeah, that's right. Duke Shelton. Oh, you stupid... You let him take all the money? Yeah, why? He's the biggest double-crosser in the business. Oh, you're crazy. Duke, Duke Shelton is off. Of Hello. all the people. Hello, Duke Mr. Shelton. Shelton. Mother, how do you know about this, Mr. Shelton? He pulled the same deal on your father years ago. Hello? Huh? Are you sure? Al, what is it? You checked out. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file will be reopened in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women who are on the way up. The people who are going to open their doors to good news like this, too. Hey, Mary, I got a raise, a big one. We're going places. If you're that kind of person, bound and determined to get ahead, then be sure to investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now. You mean that the Equitable Society takes my chances of future success into consideration? It certainly does. The Equitable Society's plan for men on the way up has these three advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money... You can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times, can expand or contract as you see fit. Well, that sounds like a smart plan to me. Where do I find out about it? There's nothing easier. Ask your Equitable Society representative for full information on the equitable plan for men and women on the way up. Phone him as soon as possible, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Henpecked Thief. many widespread misconceptions about the criminal population of the country, a population numbering close to six million people. 
Some of those misconceptions are that all criminals are stupid people who have had no educational advantages. Another is that there is a criminal type who can be recognized and is distinguishable from the honest, law-abiding citizen. And perhaps the most widespread incorrect notion is that they are loyal to each other. The bromide words it, there is honor among thieves. As can be seen from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, nothing could be further from the truth. No criminal has any loyalty to another criminal for one basic reason. His mind is incapable of understanding the rudiments of loyalty. Above the mythical coat of arms of every criminal is a motto which reads, It's every man for himself. Tonight's file continues at the San Francisco field office of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Say, Jim, hmm? any report from the laboratory on that bank robbery? Yes, I should say there is. What'd you get? Well, first of all, one of the bandits has been identified. His name is Al West. Did they get that from the fingerprints? That's right. What's his record? Two arrests for safe cracking. Oh, they were local jobs. Didn't come under our jurisdiction. Any idea where to find him? Well, police headquarters gave me an address for him. I checked and found he'd lived there until a year ago, but he moved and... That's where the trail ends. I see. We've got a trace out on him now, though. What about the second man? Well, the only identification we have on him is the one that the laboratory reconstructed. How? Oh. Well, judging by the depth of his footprint, the length of his stride, he was a big man. Six feet one or two. Weighed over 250 pounds. Uh, that doesn't suggest anyone I know of offhand. Oh, we're checking on it. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Sergeant. You did? Oh, will you let me have it, please? 920 Oak Street. Got it. Thanks a lot, Sergeant. Bye. Well, that's a break. What, Jim? That was Sergeant Myers at police headquarters. He picked up Al West on suspicion about a month ago. He was living then at 920 Oak Street. I'd better get right over there. Want me to fix you some coffee? No. A sandwich, maybe? I don't want nothing. I wish you wouldn't act this way. Oh, baby, I feel awful. I figured at last I, I'd done something big. Something even your mother would be proud of. Oh, she's really got me nailed now. She understands. I'm sure she does. Well, then why didn't she let me go over to Duke Shelton's hotel? Why did she have to go? She's handled these things before, Al. She knows better what to do. Well, I could find out where he's gone as good as she could. Well, maybe. Look, are you rooting against me, too? Oh, of course not. Well, then why do you have... Oh, is that you, Mom? Yeah. How'd you make out? Well, I have to spread a little dough around, but I finally got a line on where Shelton's gone. Who from? Guy at the transportation desk. I slipped him 20 bucks, and he told me the Duke had bought a plane ticket to Los Angeles. Oh, that's a break. Los Angeles, that's a big place. That don't tell us much. If we could find out one thing, it could tell us plenty. What's that? Is there a racetrack open down there? Yeah, sure. That's all we need to know. Why? I know Duke Shelton. Every time he's ever made a score, he's fed it right back to the horses. Well, I don't say he'll do it this time. Young man, once a horse player, always a horse player. We're flying to Los Angeles. <laughs> Oak Street Apartments. What number are you calling? Oh, you got the wrong number. Oh, excuse me. Yes? I'm looking for Mr. Al West. He's not in. When is he expected back? Mm, not for some time. He went out of town. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Hmm? They're my credentials. Oh, I see. Now, do you know where Al West has gone? Well, no, sir. He left about two hours ago. His wife and his mother-in-law were with him. Mm -hmm. They said they were going out of town indefinitely. I wonder if I could see their apartment. I have a warrant here. Oh, sure thing. Excuse me, let me get this call first. Certainly. Oak Street Apartments. Uh, just a minute. This is a call for Mrs. Bartow. Hmm? She's West's mother-in-law. Oh, we'll find out who it is. Yeah. Uh, who's calling, please? I see. Uh, hold it. The transportation desk at the Central Hotel. Let me talk to them, will you? Okay. Wait a second. Yeah. Thanks. Hello? Well, she's not in. May I take the message? 
What's your name, please? I see. I'm a special agent of the FBI. I wonder if you'd wait at the hotel for me. I want to get all the details. Well, Elliot, over here. Oh, fine. Hop in. Right. Now, what's this all about? Well, I'll try to give you the complete story on it. I went over to West's apartment. He'd left town with his wife and mother-in-law. I see. While I was there, a call came in from the transportation man at the Central Hotel. He had a message for Mrs. Bartow. That's the mother-in-law. Uh -huh. It was intriguing enough for me to go over to the hotel and question him. What'd you get? Well, the mother-in-law had been over there earlier. She'd given him money to learn where one of the guests at the hotel had gone. Who was the guest? A man named Shelton. From his description, I'm certain that was an old-time thief called Duke Shelton. Yeah, I've heard of him. And he's a big man. About six feet two, weighs around 250 pounds. The other bank robber? Appears that way. It also appears there's been a double cross of some kind. How's that? Well, the woman was pretty mad about Shelton checking out. Said she had to find him. Where had he gone? To Los Angeles. How come the transportation man called her back? Oh, he'd gotten some additional information that Shelton was going to stay at the El Cerrito Hotel in Los Angeles. Where are you going now? Back to the office to pick up Shelton's record. Then we're flying down there. of Duke Shelton? No. Did you? No. You know what he looks like, don't you? Yeah, a, a big, tall, fat man. Kind of old. That's it. Where's Al? I don't know. I thought he was... Oh, there he is over there. Where? Right there. Talking to that fellow in the check coat. A tout. Huh? He's talking to a tout, and he's still got my change from the plane tickets. Let's get over there quick. No, Mom, don't go picking We're on We're here to find Shelton, not to play horses. Hey, Al. Uh, yes, Mrs. Barton. Come here. What's meant to find him? No. Who were you talking to? A nice guy. You know him? No, but he's got something real good in the next race. Oh, you're not only stupid, you're a square. Young man, you stay with me. How'd you make out, Jim? I just spoke to the desk clerk. Yes? He said that Shelton came here to the El Cerrito about 1 o'clock, but he didn't like the room they showed him, so he decided not to check in. What about West? Did he show up? No. No, but I didn't expect he would. All he and his family knew about Shelton was that he'd come to Los Angeles. They didn't get the information that he was on his way to this hotel. Did the clerk have any idea where Shelton went? Yes, he hired a car to go to the racetrack. Let's see. It's after 4 o'clock now. Mm -hmm. We could just about make it before the last race. Yes. It'll be like looking for a needle in a haystack, but let's go. Well, Elliot. Hmm? Elliot, I just went to the $100 ticket seller and showed him Duke Shelton's picture. Did he recognize him? Yes, he's been betting with him all day. How about this race? He bet uh, number seven. That's a horse called Best Girl. It's just about post time. Yeah, I know. And this is the last race. Won't have much chance to look for him. The only break we can get is if Best Girl wins and Shelton goes back to the payoff window. They're off! Come on, Best Girl. Coming into the stretch, it's Best Girl on top by two. Right front to second by one. With Tim the line and Parson neck and neck for third. Then we come to Windy Hill. Two legs behind Happy Dance and the last horse in London Town. Oh, some racing. I'm not interested. Oh, come on, Timberline. Hey, what are you rooting for? Get up there, Timberline. Did you bet on come him? Come on, Timberline. 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 Oh, how do you like that? Best girl wins. I asked you, did you bet on that Timberline? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to murder that bum in the jet coat. That was my money. Oh, shut up. What? I, I mean... Mother, I think I found him. Huh? That man over there going into the stands. Is that him? Yeah. You sure that's Shelton? Come on. Oh, I got to hand it to you, Mrs. Bartow. You had the right idea. I knew he'd come here. Hey, look. Look, he's going to the $100 cashier window. 
He's had a winner. He must still have the dough. Yes, let's nail him right now. Okay. Oh, hello there, Duke. Huh? Duke, you remember my mother-in-law. What are you doing here? I've come to collect. I've come to collect too, Shelton. Huh? Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. Mother, you're getting out of here. Here we are, all of you. Hey, what is this? Well, finding you here too, West, I'd say we've hit the daily double. Duke Shelton received a 15-year sentence, and Al West five years for their robbery of the Canton Bank. Thus, your FBI was able to close another file and write the word convicted upon the face of it. The fact that these criminals were caught is not the important thing to you unless you happen to own a bank. But the thing that is important to you is the manner in which they were caught. The manner in which your FBI pursued to the logical conclusion every clue until they came to the telephone message from the porter at the hotel. For it is that devotion to detail that makes your FBI the organization it is. The organization that acts to protect you, the American people, against the army of six million criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your Equitable Man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book under Equitable Society or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Used Baby Racket. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Used Baby Racket, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In a few minutes, someone may telephone your home to ask you a question. 
No, it won't be the FBI, but it may happen like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, uh, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. My good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Uh, just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. That's a great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Used Baby Racket. When a great tragedy occurs somewhere in the world and a thousand people are killed, we read about it and we're sorry. But actually, we do not understand what we're reading because it's impossible for the human mind to picture a thousand people being killed at one time. But if we hear about one man being burned to death in a fire, we cringe, not because we think it's a greater tragedy than the death of a thousand people, but because we can put ourselves in the man's place and really understand that one single death. Now, for that reason, it may not strike you as horrible that in 1946 in these United States, there were more than a million six hundred thousand major crimes committed. None of us can realize what that number of crimes represents. But perhaps you can grasp the current crime wave statistics better when you hear that there was a job done by a criminal in the United States last year every 18 and a half seconds. In other words, since you first heard my voice, there have been three major crimes committed. Tonight's file opens in a sloppy two-room apartment on New York's east side. It is early afternoon, and Nora Beekman has just finished listening to some records on her brand new phonograph. As the doorbell rings. All right, I'm coming. Oh, you. Hi, Harry. Hello, Nora. How's Mom? Okay, just about rid of her cold. That's good. See, what are you doing here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? You working for Joe anymore? Oh, the cops slough all the bookmakers in town. You're out of a job again, huh? I'll find something. I hope so. I uh, hear I brought your mail up. Oh, is that for me? Yeah. It's a package from Tommy. Maybe it's some jewelry. I understand all the soldiers in Germany send home lots of jewelry. Oh. What is it? How do you like that? Everybody else gets jewelry. My jerky husband sends me a record. Well, let's hear it. Uh, Maybe it's a secret message. Hello? Hello, darling. I'm in the Red Cross Clubhouse in Berlin. That's your master's voice. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm very much in love with you. But that's old news, huh? I said it so often you must be getting a little tired of hearing it. But you better get used to it, honey. Because you'll be hearing me say I love you for the rest of your life. I got some other news for you besides that, though. I'm coming home to you and the baby. Huh? Isn't that great news? Won't oh, we... that's great. He's coming home. Well, what's wrong with that, Nora? Nothing. Nothing at all, except he's coming home to me and the baby. So? So do you see a baby anyplace around here? Hey, you're right. Where is Sonny? I met a woman in the park one day a couple of weeks ago. I thought Sonny looked so cute in the carriage. Yeah. She told me she couldn't have a baby herself, and she was trying to adopt well, one. a lot of rich people do that. Well, they told her that she'd have to wait a year before she could adopt a baby. What's this got to do with Sonny? I sold him to her. You what? I sold her the baby for $1,000. Oh. Well, I don't care about that. 
Now I gotta have a baby to show Tommy when he gets here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, you're a big genius. What do I do now? I don't know. Get out the way you got in. I can't. I gotta have a baby. Hey. Might work. What might work? I got an idea. Is this the residence of Mrs. Martin Schuyler? That's right. Are you Mrs. Schuyler? Yes, I am. Well, Mrs. Schuyler, I'm from the FBI. Yes, the FBI? Well, what do you want here? May I come in, Mrs. Schuyler? Oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Please do. Oh, thanks. Uh, sit down anywhere, Mr. Uh... Uh, Hanover is my name, Mrs. Schuyler. Why are you here, Mr. Hanover? I'll get right to the point. Mrs. Schuyler, you bought a baby three weeks ago. Well, how did you... I don't understand how that concerns you, Mr. Hanover. Unfortunately for you, it does concern the FBI. Oh. That baby was kidnapped. Kidnapped? But I bought yes, it Yes, from... I know what you're going to say. You bought it from the baby's mother. Yes, that's right. But she wasn't the child's mother. Well, she was the baby's nurse. Her nurse? That's right, Mrs. Schuyler. The girl confessed everything. That's how we got your name and address. Now, there are two things that you can do. What are they? You can give me the child, and I'll return it to the parents, and no one will ever know a thing about it. I see. Or you can have the girl put in jail by fighting the case. In that event, of course, there would be a lot of publicity. Oh, no, no, no. I I don't want any publicity in this matter. But I think you're being very smart, Mr. Skyman. This way, no one will ever know that this whole thing happened. Yes, it's much better that way. I'll get the baby for you now. Yes, if you will. Uh, incidentally... What happens to my thousand dollars? Afraid there's no way of recovering that, Mrs. Schuyler. Nurse spent that money immediately after getting it. I see. And now may I please have the child? It's getting late for the baby to be up, and I promise I'd see to it that it slept in its own bed tonight. Yes, of course. Well, come along. The baby's room is down the hall. <laughs> Nora, 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 will you take this kid? Oh, you got him back. That's wonderful, Harry. Yes, honey. Come to mama. Uh, well, now you're all set. Gee, thanks, Harry. Am I a real genius now? Or? I'll say you are. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that in a million years. Now, just let me handle all your business, Nora. You got it. This dame was a real pushover for the story. Well, anybody would be. It's a real good story. I bought one of those wallets like Cary Grant used in that picture with Ingrid Bergman. Mm -hmm. Well, all I did was flash it, say I was with the FBI, stick it back in my pocket again. Quiet! I almost had to laugh. It was so easy. Now do you see why I got rid of the kid? This goes on all day, sometimes all night. I was going crazy. Wait till I get him this box. Yeah, kids do take a lot of attention. I rest a couple of minutes. I won't have an hour's quiet now that he's back home. You wanted him back. Don't blame me. I'm not blaming you, Harry. I've just gotten to hate all that noise. Having to stay home every night, changing his diet, making his formula. When's uh, Tommy coming back, Nora? Oh, I played the rest of the record while you were gone. He just said soon, no date. Well, uh, how'd you like to get another thousand for Sonny? How can I? I just told you. Tommy's coming home. Besides, I just met that Mrs. Schuyler by accident. What do you want me to do? Put a sign on the baby carriage saying this baby is for sale, $1,000? Oh, hold it for a second. A friend of mine, this old man's a janitor in one of those orphan places. What about it? Think he'd want to buy something? No, 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 no. But the orphan place is getting letters all the time from people just looking for kids to adopt. So? So we have the old geezer steal some of the letters. That'll be our sucker list. That sounds like a wonderful idea. Okay. I'll get in touch with the guy tomorrow. Then we start peddling the kid again. Meanwhile, in the New York office of the FBI, Special Agent Charles Watkins is seated beside the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor. Taylor has just finished a phone conversation. Thank you. Goodbye. 
Hey, you're on that phone a long time, Jim. Sounded like a complaint. It was a complaint. That was a Mr. Martin Schuyler, and he was protesting about an agent who came to his house while he was out of town on a business trip. Oh? Who was the agent? He was obviously an imposter. Well, what's the story? Well, it seems that about a month ago, Mrs. Schuyler met some woman in Central Park and bought her baby. She what? Yes. Pretty shocking that some people are so anxious to adopt a child and so impatient that they, well, they go into the black market for a baby. How low can a human being get? Pretty low, judging from this. Well, what was this so-called agent's game? It was pretty clever. He told Mrs. Schuyler that the baby had been kidnapped and that the FBI would return the baby to its real home without any publicity. Which suited Mrs. Schuyler fine, I suppose. Oh, naturally. Oh, well, she was sorry about having to give up the child, but according to Mr. Schuyler, she was happy that there wouldn't be anything in the papers about it. You know, Jim, I should feel sorry for the Schuylers, but I really don't. No, neither do I. To a great extent, they got what was coming to them. But that doesn't catch the criminal. Exactly. And that's our job. Well, Jim, what's the first move? Well, I guess the first thing to do is go out and see the Skylar. Is there any other record you want to hear, Harry? No, I think that'll hold me for a while. Okay. Don't you just love that phonograph? Yeah, yeah, real good machine. I bought it with part of that first thousand dollars I got for Sonny. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the people you, you, you sold the kid to this time? A uh, Mr. and Mrs. Paul Buchanan. Oh, yeah. Plenty of dough, huh? Loaded. She gave me the thousand like it was a buck. She's going to keep calling the baby Sonny. Oh, that's nice. She asked me what to call him, so I told her that even though the baby's name was Thomas Beekman Jr., I always called him Sonny. Hey, you told her the kid's right name? Yeah. Why? Well, I hate to break this news to you suddenly, but you know what we're doing is frowned upon by the police. Yeah, I know. So what? So giving your right name to people you clipped is one way that they can check on oh, you. Oh, don't be silly. Last woman didn't check, did she? Neither will this one. Well, I hope not, but I think it's about time I went out and got her little meal ticket back again. But it's only been a week since I sold her. Oh. Well, who can that be? Hello? Hiya, darling. Tommy. Yeah, that's right, honey. You surprised? Sure. Where are you? At the airport. I, uh, I got a chance to fly home, and, well, I, I wanted to see you and the baby so much, I, I took it. Oh, that, that's wonderful, dear. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll be home in about 20 minutes. All right, Tommy, I'll, I'll be here. Okay. Have a big kid waiting for me, will yeah. you? Yeah. Bye, honey. Bye. That was Tommy. I'll be here in 20 minutes. Well, I guess the honeymoon is over. What do you mean? Well, we can't go on selling the kid with Tommy home. What am I going to do, Harry? Look, uh, you got much in the apartment that you really want? Well, besides the phonograph and my records, nothing. Why? Well, I was thinking. You know, the cops might be able to check back after we get the kid from the Buchanan. So? So why don't we just keep going? And if they do check back, let them check with Tommy. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message for men and women who are on the way up, for people who are confidently looking forward to the day when their friends will be patting them on the back and saying, Congratulations, Joe. I hear you just got promoted to a wonderful new job. Say, that's great news. You're going places. Do you expect that to happen to you in the next year or two? Well, the Equitable Society has designed a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. For people like you who expect to be earning more money three years from now. Mr. Cross, I have a hunch that applies to me. Let's hear more about this plan. Well, this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up has these three advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times, can expand or contract as you see fit. Well, the more I hear about this plan, the better I like it. 
How can I get the whole story? Just ask your Equitable Society representative about the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Phone him as soon as possible or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, the used baby racket. Because there are so many families in the United States who want to adopt a baby, the process of adoption often takes more than a year. And if you are one of those whose name is on a waiting list, do yourself and your prospective child a favor and wait until your name is called. Do not patronize the black market in babies. For as tonight's case in the files of your FBI proves, if you go into the black market, you are leaving yourself open to the depraved minds of criminals. In addition to that, you are trafficking in human beings, and thus... You'll make yourself a criminal. Tonight's file continues in the New York office of your FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from investigating a complaint. He finds Special Agent Watkins waiting for him. Hello, Charlie. Hi, Jim. Anybody call while I was out? No, Jim, not a thing. What's the story at the Buchanan's? They followed almost exactly the same procedure there as they did in the Schuyler case. The man posed as an FBI agent again, huh? That's right. And from the description Mrs. Buchanan gave me, it has to be the same man. How much did she pay for the baby? A standard rate, $1,000. Guess that must be the ceiling price for a human being. Mm-hmm. However, Mrs. Buchanan was at least a little smarter than the first customer. How do you figure that? When the imposter arrived and said he was from the FBI... And that he wanted to return the baby to its rightful parents, Mrs. Buchanan said that she didn't believe him. And she refused to give up the baby? Well, she said she wanted to call the FBI to check whether or not he was a legitimate agent. What happened then? He slugged her, then locked her in a closet. Mm Mm-hmm. And when she came to, the baby was gone. That's it. But we have more to work on this time than we did after Mrs. Schuyler was swindled. Oh, in what way? Well, for one thing, Mrs. Buchanan found out the right name of the child. How did she do that? Well, the woman who sold the baby told her, quite by accident, that the child's name was Thomas Beekman, Jr. There must be plenty of Beekmans in New York, if that's the right name. We've got another clue that should isolate the area where they live. Well, let's have it. Well, Mr. Buchanan remembered that the woman told her that one of the reasons she was glad to sell the baby is that now it would be able to get some sleep. She said the elevated trains kept the baby awake. Hey, there's only one elevated train still running in New York. Mm, That's what I meant when I said the area was isolated for it. I think I'll ask the telephone company to check and see if they've got any Thomas Beekman listed on 3rd Avenue. Good. While you're doing that, I'll get in touch with the milk company, see if they're delivering any milk to a Mrs. Thomas Beekman. I'll check back here with you in half an hour. Okay, Charlie, let's go to work. Is your name Thomas Beekman? Yeah, that's right. Who are you? I'm from the FBI, Mr. Beekman. Here are my credentials. From the FBI? And something has happened to my wife and baby. Where are they? Uh, Calm down, Mr. Beekman. May I come in? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Come on in. Thanks. I've been going crazy waiting. I was just going to phone the police. I see you're in uniform, Mr. Beekman. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm still in the service. I just got back from Germany today. Uh What ship did you come back on? No ship. I, I flew back. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Yes, I think I do, Mr. Beekman. You don't in the least resemble the man I'm looking for. The man you're looking for? Here? Hey, what is this? Mr. Beekman, when did you last see your wife? I haven't seen her since I got back. As soon as the plane landed, I called her from the airport. And she was here? Yeah, and then I told her I'd be home in 20 minutes. When I got here, she and the baby was gone. Is your baby's name Thomas Beekman, Jr.? Yes, sir, that's right. Is your wife blonde, rather small, very pretty? Yes, sir, that's Nora. And... Do you by any chance know a man about, oh, six feet tall, slim, good-looking, with blonde hair and a light mustache? That sounds like Nora's brother, Harry, but Uh tell me what's happened. Well, 
Well, this is rather difficult to tell you, but... Well, Mr. Beekman, your wife and her brother have gone into the business of selling your baby. No, that can't be. I felt the same way when I heard about it the first time. And where's my baby now? I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. He might be with your wife, or... She might have sold him again by this time. Oh, no. No, I... I can't believe that Nora would do that. Mr. Beekman, let's try to do something that'll bring your baby back to you. Now, tell me, what is your brother-in-law's full name? Harry Jackson, but it, I don't know where he lives, though. I see. Do you mind if I take a look around the apartment? Well, no, 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 sir. Go, go right ahead. Thanks. Maybe I can find something here that'll lead us to your wife and brother and your baby. No, uh, give that kid a bottle or anything that'll keep him quiet. Now you see what I used to go through. Uh. Here, Sonny, drink this. Funny, isn't it? What's funny? You give a baby a bottle and he stops making noise. You give a grown-up a bottle and that's when he starts making noise. That's funny? Sorry, it amused me. Don't get sarcastic with me. Oh, shut up. You're getting on my nerves. I'll get on your nerves even more if I don't do anything but sit around this apartment all day and all night. Relax. The only thing that can spoil everything now is we get caught by the cops. We'll stay undercover for a week or so, and then you can go out and call on the next sucker. But do you think it's safe here? Why don't we get out of New York? Look, all the names on our sucker list are right here in New York. If we leave town, we've got to get another list. But how do you know we're safe in this apartment? It belongs to a legitimate friend of mine who went to South America. He won't be back till June. Okay. You're the genius. How many times do you think we can sell, Sonny, before your friend gets back? Well, how do I know? We'll sell him as many times as we can. <laughs> find out, Charlie. Well, Jim, I waited over at the office of that pediatrician that used to treat the Beekman child. Yeah. And he said he hadn't heard from Mrs. Beekman in three weeks. I didn't suppose she'd take too good a care of the baby. Oh, I left our number with him. He'll call us if he does hear from her. Oh, good. I assume you didn't have any luck either. No, none at all. You remember I found that bottle of medicine in the bathroom cabinet at the Beekman? Yeah, the one that said take as directed? That's the one. Well, I called the drugstore, gave them the number of the prescription. They told me what it was, but they said that lots of babies take those pills. They're just vitamin pills. Jim, there must be some clue as to where they went. Well, I hope there is, but I can't think of what it would be. All we know is they're probably still somewhere in New York. Yeah, every check we've made would seem to indicate they are. But what makes you so sure they still got the baby with them? Jackson went back to the Buchanan apartment to get the child, didn't he? If he didn't want it, he wouldn't have done that. I guess you're right, Jim. Well, maybe the police will come up with a clue. They've sent out an alarm. Every policeman in the city is looking for them. Well, that should keep them from moving around very much. Yeah. As long as they have the baby with them, they'll be staying home nights taking care of him. You can be sure of that. Charlie, why didn't I think of that before? Think of what? Send me that phone. I've got an idea. Oh, just went around the corner for some cigarettes. What'd they do? Make them for you by hand? You've been gone two hours. I got tired of waiting for you to come back. You got tired of waiting for me? Oh, I know it takes time, Nora. I just needed some cigarettes. Is that a crime or something? Okay, okay, okay. How'd you make out with Mrs. Atwater? She's going to buy some. How much? She was wearing a brand new mink coat, so I jacked up the price. We got 1500 this time. Good for you. I meet her tomorrow morning at 11. She said she'd pay for Sonny in cash. Hey, who can that be? I don't know. Oh, maybe it's one of George's friends who doesn't know he's out of town. Good afternoon. Mrs. Beekman here. Mrs. Who are you? I'm from the FBI. Here are my credentials. And these are genuine, Mr. Jackson. How do you know my name? And what do you do? Step back, Jackson. Let me come in. Who is it, Harry? It's the FBI, Mrs. Beekman. Who... Well, I'm glad to see your child asleep in the carriage. I was afraid you might have sold him again before we got here. Hey, gee, man, tell me one thing, will you? What do you want to know? How'd you find us here? We were almost stymied until I remembered that all babies need one thing. What's that? Diapers. So I called every diaper service in New York. One of them told me that Mrs. Beekman had moved, and they gave me this new address. Whoa. And uh, speaking of addresses, Mrs. Beekman, 
I have an idea you and your brother will have the same address for some time to come. Prison. Allie Jackson and Mrs. Beekman were tried and convicted and are now serving long terms in prison. When they finish, Jackson will serve an additional five years in a federal penitentiary for having impersonated a member of the FBI. And in that manner, the sordid criminal careers of two inhuman people were brought to a finish by your FBI. Tonight's case in the files is indicative of one thing, and that is that there are no depths to which the criminal is incapable of sinking in the commission of a crime. There are no bounds of decency which the criminal recognizes. And in his own tortured mind, there's nothing wrong in stealing from someone who is not quite as cunning as he is. Only the shrewd deserve to survive is his motto. But what he never realizes until too late is that the forces of law and order are shrewd and cunning themselves, and, like your FBI, utterly relentless. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The equitable man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options when my income increases? You bet it does. Your equitable man will give you all the facts on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book under Equitable Society... Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Patient. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your F. FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Patient on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, while you're listening to this program, you might be called to the phone to answer an easy question. 
Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about a special life insurance plan they have for men and women on the way up. Believe me, that's one great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Patient. In studying the criminal records of the six million people in the United States today who have been arrested on charges of having committed a major crime, your FBI learned that less than 50% of those six million committed only one crime and then stopped. That is true despite the fact that they were caught and punished for that first crime. Because in the commission of their second one, they were buoyed by the optimistic thought that they had learned enough by then to commit a crime and not be apprehended. No class of people are given to such undue optimism as the criminal. Because optimism is necessary to feed his ego. And so he goes from crime to crime committing grand larceny one day, kidnapping another day, and the next day, murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small town in one of our northwestern states. A car drives swiftly down one of the quiet, tree-lined streets in this village. It stops in front of a large white house. A man hurriedly leaves the car and walks quickly to the front door. You, Dr. Crawford. That's right. Well, I'm a stranger here in town. But the fellow in the drugstore told me to come here. What about? Oh, it's my wife. Yes? Yeah, she's she's got to have a baby. She needs some help right away. Where is she? In a cabin about ten miles out of town. Has any other doctor been taking care of her? Uh, yeah, I'm back home. But we've been on a trip. And she's not going to be able to make it back there. I see. Doc, can you come right now? Well, I have several other calls to make. She needs help bad. Very well. I'll get my car out and follow you. We haven't got that, that much time. You ride with me. That's the cabin right there. You certainly picked an isolated spot. Well, you know what housing is. It's the only place we could find. Let's go. Surely. Is this your wife's first child? Yeah. Is there anyone else here with her? No, no, she's alone. Well, I may have to send you back to town to contact my nurse. Anything you say, Doc. Here we are. Is that you, Whitey? Yeah, yeah, open up. Go ahead, Doc. Thank you. Is he a doctor? Yeah. Well, he'd better get right to work. Is this the woman who's expecting a baby? No. But you said your wife was here alone. Doc, that whole wife routine was a phony. What? You've got a real job to do. What do you mean? There's a guy in the next room with three slugs in him, and you're going to fix him up. Why are you wasting time? Okay, Doc, get to work. Now, see here, I didn't come out to I've this... got a gun, Doc. Do like I say. But you have no right... Look, the guy's in real bad shape, so get started. I better tell you this. If he kicks off, you go too. Some 30 miles away at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just finishing a long-distance call. Yes. Yes, I see. Well, thanks a lot, Warden. I'll get down there right away. Goodbye. Calling it a day, Jim? Oh, no, Leo, I'm afraid my day is just starting. Uh What? Yes, it was a call from the warden at the county jail. A prisoner broke out down there several hours ago. Who was he? A man named George Brooks. What was he in for? He'd just been convicted on a big payroll job. Over $40,000 was stolen. Was that the one down at Salem? Yes, that's the one. Oh, I remember it. Brooks worked with a partner. The partner was killed. That's it. 
As I recall it, the money was never recovered. No, Brooks evidently managed to hide it away at some point before he was apprehended. Mm, that's probably the reason for his breaking out. Yes, I know. And why were we called in, Jim? Oh, we have a detainer on him. And it's important that we find him, too. Uh, did you get any details on the jailbreak? No, not much. The only thing the warden told me on the phone was that he was sure Brooks was wounded by one of the guards. Have the state police been alerted? Yes, all authorities have been notified. They've already set up an extensive roadblock. Leo, I'm going down there now. I'll give you a more complete story when I return. Jane, will you quit that? What? Walking up and down. Relax, will you? Oh, sure. That's a cinch. Look, there's nothing else you can do. No. Do you think we could go in there? No. Is that doctor any good? He's okay. How do you know? The drugstore guy in the village said he was the best doctor in the county. Oh. Jean. Yeah? You... You still go for Brooksy, don't you? Are you kidding? Well, what have you got the jumps for? I want him to live for the same reason you do. So we can find out where he planted that dough. Are you sure that's all? Oh, baby. We were washed up before he was sent away. He didn't know that. Well, you knew it. I hope. How do I know from James? Honey, if you don't know about you and me by now, turn in your suit. Okay. Now, can I walk some more? Sure. Oh. Uh, Doc, how is he? I extracted the bullets. Is he going to live? I believe so, yes. Swell. Can I talk to him now? No, he's still unconscious. Now, with your permission, I'd like to leave. Wait a minute. You're staying right here. You asked me to save a man's life. I believe I've done that. I have no further obligation. Oh, yes, you have. I have other calls to make. They can wait, Doc. We ain't satisfied with a guy that's just going to live. We want one who can talk. Are you still here, Leo? Oh, yes, Jim. Working nights this week. Oh? How did you make out? Well, I picked up a number of details on the jailbreak, but Brooks is still at large. How did he make the break? Well, the warden said he had a woman visit him last week. She was his girlfriend. Her name is Jean Dodge. Yeah. It's believed that she managed to pass him a gun. He used that gun to subdue a guard, then used the guard as cover and managed to get through the front gate. Yeah, just like that. That's it. As soon as he was outside, the guard eluded him and immediately gave the alarm. There was some shooting, but Brooks got away. And that's the last that was seen of him? Yes, but his trail was picked up. He headed through a patch of woods, and judging from the bloodstains that were found along the way, he must have been rather severely wounded. Well, surprising, then, that he escaped. Well, he had a car waiting for him. Tire tracks were found showing where it had parked, and his trail led right to it. And the car got away before the roadblock took a thing. I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean? I have an idea there was a hideout all ready for him, not too far from the jail. Why do you think so? Well, Leo, that's sparsely settled country. There's not many roads. And less than a half an hour after the break, every car was stopped within a 50-mile radius. Oh, I see. And there's another factor that may help. If Brooks was badly wounded, he's going to need medical attention and fast. So the warden's alert... Hey, wait a minute, Jim. What? Something came in a little while ago that ties right up with this. Oh, what is it? There's a doctor missing over in Quincy. Really? What's the story? Well, his wife reported it. Stranger came to their house about 6 o'clock this evening, mm -hmm. told the doctor his wife was going to have a baby. They left in the man's car, and the doctor hasn't been heard from since. Did his wife see this man? No, she was in another room. She just overheard the conversation. Well, did she know where they went? No. I'd better get all the details from her at once. Baby, it's coming up daylight. Yeah. Don't you want to get some sleep? No, I couldn't. Well, Doc. He's conscious. You mean he can talk? Yes. Oh, nice going, Doc. Now may I leave? No, I'm afraid not. Why? You promised... I can't to... have you blowing a whistle on us. Jean, go on in and talk to Brooksy. Okay. You've got to let me go. Sorry, Doc. I'm tying you up. Now, see your you... Jean, you know what to say to him. Yeah. I'll take care of the doc. Hello, darling. Oh. Hello, Jean. Don't move, honey. Just lie still. Okay. You want anything? No. No, no. 
George. Yeah. I think I know you pretty well. What you like and what you don't like. Uh huh. What you like best is the truth. That's right, baby. Well, that's why I'm going to tell you this. Thing. What? That doctor who's been taking care of you. I just not talked to him. Talk to him about you. Uh huh. What he said ain't going to be so nice for you to hear. Well, come on. Let's have it. He said you're not going to live. Oh. Maybe I did wrong in telling him this, George, but... No, 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 no. Oh, oh darling. Jean, don't. Don't, Jean. Sorry. Where's... Where's Whitey? In the next room. Does he know? Mm -hmm. George, I know this sounds corny, but is there anything you want done? I... I don't think so. What about that dough? Dough? The dough you buried. If there's anyone you want to have it, you can tell me where it is. Well, I... Ooh. I... I got a sister. She could use it. Oh, I'd be glad to see that she gets it, George. Just tell me where to find it. Okay, honey. There's a big red barn. It's on Route 18. Ten miles north of Salem. Uh-huh. Go on. The dough. The dough's in the box. Buried right behind the barn. Well, well. You'll... You'll make sure my sister oh, gets... Oh, of course, it. George. But you don't even know her name. Of, uh, of where she lives. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Wait, I'll get a pencil and write it all oh, down. Uh, hold it, hold huh? it. Call Whitey in here. I'd like to tell him about it, too. Sure, honey, sure. Whitey? Yeah, honey? You got the dock all tied up? Uh-huh. Then come on in here. George wants to see you. Okay. I just wanted to see how far you phonies would go. George. Just stay where you are, the both of you. Now, no, wait a minute. Put down that gun. Look, you. The doc already told me where I stand. He said I'm doing fine. What's more, I know what you two are up to. What are you talking about? I got the word when I was away about both of you. Those were lies. No, no. Why do you no, look no. out? Too late, baby. <laughs> Honey, you were crying over the wrong corpse. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women on the way up. To men who are confident that one of these days the boss will be calling them into his office to say, Well, Joe, we like the way you've taken hold here, so we're going to promote you to Jenkins' old job. Of course, that means a substantial increase in salary, too. Did you know that there is a special life insurance plan for men like that? For men who expect to be filling a bigger job and earning more money five years from now than they are today? It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society plan for men and women on the way up. Maybe I'm kidding myself, but I think that means me. So how about telling me a little bit more? Well, this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up has three major advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. 
Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times, can expand or contract as you see fit. Sounds okay so far, Mr. Keating. How can I get the whole story? Demonstrate that you consider yourself on the way up by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative and asking him about this plan. Phone him as soon as possible or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Curious Patient. It was the immortal Bobby Burns who first said that the best laid plans of mice and men off go awry. And as is proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, that is true for criminals as well as for everybody else. This case is the perfect example of the lengths to which the criminal mind will go. The complex plans it conjures up in the mighty effort to get something for nothing. The criminal mind is incapable of realizing that the only thing you get for nothing is nothing. And because of his failure to realize that obvious truth, he goes on stealing, lying, cheating, and killing. He lives in shadows, and he trusts no one. And he has one major goal in life. He wants to commit the perfect crime. And he never finds out until too late that there can be no perfect crime. The night file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Stewart. Hello, Leo. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. Where are you? I'm out of Dr. Crawford's house. Have you interviewed his wife? The doctor himself just came home about ten minutes ago. Well, then I sent you on a wild goose chase. No, no, not at all, Leo. I'm very glad that I came here. Did his disappearance tie in with Brooks? Very much so. He was taken to a cabin where Brooks was hiding out. Oh, I see. The man who brought him there threatened him with a gun and made him take care of Brooks' wounds. After he patched him up, the doctor was then bound and thrown into a closet. How'd he get away? There was a fight. Brooks shot and killed his confederate. The man who drove the doctor out there? Yes. Then Brooks and his girl, who was also there, left the cabin and drove away. Well, how did Brooks manage to move? I thought he was badly wounded. Well, the girl practically carried him out. After that, the doctor managed to loosen his bonds and get out of there himself. Has the uh, doctor any idea where Brooks and the girl have gone? No. Uh, could he describe their car? Yes, yes. He gave me everything but the license number. I've already passed it on to the state police. Oh, uh, what's the next move, Jim? Can you get away from the office? Yeah, William just came in. Then get right over here, will you? The doctor will lead us out to the cabin. <laughs> Doctor, is this the room that Brooks was in? That's right, Mr. Taylor. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything here that would tell us where they'd gone. Oh, Jim. Oh, in here, Leo. Uh, I took an impression of the tire treads from Brooks' car. Good. Did you get anything in here? No. no I, think... I think we should arrange to get the coroner out here. If we get the bullet from the dead man's body, it might be helpful to us. Oh, Leo, I just remembered. I think I know who that man is. Really? Yes. Oh, uh, doctor, you say they called him Whitey? Yes. Well, I think I recall a petty thief called Whitey Floyd. There was a wallet circular on him. I looked at it just last week. We'll check on it as soon as we get back to the office. Right. Gentlemen, I wish I could have been more helpful to you. My doctor, after what you've been through, we appreciate your even coming out here. I wish they'd been careless enough, doctor, to let you overhear where they were going. Say, wait. There was one thing. I heard that man Brooks say... I don't think it means very much. Oh, what was it? He remarked that they'd only travel at night to lessen their chances of being found. I see. Jim, they undoubtedly have a specific destination. Oh, yes. I think I can guess where it is. Oh, where? The place that Brooks hid the money he took on the payroll, Jeff. Mm. And all we have to do is to find where he hid it. Yeah. Well, Doctor... Yes? Can you recall anything else that Brooks said? Anything at all, no matter how unimportant? Well, I... I didn't get much chance to talk to him. As soon as he regained consciousness, I was tied up. Well, did he say anything to you at all? Uh, let me see. He did speak once, but not to me. Oh, what do you mean, sir? Just as he was regaining consciousness, he mumbled something about R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. 
it be, beloved wife Abigail? Yes, he repeated it twice. Well, that's really cryptic. Anything else? No, I'm positive that was all. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Leo, I think we'd better get a coroner out here, then head back to the office. George. What? Don't you think you should try to get some sleep? No. Why not? I don't trust you. Oh, look, do we have to go over that whole thing again? I wasn't double-crossing you with Whitey. Mm. He made me tell that story about you dying. He said if I didn't do it, he'd... He'd, he'd, he'd kill me. No kidding. Look, you got to believe me. Stop yelling, will you? We parked this car out here in the woods to avoid people, not attract them. Inside. George? What is it? You feel like you do about me. If you still think I was handing you one, why didn't you shoot me, too? Because I needed you. Honest, honey? Just to drive the car. If I could move myself, you wouldn't be here. Hmm. I also need you to dig up that dough. We're really going to get it? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, what's so funny? (laughs) What a checker game this is. What do you mean? You're still alive because somebody's got to dig up that dough for me. I'm still alive because you wouldn't dare to slug me until I get that dough. (laughs) What a setup. George, that's not true, and you know it. No. Wait till you get your hot little hands on that money box. Then what a rat race that'll be. Oh, stop it. Look, how much longer do we have to park here? As soon as it gets dark, sweetheart, we're on our way. Hey, Jim, the coroner was just here. Gave oh. me the bullet he took from Florence Barney. Good. I'm sending it right to the laboratory. Oh, any word from the state police on Brooks? No, nothing yet. Oh. How are you making out? Well, I've been going through Brooks's complete record. So far, I've only come up with one thing out of his past. What's that? Well, as far as I can tell, he isn't married, never has been. Well, then who was his beloved wife, Abigail? That remains a mystery. Well, what's that file you're in? Oh, this is a complete report on the payroll sticker. Oh, well, you go right ahead. I'll go downstairs. Wait. What is it? There's a description of how and where the police apprehended Brooks. Well? I think it clears up the identity of Abigail. Really, Jim? Yes, and if he travels at night, as the doctor heard him say, I think we can catch up with him this evening. I can't say I like this very much. What do you mean? Driving in a cemetery at night, it gives me the creeps. Make you think of why? No. Turn left here. Here. Okay. Now what? Uh, You see that big monument right ahead there? Yeah. Well, stop when you get past it. Why did you pick a place like this to bury your dough? I didn't have any choice. Why not? The cops were chasing me. I came in here to duck them. When I saw they were closing in, I quick buried the money. Oh, is this the place? Huh? Yes, yes. Oh, Know what? Well, you see that little tombstone right over there? Yeah. Get out and let's see what it says on it. Oh, fine. Come on, move, will you? All right. What should it say? R.I.P. Beloved wife, Abigail. R.I.P. Beloved wife, Abigail. Well? This is it. Oh, good. Good, the box is buried right behind the stone. What'll I dig with? Use your hands. It's right under the grass. Oh. Hey. What's the matter? There's a hole here. What? Somebody's already dug it up. Don't give me that. Where's George? You know I can't move. You're, you're trying to cross me again. No, no, no. He's telling you the truth, George. Huh? Don't move, either one of you. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. How did you know we'd be here? My Brooks here tipped us off to that. What? Yes. The doctor heard you mumbling about the inscription on this tombstone. We couldn't piece it in at first, but when I learned that you'd been arrested here, the rest was easy. Oh, you 
stupid fool. Brooks, I think a cemetery is a fitting place to tell you that the police want to talk to you about your friend, the late Whitey Floyd. George Brooks was turned over to the local authorities. He was tried and convicted for first-degree murder. His girlfriend was sentenced to a long term in the federal penitentiary. And thus, your FBI thwarted another attempt to continue a career of crime. That the two criminals were caught is to the credit of your FBI. Because this was a case that called for trained investigation of every clue. And the added ability to weigh the value of each scrap of information. It is no accident that a special agent arrived at the correct conclusion. For well, the special agents of your FBI are given long courses of study in the art of investigation before they work on a single case. That is done so that you may be better protected. You, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you are what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Juvenile Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Juvenile Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At any time in the next half hour, while you're listening to this program, your telephone may ring. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, uh, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. 
my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Believe me, that's one great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Juvenile Shakedown. Your FBI is composed of men who have made a career of crime prevention. And to that end, they recently completed a nationwide survey which showed that in the United States last year, there were committed the appalling number of 1,600,000 crimes. Far more disturbing to your FBI than that total number of major crimes, however, was the fact that the number committed by boys and girls in the 17 to 21 age group was out of all proportion. That means that America is raising a new bumper crop of criminals. A crop which will make the current crime wave seem puny unless something is done. Something is done and done quickly. Whether you have a child in that age group or not, this is your problem. Because you are an American. And if nothing is done to alleviate the present condition, you will also be making it easier for new criminals to be born. New criminals whose victim could be you. Tonight's FBI file opens in a city in upstate New York. Two teenage boys have just left a large department store. Well, Curly, I guess that takes care of our shopping for today. Yeah. What'll we do now, Rip? I don't know. Can we uh, go to the movies? Now, well, let's get rid of this stuff first. What do we score for? Uh, five fountain pens, those two silver money clips, and them cufflinks. Hey, that's good, huh? Not bad. Just a minute, boy. Huh? What? I want to talk to you. And what about? I was watching you in that store. We didn't do nothing. I saw you lift those pens. Rip, you're crazy, mister. I also saw you steal some cufflinks. Rip, let's blow. No, you don't. Let go of me. I'm not a cop. Huh? I just want to talk to you. Let's walk. I, I don't get this. I have a proposition that you might be interested in. Is this a trap or something? No, no. As long as you boys indulge in larceny, I think I can put you next to something big. What do we do, Rip? We'll talk to him. What can we lose? Fine. Now, I have a candy store a few blocks from here. Let's go over there right now, huh? Hey, Rip. Yeah? This is fun, huh? Fun? Riding on top of freight train? Well, sure. <laughs> it's something I always wanted to do. We didn't come here for no joyride, Curly. We got work to do. Hey, tell me the plans again. Well, the candy store guy said we should stay here until we come to a water tower. Then we go into action. I still don't see how we get down in the car. Look, how many times do I have to tell you? You hold on to my legs... I reach down, break the seal, and open the door. And we just swing in. Oh, yeah, I remember now. And then we throw out the boxes, and Mr. Brown comes along in his truck and picks him up. Right. Don't nobody guard these trains? Sure. Just got to keep our fingers crossed that nobody spots us. Hey, you know... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? There's a water tower. Come on, let's get started. Oh, okay. Get around here and grab my legs. Well, sure, Rip. How's that? Okay. Hold on tight. Oh, I will, Rip. Honest. Here I go. Can you reach the seal? Do you hear me, Rip? Can you reach it? Rip! Okay. Pull me up, Curly. Okay. 
there. Did you open it? Yeah. Well, let's swing in. And watch yourself, Curly. It ain't too easy. Ah, look, anything with muscles I ain't afraid of. I'll go first. Go ahead. Well, here I go. Come on, Curly. That was a breeze. All right. Now let's get to work. Hey, you... Uh, do we throw out all these boxes? No, just about 20 of them. Rip, you want some candy? Put it away. They're good. Mr. Brown gave them to me. Let's get going on these boxes. Hello, Bill. Hi there, Jim. Been looking for you. I've been out doing a little road work. Well, judging by those shoes, it was a muddy track. <laughs> it was. The case came in this morning. The Albany office reported it to us. What's it about? A freight car was broken into. Twenty large cartons of cigarettes were stolen, worth about $1,500. In our local freight yard? No, while well, the train was en route from here to Albany. The job wasn't discovered until they arrived there. Well, what could we do with this, then? Well, I worked with the railroad police. Tried to establish where the stuff had been thrown off. To find anything? Yes, we located the spot. It's about 20 miles west of here. How'd you arrive at that? Well, one of the cartons was found near the roadbed. It had broken open so the thieves didn't bother to take it, I guess. We also found indentations about every 20 yards where the other cartons had landed. Any leads on who the thieves were? Well, a brakeman said he saw two boys jump off the train a few miles past the place where we found the broken carton, so I imagine they did the job. Did the Albany office have anything? Well, they're out now examining the freight car. What else did you get? We found some tire markings, truck size. Also, some footprints. And they appeared to be a man's prints, not a boy's. And they had a Confederate pick the stolen goods up. I would think so. We took an impression of the tire treads and the footprints. We also measured the length of the man's stride. I'm sending these off to the laboratory now. Hiya, Rip. Hi, Curly. Did you see Mr. Brown? Yeah. Did he give you the dough? Uh-huh. How much? I didn't count it yet. It's in this candy box. Well, what's it in there for? Didn't want anybody in the store to see the payoff. Can we open the box now? Well, let's go in this alley. Okay. Uh, this'll do. Hey, maybe there's candy in there, too. Need any help? No. Here we are. What's in there, Rip? How much? Well, let me count it, will you? 15, 20, and 10 is 30. Is that all? It can't be. Let me look under this paper. Any more? No. And a dirty, cheap punk. That stuff was worth 50 times as much. Oh, let's go back there, Rip. Let's go back and I'll let him have it. No, that won't do any good. Look, if I belt him a few times, we'll get more. Surely, don't all the time think about using muscle. What else can we do? Leave him alone for now. We'll go back there later. Why wait? Because I've got an idea. Jim. Oh, yes, Bill. He came in just in time. There's teletypes for you. Oh? What's it about? It's from Washington. Looks like a laboratory report on those footprints he sent down there. Good. Here you are. Thanks. Footprints and length of stride indicate men about 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing close to 200 pounds. Jim, have you heard anything from Albany? Yes, yes. They found several fingerprints on that freight car seal that might mean something. Anything else? Yes. Several candy wrappers were found on the floor of the car. Hold them here. Here you are. Mm-hmm. Looks like a taffy wrapping. Mm -hmm. I've already contacted the company that makes this candy, and they said they distribute it to about a dozen stores here in town. Well, if the boys who broke into that car live here, that might be a way of identifying them. Yes, I know. The candy company is sending me a complete list of those stores as soon as they can check on the records. What have you done with the fingerprints? Well, I forwarded one set to Washington, and because youngsters are involved, I also sent another set to the local police. I'm hoping that that'll bring us some results. Go ahead, Curly. 
Right. Hello, Mr. Brown. Oh, hello there, boys. Just closing the store. We want to talk to you. I'm afraid we'll have to wait till tomorrow. We want to talk now. Well. It's about that dough you gave us, Mr. Brown. What about it? It wasn't enough. We want more. Lots more. Just like that, huh? Yeah. Boys, you were paid exactly what you were worth. That's all you get. Now, look... Shirley, I'll handle this. Mr. Brown, we want another hundred bucks. Please get out of here. I'm closing up. We ain't leaving here till we get it. Now, look. I don't want to make any trouble for you, but if you don't get out, I'm calling the police. And what'll you tell them? That you're thieves. She came in here to shake me down. Will you tell them why we're shaking you down? I'll say that you stole some goods from a freight car. Tried to sell it to me. And you think they'll believe you? Yes. I'm a respectable businessman. I've got some news for you, Mr. Brown. That story won't stand up for nothing. Why not? Because I'll have a story, too. That'll make a bum out of yours. <laughs> tell it to him, Rip. Sure. I'll tell the cops that we're just kids. Poor kids. You got a hold of us and poured evil thoughts in our ears. You threatened to do all kinds of things to us if we didn't go out and steal for you. I'm telling you, I'll really lay it on, Mr. Brown. <laughs> They'd never believe you. They would the way I'd tell it. I got a lot of talent. I can look sad. Real sad. And I can cry, too. Real tears. Look, watch me. He made us do it, Your Honor. He made us become bad boys. He made us steal that stuff in the freight car. He was the one, Your Honor. He was the one. Do you like that, Mr. Brown? That's just a sample. I pull that on a judge... We get let free, and you do 20 years. Now where do we stand? I'll get you the money. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men on the way up. To the man whose friends or business associates talk about him like this. That Jim Ward is a man to watch. I hear he's had three raises in the past three years. One of these days, he'll be going into business for himself. And when that day comes, Jim Ward has the kind of life insurance program that can be adjusted to fit his new status in life. Years ago, his equitable society representative picked Jim as a coming man. So he advised Jim Ward to invest in an equitable life insurance plan for men on the way up. A special plan for people whose earning capacity can be expected to increase as they become more experienced in their business or profession. I may be fooling myself, but I think that's a pretty good description of me. So how about telling me a little bit more about this plan? Well, this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up has three major advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. can expand or contract as you see fit. To me, that's a brand new angle on life insurance, Mr. Keating. How can I get the whole story? Just get in touch with your equitable society representative and ask him about the equitable plan for people on the way up. Why not phone him soon? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Juvenile Shakedown. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is shocking because it shows the evil machinations of an adult in making criminals of youngsters, and thereby effectively hampering any chance they might have had of becoming decent, law-abiding citizens. The depth to which human beings can sink, apparently, has not yet been reached. But each year, new evidence is uncovered that somewhere a human being has done something which is unspeakable. It is obvious that there is great need for people to examine their morals. 
because we may currently be headed in the wrong direction. Headed in the direction which has led to the downfall of every civilization yet built by man. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is working at his desk. Say, hey, Jim. Mm, yeah? What's happening on that freight car job? Oh, I just heard from the local police bill. They've identified one set of fingerprints as belonging to a boy named Ralph Sterling. His nickname is Rip. What's his record? Well, he spent two years in reformatory. He was convicted for a series of petty thefts. When was he released? About two months ago. Do they have an address on him? Yes, they checked with his parents, but he disappeared from home about ten days ago. Hasn't been seen since. Well, that certainly doesn't help much. Yes, I know. Bill, there's another angle on this case that I've been giving quite a bit of thought to. What's that? The man who drove that truck. Now, the local authorities tell me there's been a series of thefts lately by youngsters here in town. Yeah? And the articles that were stolen weren't the usual thing that kids would take or for that matter could dispose of easily. So it's highly possible that the man who drove that truck could be operating an organized gang of boys. You know, in that case, finding this Sterling boy really becomes important. Exactly. Oh, I've got that list of candy stores here. I'm going out now and check them. Hey, Rip. Yeah? How's our dough holding out? We got about 20 bucks left. Oh, we spent that much? Sure, we got these clothes, didn't we? That took most of it. Better think about doing another job. We don't have to. But, Rip, we got to get dough. I wouldn't like it being broke again. We'll get dough. How? For Mr. Brown. He already paid us. That was only a down payment. I don't get it. We got that guy where we want him. He's a real good shake for us. All we have to do is drop in on him once in a while, remind him of that story I gave him, and we never have to work. What can I do for you? My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Yes? Here are my credentials. I see. I'm looking for information, and it's possible that you can help me. Well, I'll certainly try. Thanks. I have a candy wrapper here. Uh, do you sell this brand of candy? Let me see. Yeah. Well, yes, I sell quite a good deal of this brand. Do you know a boy named Ralph Sterling? His nickname is Rip. Sterling? Why... No, I don't believe I do. I'd like you to look at this picture. Sure. Have you ever seen that boy? No, sir, I never have. He was involved in a robbery. What makes you think I might know? Well, candy wrappers similar to the one I just showed you were found at the scene of the crime. Oh? I'm trying to establish where that candy was purchased. Well, I certainly wish I could be of more help to you. Well, thanks anyway. Oh, uh... Let me have a package of those cigarettes, will you? Oh, sure. There you are, sir. Thanks. Oh, uh, by the way, you can keep that picture. And if young Sterling should come in here, please get in touch with us at once. Hello, Mr. Brown. Well? We thought we'd drop in and see you. What do you want? We kind of got trouble. That's your affair. It's yours, too. We got money trouble. What do you mean? We're fresh out of it. I've already paid you. Yeah, but we spent it. Well, that's your misfortune. It's also yours. We want more. Oh, I see. You're going to make a steady habit of this, I presume? Only when things get tough. We want 50 bucks, Mr. Brown. I, I haven't got that amount in the store. Look, don't stall. Mr. Brown... You want I should do my crying act again? No. And get it up. I can't give it to you now. Come back later. Is this a brush off? No, no. Come back here at 10 o'clock tonight. 10 o'clock? You told us the other day you close up at 9. Well, I live in the back of the store. Just rap on the door. I'll hear you. Okay. See you later. Oh, Bill. Bill, are you busy? No, not very, Jim. How'd you make out? No luck. Cover all the candy stores? Yes, I went to all 15 of them. They'd never seen young Sterling. Oh, has there been any word from the local police? No. 
Bill, would you mind doing a little tabulating with me? No, not at all. Okay. Now, every package of those cigarettes that were stolen had a New York State cigarette tax stamp on them. Now, those stamps are numbered, and I have a list of all the numbers here. Quite a list it is, too. Yes, but our job won't be too complicated. Each candy store I went into, I bought a package of the same brand of stolen cigarettes. I have them all here. Are the uh, numbers on this list all consecutive? That's right. Okay, read them off. Right. Now, this first pack was bought at River Street Stationers, number 11324. Mm, let's see. 234. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, next pack bought at Wilson's Candy Store, number 13356. Wait a minute now. Should be on this page. Yeah, here we are. No, oh, that's a blank too, Jim. Here's an excellent. Bought at Brown's Candy Store. Number 14195. Well, that might get us something. There's a list here of 14s. Let's see. 14195? That's it. It's right here on the list, Jim. Look. Oh, yeah. Yes. Brown's Candy Store. Bill, let's check the motor vehicle bureau at once. Find out if Mr. Brown has got a truck. I don't think he's in there, Rip. Wait, the light just went on. Here he comes. Oh, swell. Hello, Mr. Brown. Come in, boy. Okay. Go ahead, Curly. Right. Come this way. My living quarters are back here. When you didn't answer the door, we thought you were handing this one. Didn't we, Rip? Yeah. You got the dough, Mr. Brown? I'm getting it for you. Right in here. Go ahead. Right. Put on the light. There. Hey, what happened? What do you mean? All your furniture turned over. All them papers scattered around the floor. Was you drinking, Mr. Brown? No, I'm quite sober. Look, even that window's broken. How can you live in a joint like this? It isn't like this usually. I arranged it just for you. What do you mean? Well, inasmuch as frame-up seemed to be in order, I thought you boys deserved one, too. What's he talking about? I have my dramatic moments, too, Rip. You see that broken window? Yeah. You boys did that. Huh? You broke in here to rob my store. I found you there was a struggle. That accounts for the scattered furniture. And then what do you think happened? What? Just as things looked bad for me, I was able to get my gun, this gun... What is this? It's self-evident. I had to shoot you both in self-defense. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Brown. You must be kidding or something, huh? No, I'm quite serious. Look, we'll go away from here right now. We'll never bother you again, will we, Curly? No, Mr. Brown, honest. Please, put down that gun. Please. Sorry, boys. No, don't. That gun down, Brown. Oh, what do you... Come on, let me have it. What? Well, you're... You're the man from the FBI. That's right. Well, I'm certainly glad you're here. That's the boy you're looking for. I just caught him and his friend in the act of rifling my store. That's a lie. He's trying to frame us. I know. I followed you into the store and I overheard your whole conversation. Well, you had no right this to come This warrant in. says I had. What? Yes, it's for your arrest, Brown. You see, there was a tax number stamped on those cigarettes I bought here today. And they corresponded with one of the cigarette packages this boy stole. Well, I have We've also to... established that your truck was used to pick up the boxes that were thrown from the freight car. Now, I think we'd better continue this in my office. Frank Brown, the illicit storekeeper, was sentenced to five years in a federal penitentiary as a receiver of stolen goods. The two boys were tried, convicted, and sent to a federal reformatory. In connection with tonight's case from the files of your FBI... J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has this to say to you listeners. I quote, In those communities providing our youngsters with the wholesome, creative influence of boys' clubs, special attention is being given the very worthwhile program of the Boys' Clubs of America as part of the observance of National Boys' Clubs Week. The tremendous increase in crime that this nation has experienced in recent years is a stern warning to the adults of the land. 
They have the responsibility of providing youth with the facilities and opportunities for preparing themselves to take their places as the citizens of tomorrow. If this responsibility is recognized, we can expect better citizens in the future. If it is disregarded, as it has been too often in the past, chaos will result. I hope for the day when every week will, in fact, become a week of observance and one of adequate provision for the youth of our land, when boys' clubs will flourish in every community in the nation, and when crime will no longer menace our nation as it does today. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your Equitable Man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Unfortunate Daughter. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Unfortunate Daughter, on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned now for radio's biggest money-paying quiz show, Break the Bank. Tonight's jackpot contains an amazing $3,450. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents this is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. This can happen to you tonight. You're listening to this program when... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about their life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. So, naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all you people who are on the way up full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Unfortunate Daughter. FBI 
FBI prides itself on the fact that one of the things which has helped to make the Bureau an internationally famous crime-solving agency is that it has made a study of the criminal mind. One of the results of that study has been the realization that in the case of most criminals, they commit every crime according to the same pattern, time after time. That knowledge has helped your FBI in many of its most complex cases. But occasionally, a criminal appears who is more difficult to catch, who varies not only his pattern, but his crime. He does not fall into the obvious trap. He uses his cunning to avoid being caught. And sometimes, his plan works for a while. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small town in one of our southern states. On one of the tree-lined streets of this village, a car is parked. A woman is seated alone behind the wheel. The car motor is idling. Suddenly, from a nearby side street, hurried footsteps are heard. A man appears. He runs swiftly to the car, opens the rear door. Get moving. Where's Charlie? He didn't make it. Move, will you? Head to the highway, then drive north to Richmond. Right. I'm going to stay down on the floor here. Don't drive fast. We don't want nobody stopping us. Okay. What happened? We uh, blew everything. Didn't even get into the bank? Sure. Almost had the dough in our mitts. What went wrong? A local cop was in there. He pumped three slugs into Charlie. They got it bad? They were in their head. Oh. I uh, squared it a little, though. I, I got the cop. That's no help. How does the road look? No trouble. You know, this puts us in a tight box. We ain't holding. No dough at all? Uh, not even enough to bail us out of that rooming house in Richmond. Oh, why? You on the highway yet? A couple of more blocks. Hey, I just thought of something. What? Big Charlie might bail us out. Ruth, I told you. He got three slugs in I his... don't mean personally. He's got a tin box he always carried around with him. Must be something of value in it. I never seen it. Back in his room in Richmond. Could be full of cash. Now all we need is getaway dough. When we get back there, we'll tap it out. How's it coming? This should do it now. Yeah. Well, I don't see any mountain of green stuff. No, let's hear some of these papers. Dump the whole thing on here. Okay. Still no cash, Ruthie. No, I'll look in some of these envelopes. Oh, look here. Huh? A bunch of pictures. Snapshots of a young dame. Look for the money. It's... I don't think you'll find any. Why did Big Charlie carry this box every place? Must have some value. Ruthie, there's nothing but pictures, newspaper clippings... Oh, look at this. A birth certificate. Oh, what do you know? What? This birth certificate. It says, Claudia Pierce, daughter of Charles and Ethel Pierce. Charlie had a daughter. But all these pictures must be of her. I never knew he had a kid. Nobody did. That's yeah, probably why he put this stuff in the box. He wanted to keep it a secret. None of this gets us out of town. That's what we've got to do in a hurry. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> look at this newspaper clipping. Tom, you're wasting time. Hey, look at it, will you? Oh, what? The picture from the society page of a Boston paper. Ralph Griffin, prominent socialite, and his bride, Claudia Baker. So? Well, look at her picture. Compare it with these snapshots here. Same thing. Sure. That's Charlie's daughter. He must have changed the name from Pierce to Baker. Look, none of this is helping us. Honey, we can hawk Charlie's clothes and get enough for our fare to Boston. This can help us plenty. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Ken. Jim, I've been looking for you. I want to go over that file in the bottle case with you. Ken, I'm afraid I haven't got time right now. 
I've just been out on a job that requires some immediate attention. What is it? An attempted bank robbery down in Vernon. I've just come from there. What's the story? Two armed men entered the First National at approximately 10 o'clock this morning. Oh? They slugged the teller, but before they could get any money, a local policeman came in. Yes? The bandits opened fire on him. He shot it out with him. He killed one of the men. The other one killed him. I see. What happened to the surviving bandit, Jim? He got away. He evidently had a Confederate someplace in town with a car. There's been no trace of him since. Has an alarm been sent out? Yes, but we have only a very vague description on him. I don't think it'll be any help in turning him up. Did you identify the thief who was killed? Yes, his name was Charlie Pierce. Hmm, I seem to remember him. Well, he was an old-timer. He'd been mixed up in a number of bank jobs in the past. Did you uh, pick up anything there that might lead you to this man who got away? Well, nothing too good. Found a card of matches in the dead man's pocket, though. They advertised a bar and grill right here in Richmond. You think maybe Pierce hung out there? Well, there's a slight chance that he did. I'm going over there now and find out. <laughs> Surprised Charlie didn't put the tap on his daughter himself instead of going around sticking a bank. I know. You know what you're going to say to her? Yeah, just let me handle it. Yes? Uh, I want to see Mrs. Griffin. I'm Mrs. Griffin. Claudia Griffin? That's right. That's swell. We'd, we'd like to come in and talk to you. Who are you? Friends of Charlie. What? Yeah, Charlie Pierce, your father. Uh, can we come in? Yes. Good. Go ahead, Lucy. All right. Anybody home here? No. Uh, uh, what about uh, servants? We have a couple. They're on vacation. Oh, well, that makes it real nice. What is this all about? How did you know who I am? Oh, your pop told us. He yes. said if we ever needed anything, we should look you up. I don't believe you. He, um... Uh... Gave us these old pictures of you. He said that'd be proof enough. Let me see them. Yeah. Now, do you believe it? What do you want? Well, we figured we might sort of move in here for a while. Oh, no. Why not? My husband doesn't know about my father. He's a respectable businessman. Well, so what? We won't tip him off. You can't do this. Honey, you don't have much choice. What? You don't take us in. Then we'll have to tell your husband. Oh. Now, let's sit down and talk this thing over. Ken, that book of matches was a good lead. Really, Jim? Yes, I went to the place that advertised Bill's Bar and Grill. Yes? Showed the bartender a picture of Charlie Pierce. He recognized him immediately. Good. Said he'd been in there quite a good deal in the past three weeks. His constant companions were another man and woman. Evidently his confederate. That's right. The bartender also remembered that Pierce lived in a rooming house right around the corner. Well, that's a break. I went around there and talked to the landlady. She told me that another couple had lived there with Pierce, but they had packed and left around noon today. The bank robbery was at 10? That's right. That just about gave him enough time to get back from Vernon. Yes, I know. I got a good description of them from the landlady, though. The man had a scar on his face. From his general physical appearance, he sounds like an ex-convict named Tom Dawson. Anything else, Jim? Well, I found this old snapshot on the floor of the room. It obviously belonged to one of the bandits. What is it? A picture of a girl in a graduation gown. It says, love to daddy, signed Claudia. Hmm. Well, I'm going to get Dawson's picture from the files and take it back and show it to the landlady. <laughs> Look, don't you think you've done enough of that crime? Why did you come here? Why? Honey, we already told you we needed a hideout. Well, you're not going to stay here. You mean you don't care if your husband knows about you? No. Who are you kidding? I mean it. Honey, he's a respectable guy. This could upset him plenty. I don't care. Hey, the car outside. Huh? The guy getting out. That's my husband. Tom, what do we do? Take it easy. She's going to tell him. No, she ain't. Yes, I am. Claudia! Yes, Ralph? Where are you, there? I'll be right there. Good evening, dear. Hello, darling. Hey, what's the matter with you? Well, I... You've been crying. Yes, darling. Why? Ralph, I have something to tell you. Oh, can it wait, honey? I've got something to tell you first. It's the biggest news of the year. But Ralph... Guess who you're talking to right now. I'll give you one guess, honey. Ralph... You're I... talking to the new vice president of the bank. 
What do you think of that? Oh. They just told me right before I came home. Isn't it wonderful, honey? Oh, yes. I couldn't wait to... Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, aren't we going to meet your husband, honey? Ralph, this is Mr. and Mrs. Dawson. Oh. How do you do? Hello. Hi. The Dawsons know my father. I've asked them to stay a few weeks here with us. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now a special message to men and women who are on the way up. To those of you who are confident that sometime soon, you'll be making a telephone call like this. Hello? Hello? That you, Beth? Listen, there was a surprise in my pay envelope today. Yes, a raise. A big one. Now you know what I mean by men on the way up. Men who are going to get somewhere or know the reason why. If you're that man, then make sure you have insurance designed to order for you. Right now, investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money five years from now. I get it. This plan is elastic so a man can make changes when his ship comes in. Exactly right. And that's just one of several advantages of this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. can expand or contract as you see fit. Okay, Mr. Keating. I've got enough faith in my future to want to look into this plan. What do I do first? Just get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Phone him for full information on the equitable plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unfortunate Daughter. It happens every so often that a decent, honest citizen is called upon to make a choice between some unpleasant publicity and the condoning of a crime. In many cases, the decent citizen becomes a victim of fear and panic, loses his ordinary sense of judgment, and decides to do business with the criminal. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is an example of just that. And it is difficult to say that in the same position any of us would be inclined to do differently. However, the experience of your FBI has shown that year after year and case after case, the decent citizen who chose to do business with the criminal was hurt because the criminal failed to keep his part of the bargain. Morally, that is wrong. But what the honest law-abiding person forgets is that criminals have no morals. Tonight's file continues at the Richmond field office of the FBI. It's early evening. Special Agent Jim Taylor is talking to his fellow agent, Ken Monroe. Well, what did you get from the landlady, Jim? She definitely identified Dawson as the man who lived at her rooming house with Charlie Pierce. I've got further confirmation for you. Oh, how's that, Ken? One of the local police down in Vernon came in right after you left. He had an employee of the bank with him. Yes. I showed him Dawson's picture. He recognized him as the other bandit. Good. I put out an alarm on him. I know where he's gone. Really? Yes, as soon as I knew who we were looking for, I went to the railroad station, bus line, and airport. Well? The ticket seller at the airport recognized Dawson from his picture. He sold him two tickets to Boston on the one o'clock plane. Let's see, it's after eight yeah, now. It's too late to contact the Boston airport. He's already gotten there. What's the next move? We'll notify the Boston office, send out an alarm on Dawson, and tell him we're on our way. <laughs> Yes, 
Yes, sir? Will you have some more coffee? Uh, thanks, I will. Are the Dawsons still sleeping? Yes. How about some more toast, dear? No, I have plenty, thanks. Ralph, if you get a chance today, I wish Wait. You... What? This picture here on the front page. Claudia, look at it. What is it? It's your friend Dawson. What? I'm sure of it. Look. Oh. He's wanted in connection with a bank robbery. He tried to hold up a bank in Richmond yesterday. He and a female companion eluded the police and took a plane here to Boston. I see. Another bandit named Pierce was killed on the job. Oh, no. Honey, we've got to call the police at once. Just stay where you are, mister. Uh, You're not calling any cops. Why didn't you tell me that my father had been killed? I didn't want you to feel bad. (laughs) Claudia, what's this all about? Answer me. You want me to tell him? No. No, I'll tell him. Claudia, what is this? The man who was killed, Ralph. The other bank bandit. He was my father. What? That's why these people are here. They wanted to hide out from the police. They threatened to tell you about my father if I didn't shelter them. Oh, honey, why didn't you tell me? I was going to, Ralph. I'd made up my mind to tell you as soon as you came home. What stopped you? When you told me what had happened at the bank, that you'd been made vice president, I knew then that if the truth about my father came out, you'd be ruined. And she has a good point there, Mr. Griffin. This is awful. It'll be a lot worse if you call the cops. Just uh, think that over. I just talked to the agent in charge. Any development? No, the police here in Boston have contacted all hotels, tourist camps, rooming houses, and no one answering to Dawson's description has been seen. Well, he must have had some specific reason for coming here. It's probably a hideout. Yes. The local papers have cooperated. Most of them carried his picture on the front page. That might get results. I sure hope so. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. Yes, I see. Well, what was that address again, please? 47 Rand Drive. Thanks a lot, sir. We'll get right out there. It's a break, Ken. What? One of the local agents has been working all morning out at the airport. He finally ran across a cab driver who identified Dawson's picture. Good. His trip record shows that he took them to an address out in the suburbs late yesterday afternoon. You have the address? Yes, let's go. What's the name of the man who lives here again, Jim? Ralph Griffin. Pretty impressive looking house. Mm-hmm. Strange place for someone like Dawson to come to. Yeah, I know. Yes. Is Mr. Griffin here, please? Who wishes to see him? Now, we're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. I see. Are you Mrs. Griffin? Yes. Just a moment. I'll call my husband. Thank you. Ralph? Yes, Claudia? There's some men from the FBI to see you. FBI? Yes, they're at the front door. Looks like that's where we're going to stay, Ken. Yes. Hello? Mr. Griffin? What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Griffin, we're looking for a man named Dawson. We have information that he and a woman came here to your address yesterday afternoon. Dawson? That's right. I'm sorry, I've never heard of him. Would they have come here to see anyone else? I'm afraid not. My wife and I are the only ones here. Our servants are on vacation. Well, looks like we got a bad lead. Sorry, gentlemen. Oh, thank you anyway, sir. Not at all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Come on, Ken. You think we should get a warrant and come back here? No, I just remembered something. We got some work to do at the office first. Have they gone? Yes. Nice work, Mr. Griffin. I didn't relish it, believe me. Ralph, I'm sorry. This is all my fault. Oh, it's no one's fault, Claudia. But I'm not putting up with this any longer. What do you mean by that, mister? You and your husband are getting out of here. Are you kidding? No. Regardless of the consequences, you're not spending another night in my house. Look, we're saying it's... Hold it, honey. Hold it. I uh, think we better do like he says. Oh, thank heaven. It ain't for your sake. It's for ours. What do you mean, Tom? The heat is on. Those guys will be back. You think so? Sure. The next time they'll have a warrant. Where do we go? I don't know yet. What do we use for money? That part is easy. How? Mr. Griffin here is in the banking business. What do you mean by that? You're giving us some getaway dough. Oh, no. 
We need $5,000. We want it this afternoon. You're not getting it from me. Look, I'm letting you off easy. For five grand, you get rid of it. I'm getting rid of you the way I should have, right from the beginning. I'm going to call the FBI and tell them you're here. No, you're not. Keep away from that phone. Get out of my way. Not a chance. Uh, I will talk business again when he comes to. Uh, Jim. Oh, yes, Ken. I checked up on Ralph Griffin. Good. He's legitimate, all right. He works for one of the banks here in town. You get all the details in his background? Yes, I have them right here. Fine. Oh, uh... Anything there about his wedding? Here's a newspaper clipping on it. I got it from the morgue at one of the local papers. May I see it? Sure. Thanks. Ralph Griffin, prominent socialite, and his bride caught a baker. What's this all about, Jim? You remember that graduation picture I found in the rooming house in Richmond? Uh, yes. I brought it along in my briefcase. Yeah, here it is right here. Well? Compare it with this picture of Griffin's bride. Hey, it's the same girl. That's right. Now, let's see if this newspaper article tells us where the bride went to school. Um, there it is, Jim. State College. Yeah. Let's contact them at once and see what they can give us on a background. Should have a good deal of bearing on this case. Oh. Ralph. Ralph, dear. Huh? Don't try to move, darling. Just lie still. How is he doing? Please get away. Look, we have some business to take care of, remember? Leave him alone. They're coming too? Yeah. Oh, my my head. Just take it easy, Don. Ready to talk yet, Mr. Griffin? What? I'd like to know about that 5000 Oh, you're still here. Naturally. Now, how about that dough? I'm not giving it to you. Maybe you'd like another treat? Yeah. Keep away from him. We ain't got much time. How about it, mister? No. Okay. Wait! Yeah. I'll get you the money. Claudia. I can't let him hit you again. Where is the dough? In that desk. Claudia, come back here. Ralph, I've got to do this. No. Just stay put, mister. Let me go. Take it easy. <laughs> mister, you better do like he says. He'll only get hurt again. How are you coming with that dough? I'm getting it. Oh, Claudia, don't. Don't see what she's doing, Ruth. She's coming back now. Here. Here's your money. Swell. It's a little over 4000 That's all there is. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. We've got something to tend to first. Please go. And have you blow a whistle on us the minute we're out of the door? We ain't that stupid. I promise you we won't. That is worth exactly nothing. Claudia, he has a gun. That's right. I'm using it, too. No, wait! Hi! Hey. There we are, Dawson. The FBI. That's right. Ken! Ken, are you in there? Yes, yeah, stay put, everyone. Jim, can you open that window? Yeah. Yeah, I can manage. Ken! Ken, get his gun, will you? Yeah. Oh, I'm grateful that you're here, sir. Well, we came back because we checked at your wife's school. We learned there who her father was. That more or less explained everything. I'd say we returned just in time. For his wanton murder of the bank guard... Tom Dawson was tried and convicted on the charge of first-degree murder. For serving as his accomplice, Dawson's wife, Ruth, was sentenced to serve 20 years in the penitentiary. And thus, two people who had committed bank robbery, murder, and blackmail were stopped from pursuing their criminal careers. Because they changed their crimes and their patterns, they were difficult criminals to catch. But they were caught because your FBI does not discourage easily nor quickly. Once a criminal escaped and remained at large for 16 long years, but your FBI never closed the file on him. And in due time, that criminal, like the ones in tonight's case, Learn that so long as law enforcement agencies like your FBI are on the job, crime will forever be an unprofitable occupation. In just
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your Equitable Man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Hentech Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Hen Peck Swindler on This Is Your FBI. Here's a reminder. Daylight saving time starts next Sunday in many sections of the country. But regardless of which time zone you live in, this program will continue to be broadcast at the same time by your clock that you heard it today. There is $4,050 in Break the Bank's jackpot. Stay tuned now for radio's biggest money-paying show, Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has anyone ever phoned you to check up on the radio program you've got tuned in? It happens like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. The Equitable Society has a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. That's one great life insurance plan... So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Swindler. There is nothing remarkable about the fact that there are various classes of criminals. Because in any group of six million people, there would have to be different shadings of character and mentality. Rated on top are bank robbers, mob leaders, and killers. They are in the business of crime, and they engage in their work for profit. Their standing in the criminal community depends almost entirely on their degree of success. 
But there is one type of criminal to whom everyone else in the crime world looks up. Because he, or she, makes his living by his brains. And that criminal is the swindler. Tonight's FBI file opens aboard a transcontinental train that is heading westward. In the club car, a distinguished-looking gray-haired man is sipping a tall, cool drink. In a chair beside him, an attractive young woman dressed in black is nervously twisting her kerchief. Uh, I... I beg your pardon. Yes? Uh, could you tell me the time? Why, certainly. It's, uh, exactly 3.27. Is that central time? Oh, no, no, mountain time. We've just entered the new zone. Oh, oh that always confuses me. Well, that's very natural, my dear. Is this your first trip west? Oh, no, no, I lived in Colorado when I was a child. I haven't been back in years. I'm sure you'll enjoy your return. It's a glorious country. This, this is not a pleasure trip. Oh, oh, good heavens, please forgive me, dear child. I just noticed you were wearing mourning. Quite all right. Someone near and dear to your heart? My father. I'm sorry. You're uh, returning to the funeral? No, no, no. He died back east. I'm visiting his lawyer to settle the estate. I see. I sure wish I knew more about such things. Why, my dear? What's your problem? Well, here's a letter I received from the lawyer. I can't make any sense out of it. Here, see if you can. Surely. All that stuff there about options, mining properties. I just don't get it. Well, now, this is all quite clear. Such payment. Uh-huh. Uh, your father has the right to have the right to exercise his option on some rather valuable mining property. But uh, what's that stuff about $10,000? Well, that's what it will cost you if you care to exercise the option. Oh. Say, I see that this lawyer's in Colorado Springs. Yes, that's where I'm going. So am I. Oh? Oh, dear. That's the first call for dinner. I'm afraid I shall have to cut short this delightful chit-chat. Are you uh, walking back this way? Well, I'll follow you a few paces. My compartment is in this car. I think it's wonderful that we're both going to the same place. Indeed it is. I hope I'll run into you there. I'll be at the Central Hotel. If I can be of any assistance to you, give me a ring. But I don't know your name. Heavens, that's right. We neglected to introduce ourselves. I'm Colonel Lansing. I'm Rose Dixon. Pleasure, Miss Dixon. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is my compartment here. I'm afraid I shall have to say good day. Oh, well, good day, Colonel. I will call you. Splendid. Greetings, my love. Where have you been? I have just had a most delightful experience. Well? <laughs> a little lady just tried to promote me out in the lounge. <laughs> Is that wonderful? Someone playing me for a sucker? I'm not surprised. What do you mean? It's been so long since you've made a score yourself, you're beginning to look square. Now, Edith. I thought you were going to sit in the lounge to do some promoting yourself. I intended to, but the little lady's technique intrigued me. <laughs> look, you'd better get intrigued with making a buck for us. Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't get some action at Colorado Springs, I withdraw my financial support. Edith, what a ghastly thing to say before dinner. In the Denver field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is reading a teletype that has just come in. Jim, you looking oh. for me? Oh, yes, Carl. We've just been given an assignment. Oh, what is it? Well, most of the story's right here in this teletype. Let's go into the office here and review it, huh? Right. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks. Well, what have we got? A swindle, Carl. So far, it's been worked exclusively on transcontinental trains. Yes? And briefly, the operation is this. A young woman dressed in mourning clothes contacts victim on train. Victim is usually gullible male. Naturally. She explains that she's on way to settle father's estate. She flashes a letter which reveals that Pop has an option on some valuable mining property. I see. That's all that happens on the train. She and victim wind up in the same town. She contacts victim, says father has only left her $5,000, and she needs 10000 to exercise option. Will victim put up the additional five? Now, does a phony lawyer turn up? 
right. Girl and victim each give lawyer their 5000 and then swindling couple disappears. I remember a simpler operation when I worked out of Boston. I know. It's a pretty familiar pattern, Carl, but unfortunately it never is to the victim. And what's our assignment? Uh, those people here in town? No, but they're on their way. Chicago office sent this telecast. The couple boarded a train yesterday bound for here. Any description on it? Yes, very complete. What are they doing? Hey, the train arrives in half an hour. We should be getting down to the station right now. Is that you, Albert? Yeah. Well, gee, where have you been? I've been worried about you. When did you get here? About two hours ago. I thought you were going to meet me at the train. I didn't say anything of the kind. I told you to come right here to the hotel. Oh. Well, how'd you do? Okay. You promoted a guy? Yeah. He's a very nice man. What's his name? Oh, well, let's see now. I think it was Colonel Lansing. You think it was? Yeah. Oh, brother. I got it written down someplace. Did you show him the letter? Yeah. Did he go for it? Well, he said I could call him. Where? One of the hotels here. Which one? I got that one written down, too. Oh, how can anybody be this stupid? Please, Albert, don't start picking on me. Then why don't you tend to business? I am. Uh, you didn't even remember the guy's name or where he lived. Well, I can't remember everything. Do you know that you've messed up the last three suckers in a row? But I didn't. That little bird brain of yours is sending us right to the cleaners. <laughs> oh, now, don't start that. Well, I can't help it. Oh, Rose, will you cut it out? Well, then you stop being mean to me. Okay. Okay. Where's the paper with the guy's name and address? In my purse. Well, get it. We're calling him right now. Edith. Edith. What is it? Oh, oh I'm sorry, dear. I, I didn't know you were resting. What did you want? I just received a phone call. What's exciting about that? It was from that young dame who tried to promote me on the train. How did she know where to find you? Well, I told her I would be staying here. You mean you had the nerve... Well, now, just a minute. Let me explain. I'm familiar with her pitch. That's why I wanted her to call me. Look, when are you going to work? I am working. You what? Let me tell you this girl's proposition. She's using the option swindle. We each put up $5,000, give it to her lawyer. That old bromide. <laughs> Darling, I think we can put it to good use. What do you mean? Well, while she's so busy trying to get our 5000 I think I know a way to get hers. That's very unethical. Edith. There's enough legits around. We don't have to clip anybody in our own business. But she approached us. Money you get that way never does you any good. Look, you've been nagging me for weeks to get into action. Now that I've got a live proposition, you back down. I just don't like it. $5,000, my dear. A very tidy sum. Oh, I know. We can have it in our pockets before the day is over. What makes you think it would be that easy? Oh, they're completely vulnerable. We know their game. They don't even suspect us. What's the setup? <laughs> the girl asked me to meet her in front of her hotel. She said that she would then take me to see a Mr. Albert, a lawyer. <laughs> he lives at the hotel, too. And when does all this happen? One o'clock. Now, what do you say, darling? Remember, I guarantee results. You're to bring your own 5000 That's right. And who supplies that? Well, uh, you do, my dear. That I don't go for. Look, I merely use it to impress them. They never get their hands on my money. But I... Darling, this will be the quickest turnover we've ever made. Jim? No, I'm afraid not, Carl. Did you interview the conductor? Yes, I described the girl to him. He said he remembered her very well, but she got off the train at Colorado Springs. Well, how about the man who works with her? Well, the conductor didn't remember anyone answering to his description. I don't imagine he was on the train anyway. Well, why not? Well, their pattern in the past has been for her to work the train alone and meet him at whatever town they're using for the swindle. Oh, I see. However, the conductor did recall her talking to a very distinguished-looking gray-haired man in a club car. Uh oh You a victim? Could be. Carl, it looks as if we're going to have to take a quick trip to Colorado Springs. Colonel! Ah, there you are, my dear. 
Hello. I'm delighted to see you again, Miss Dixon. Thank you. Well, are you ready to go see my lawyer? Oh, not just yet, my dear. Let's let's tarry here in this delightful garden for a few more moments. Okay. Would you like to sit down? I'd love to. Did you bring the money? Yes, my dear. I have it right here. You see? Oh, swell. Have you your 5000 Oh, sure. Right here in my purse. Look. Splendid. You look very lovely today, my dear. Honest? I'm so glad that you called me. Really? I had hoped that we'd meet again. Gee. Miss Dixon. Uh, Colonel. Yes? Call me Rose. That would be a great privilege. Incidentally, uh, my given name is Frederick. Oh, that's cute. Rose, let's have lunch before we go to see your lawyer. There's something I want to talk to you about. Just a minute. Yes? Is your name Mr. Albert? That's right. You're a lawyer? Yes. Have you got a client named Rose Dixon? I have. Who are you? Well, my name is Lansing. I'm uh, looking for my husband, Colonel Lansing. I believe he had a date here with you earlier today. He had a date, all right, but he never showed up. What? Neither is my client. Wait a minute. What are you trying to pull? Pull? My husband came here with five grand. I tell you, he never arrived. Look, you might as well know this now. I'm hep to the fact you're running a store here. So is my husband. What are you talking about? We knew all about your swindle. That's our business, too. Now, what did you do with him? Look, for the last time, lady, I tell you that the guy didn't show. Well, then where is he? He's got my 5000 Well, if it's any consolation to you, Rose has got 5000 that belongs to me. Yes? Telegram. Just a second. Here. Thanks. Look, I want to... Quiet, know lady. I want to read this. It's got to be from Rose. She's the only one who knows I'm here. Yeah, it is from her. Listen to this. By the time you get this, Colonel Lansing's wife will probably be at your place looking for him. If she is there, here is a message from me and the Colonel for both of you. Drop dead. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women on the way up. Imagine yourself leaving your boss's office, walking on air. Thanks again, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, boy, a raise. And a chance to go to the home office. Oh, wait till I tell Peggy. Yes, I'm talking to that one man in ten who has confidence in himself and in his future. If you're that man, then be sure to get life insurance that's designed to order for you. Investigate the Equitable Society Special Life Insurance Plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now than they are today. You're talking my language, Mr. Keating. I'd like life insurance to take my future success into consideration. That's exactly what the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up does. It gives you these three advantages. First, it provides you and your family with needed protection right now. Second, this equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. can expand or contract as you see fit. That sounds like the plan for me. I'd like to look into it. Okay. Identify yourself as a man on the way up by asking your equitable society representative for full information on this plan. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Henpeck Swindler. The victims of the swindle in tonight's case from the files of your FBI could not go to the police and complain because they were criminals themselves. 
But this case does point up an important object lesson to every law-abiding citizen in the country. Every year, Americans are swindled out of hundreds of thousands of dollars by various types of confidence men. Confidence men who are more successful than they should be because the great majority of their victims do not report the crime to their local police. People who have been swindled keep the matter a personal secret because they feel that to make it public would subject them to ridicule. But those victims do not realize that by their silence, they enable the swindler to carry on his career. So your FBI wishes to pass on this bit of advice. If it should be your misfortune to become the victim of a swindle, immediately do your part in stopping the swindlers from working on anyone else. Notify your local police. Tonight's file continues in a hotel lobby in Colorado Springs. Special Agent Taylor is standing near the newsstand as his fellow agent, Carl Maywood, approaches. Oh, uh, Jim. Uh, oh, Carl. Did you come up with something here? Yes, I've just spoken to the manager, Carl. I described the man we're looking for. He recognized him as someone who checked in two days ago. I see. This man described himself as a lawyer. He engaged in the joining room for a girl who arrived last night. But did the manager see her? Yes. She was wearing morning clothes. Well, this certainly sounds like we came to the right place. Yes. And then this morning, the so-called lawyer withdrew $5,000 that he'd been keeping in the hotel safe. If they're about to use the cash, then they're approaching the kill. Right. Where are they now? They're both out. Mm, too bad we can't find out who the victim is. I have an idea. It's that man she was talking to on the train. At least one of the bellhops saw the girl out in the garden this noon, talking to a distinguished-looking gray-haired man. You know, Jim, they may be out permanently. Yes, that may be. In fact... If they've already scored, they may be on their way out of town. Yes, I know, Carl. Look, you drive over to the railroad station, see if they've bought transportation. I'll hop down and get a search warrant to examine their rooms. How'd you make out? I just talked to the ticket seller. Well? You say your husband is tall, gray-haired, a flowing mustache? That's him. Well, he bought two tickets for San Francisco. A woman who looked like my wife, Rose, was with him. San Francisco, huh? Oh, that's right. Now, where would he go when he got there? Have you any idea? Now, look, this is important. Don't you want to get your dough back? Wait a minute. Huh? I just remembered something. We're not going to San Francisco. <laughs> Yes, Frederick? Another bonbon? Tea, thanks. Mmm. You know something, my dear? What? I can't tell you how pleased I am about us. I think I know what you mean. Nobody picking on us, huh? Exactly. <laughs> I sure would have liked to have seen Albert's face when he got that wire. <laughs> <laughs> I think Edith would have been an interesting study, too. <laughs> you know, Albert used to all the time tell me how stupid I was. Really? Yeah. He used to say that I did everything wrong. <laughs> Edith's complaint was that I never did anything. So uh, we take them both for $10,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frederick. Yes, my love? Do you think I'm stupid? Of course. I wouldn't have you be anything else. That's the sweetest thing I ever heard. <laughs> Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. Where are you? Down at the railroad station. I searched the swindler's room. It looks like they've checked out. I found that out down here. No, oh, how? The girl was here earlier today, accompanied by a tall, gray-haired man. Hmm? From his description, it sounded more like the victim than the other swindler. Yes. They bought two tickets for San Francisco over two hours ago. I see. About an hour later, a male half of the swindling team turned up here. Uh -huh. The ticket seller said he was very anxious to find out about the girl, and he acted quite upset when he heard he'd missed her. Carl, did he buy a ticket, too? No. It sort of looks like she's run out with a victim, don't you think, Jim? Well, he isn't exactly a victim. Well, what do you mean? I checked with the police, gave them the gray-haired man's description, hoping to save him from being taken. They tell me he's an old-time swindler himself, that they have a warrant for his arrest on an old charge. So it looks like some sort of double cross is in the works, Carl. Yeah. Look, now that our original team is separated, I think we should concentrate on tracking down the girl. 
At least we know she's headed for San Francisco. Now, she'll have to change at Denver, so I'll call our office and have them pick her up. Chauffeur to take it easy, will you? Okay. Drives him. He's up on the turns, will you? How much further to Denver? Oh, I'd say about another 20 miles. How long did you rent this car for? Just for the day. Look, what makes you think that Rose and your husband will be in Denver? My husband is a creature of habit. He always follows the same pattern. So? So, whenever he's been hot in the past, he always bought a ticket to some far-off place, and then he'd get off at the first stop along the way. Well, supposing he still does that. Denver's a big city. He'll still follow his pattern. He always stops at the same hotel. I know the one he'll go to in Denver. Oh, I hope so. Look, our happy little families will be reunited before the day is over. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Oh, come on in, Carl. Hotel manager let me use his office. Did you get the call through? To our office? That's right. I've already gotten a reply. And did they get the girl off the train? No, they were too late. Did she get on the San Francisco train? No. Nope. That puts us right back where we started. I know, but inasmuch as we've lost track of her, I think we should concentrate now on the other half of the team. Oh. Well, I have an idea, Carl. Now, here's what I think we should do. Yes, Frederick. Well, how do you like your new quarters? Oh, this is a wonderful room. I'm just across the hall, so you can always feel that I'm nearby. Well. Mm. Tired? Mm, no, not really. I'd like to get a good night's rest, though, because I want to get up early and do lots of shopping. I had the very same thing in mind. Would you believe it? Edith didn't buy me as much as a necktie in the past three years. Albert was just as stingy. Well, you can rest assured that we were... Oh, that must be the drinks I ordered. Just a moment. Hello, sucker. Edith. Surprised? Uh, what are you doing here? Now, what do you think? Where's my wife? Oh, why, she? Frederick, she's... who is it? It's me, Rose. <gasps> your husband, remember? Oh, golly. Well, get out of the way and let us in. Well, now, now, just a minute. Stand but... aside. How did you know where we were? Oh, that was a cinch, sweetheart. I knew this husband of mine would be lazy enough to follow the same old pattern. And I knew you'd be stupid enough to go along with it. Frederick, what do we do? Well, I... Uh, well, I... for openers... You're giving us back our dough. Oh, no. Come on, get it up, both of you. Now, see here, this whole thing is very unethical. Quit stalling. Give us our dough. Sorry to intrude on this little family party. Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? We've been looking for all four of you for months on charges of violating the National Stolen Property Act. How did you know where to find us? I found you because of your husband. I knew he was looking for you, so I checked all means of transportation out of Colorado Springs. When I found he had hired a car, the rest was easy. Well, Albert? Huh? Who's stupid now? All four suspects were sentenced to long terms in a federal prison for violating the National Stolen Property Act. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI, which closed the careers of all four notorious criminals, illustrates again the great value of the training received by every special agent before he becomes a qualified member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. During that period of training, the potential special agent is taught how to evaluate bits of information and also taught that the second investigation of any clue will often turn up some information that was not available the first time. Because of that training and that diligence, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has become one of the most successful law enforcement agencies in the world. And that should make you proud. Because this governmental organization belongs to you. It is your FBI. <laughs> In 
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. Or how much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Wayward Brothers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wayward Brothers on This Is Your FBI. Last week, $4,050 was won on Break the Bank. Stay tuned as contestants try for another fabulous jackpot on Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. C, the American Broadcasting Company. C, the American Broadcasting Company. C, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Would you know what to say if your telephone should ring like this? Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Uh, just last Wednesday, my Equitable representative told me about a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Believe me, that's one great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Wayward Brothers. It is the business of your FBI to investigate crime. And in the carrying out of that business, it is necessary that they know as much as possible about the habits of the criminal. Because crime prevention is also a part of the work done by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A recent study undertaken by your FBI revealed a fact which will seem odd to those of you who are law-abiding citizens. There are seasons in crime. Seasons just as there are in every other business. During the winter months, the criminal concentrates on crimes against property. Crimes like auto theft, armed robbery, and arson. 
But in the spring and summer months, in this season of the year, the criminal's fancy turns to people, and the fashion is to commit crimes against the person. Crimes like extortion, kidnapping, and murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small private plane that's flying over the desert wasteland of one of our southwestern states. A young man is seated at the controls of the plane. He speaks to a girl who sits beside him. Sue? Yes, honey? See that mesa down there on the left? Yes. That's our landmark. Oh. Twenty minutes more and we're at the ranch. I'm kind of sorry to hear that. I've really enjoyed this flight so much. Well... I hope you'll enjoy the ranch, too. Well, of course I will. Ned. Hmm? There's something I think I'd better tell you right now. Well? It's about your mother and dad. Ned, I... I'm scared to death about meeting them. <laughs> Are you kidding? Why, they're the sweetest guys you'll ever... Oh, I, I know all that. But, well, you're their only son... We're engaged. And they'll love it. I hope so. Oh, Susie, baby, will you please? Hey. It's trouble, honey? I don't know. Yeah. We got trouble. What do we do? Oh, just stay where you are, honey. Keep calm. I will. I don't think this motor's coming back. We're now at about 800 feet. I'm going to try to set it down easy. Well, you've got plenty of landing fields. Miles and miles of desert. Yeah, it isn't as flat as it looks from here. Well, if we're lucky, we'll hit a good spot. I see. Tighten your safety belt, Sue. Sure. I'm afraid we're losing altitude too fast. I'm going to try to set it down right. If I could just level her off a little more. Ned, we're going to crash. Easy, baby. Ned! Ned! <laughs> Slim. Whoa, boy. There. There's the airplane. I told you I'd seen it fall. Yeah. Let's have a look at it. It plowed into the sand pretty deep. Yeah. Do you think there's people in it, Chuck? I don't know. Well, let's have a look. Oh, it stayed in one piece anyway. Yeah. Uh, this looks like a door right here. I'll, I'll try it. Anybody in there? Yeah. Yeah, there's two of them. A man and a female. Alive? Well, I'll see. The man's breathing. That shows the female. Anything else in there? I'm just looking around. Wait. Here's some bags. I'll pass them on out to you. Okay. Here you are. Here's one of them. Right. And uh, here. Here's the other. Oh, I got it. What about the people? What about them? Don't you want to search them before we go through the bags? Nope. Why not? Well, I'm lifting the people out, too. What for? So as we can tend to them. What's got into you? Nothing. Why don't we take what we can here and just leave them be? Take a look at them bags, Slim. They cost plenty. So does a private airplane. So what? Well, these folks must be worth money. We'll get lots more out of being nice to them. I don't go along with that. Nobody's asking you to, Slim. That's just how we're doing it. Now, give me a hand. Some 50 miles away from the scene of the plane crash in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is about to leave on an assignment. Say, hey, Jim. Oh, yes, Pat. Where are you going? Following up a report that just came in from the Indian agent down in Tevis. What about? Well, there was a murder committed on the reservation last night. A man's body was found early this morning. What's the story? Well, the victim was an archaeologist. His name was Adams. 
He came in from the east about three weeks ago. He planned to spend the summer on the reservation. I see. Did he work alone? Yes. How was he killed? Stabbing. Was he in a fight? I don't know, Pat. There hasn't been much evidence collected to date. When was he last seen? Yesterday afternoon. He was believed to have been in the company of two other men. Any idea who they were? Oh, not yet. But I think we have the motive, all right. What is it? Robbery. I understand that it was generally known that this man Adams carried quite a bit of cash. Oh. And when his body was found, his effects were pretty well ransacked. But ironically enough, the thieves never did find his money. How was that? Well, he wore it in a belt around his waist, and his assailant didn't search him that closely. Well, Jim, these two men that Adams was riding with sound like pretty good suspects. Pat, I can give you a better answer to that after I've been down there. Take it easy, mister. Huh? Just lie still. Where... Where am I? In a cabin. My... My leg. I think it's busted. How did... Wait. Where's Sue? Well, where is she? The uh, gal who was in the plane with you? Yes. She's right in the next room. How is she? Still passed out. What's wrong? I is she injured? What is it? I don't know. Help me up. I'll, I'll go in. <laughs> I told you that leg was busted. Uh, who's with Sue? Is anyone taking care of her? No. Nope. Well, why not? Look, we took you both from the airplane. Wasn't that enough? Oh, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I I'm very grateful, too. No. Okay. Is this your cabin? No, but we're staying in it. Where's my plane? About uh, ten miles from here. How far from a town are we? About thirty miles. Who else is here besides yourself? My brother, Chuck. Have you a car? No. Horses. What? Could one of you go into town at once? What for? A doctor. The young lady who is with me must need one. It looks as though I do, too. Well, I'll see what my brother says. Where is he? Outside. Oh, oh, please, call him in here. I'll talk to him first. Tell him I'll pay him well for his trouble. I'll tell him. I'll be back. Is that you, Slim? Yeah. Well, how are they? The fellas come, too. Oh? He asked me to come out and talk to you. What for? He wants that one of us should go into town for a doctor. Did you tell him how far it was? Yeah. He said he'd pay you well for your trouble. How much? I didn't ask. You been going through the bag? Uh, yeah. Find anything? Well, no dough, but I've been reading these letters. This fellow's family's real rich. Where are they located? On a ranch, 30-odd miles from here. You gonna talk to him about getting a doctor? Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk. Don't forget, he said he'd pay. So then, he's gonna pay plenty. Hello, Pat. Hi, Jim. Pick up anything down Terrace? Yes, I was lucky enough to find the knife that the killer used. There were several good prints on the handle. Say, what about the two men on horseback? Oh, I just got a general description on them, Pat. Nothing really worthwhile. I'm going to get these prints off to the laboratory at once. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? I'm sending out a set of prints myself. No? What on? Well, a call came in right after you left this morning. A family named Robinson. Hmm. They had a ranch about 20 miles out of town. They reported that their son had left Denver yesterday in his own plane. His fiancée was with him. And the plane was to arrive at the ranch early last evening. After it was several hours overdue, searching parties were sent out. I see. Early this morning, the plane was spotted from the air. The pilot landed, examined young Robinson's plane, and found it empty. Well? He noticed, however, that there were bloodstains in the cabin and numerous prints of horses' hooves around the plane. He returned and reported this to the boy's family. But where did Robinson's plane land? On the uh, Indian reservation. That's oh. why the family called here. Did you go out and look it over? Yep. Yeah. You find anything? Just the fingerprints I mentioned before. Well, Pat, I wouldn't say that either one of us had an easy assignment, so let's go to work. Good 
Go on in, Slim. Okay. Hey, where is he? Huh? He was stretched right out there on that bunk. He's gone. Well, now, he didn't come out. We was right by the door. Yeah, but... Oh, he's probably in the next room with his girlfriend. But he couldn't walk. That leg of his. Yeah, he got in here all right. See? Yeah. Mister, this here is my brother. Oh. Hi. I thought you couldn't walk. I couldn't. I sort of dragged myself in here. I knew my fiancée would need me. She's still out? Yes, what about a doctor? Will you get one? Well, uh, that sort of depends, mister. On what? On uh, what it's worth to you. Well, that's unimportant. Name your price. Okay. Uh, $10,000. What? You heard me. What? That's sheer robbery. If that's how you feel, mister, you don't have to pay... We don't have to get no doctor. Look, now, look. You can see for yourself this girl is desperately in need of help. Mm-hmm. Oh, please be reasonable. She's your girl, mister. Why don't you help her? Sure. Go get the doctor yourself. Oh, you know that's impossible. You know I can just barely move. Then it looks like you better pay. I haven't got it. You can get it easy enough. Just write a note to your family. I happen to know their ranch is nearby. Tell them to put up the money. Slim here can deliver the note. Oh, they wouldn't stand for anything like that. Then I guess the girl don't get no doctor. Look, you have horses here. I'll go into town myself. No, oh, you just stay put. No, let go of me. Let me get out. Oh, no. No. When he comes to Slim, he'll ride his family. <laughs> We'll reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to people on the way up. To the man who will soon phone his wife to tell her good news like this. Listen, honey. I've just seen the Acme Company. They've offered me the job. And boy, what an increase in salary. Yes, that's one of the great moments of life. And when it happens to you, when you finally achieve the success you're working and planning for, make sure you have life insurance designed to order for you. Right now, investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now than they are today. Does that mean that this Equitable plan is flexible, considers both my present and my future? Exactly right. And that's just one of several advantages of this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. Can expand or contract as you see fit. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. How can I get the whole story? The easiest way is to get in touch with your equitable society representative. Phone him as soon as possible and ask him for full details on the equitable plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Wayward Brothers. As you have seen aptly illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reasoning with the criminal mind, for there is neither logic nor compassion in the makeup of the criminal. The human being has no dignity as an individual to the criminal because he has chosen to live his life outside the conventions set up and obeyed by his fellow beings. That lack of regard for his fellow man is the basic reason for the lack of success of every criminal. For one thing is as true in crime as it is in every other field of life. 
And that is that unless we have a common and mutual loyalty, we are doomed. Because no one person is entirely self-sufficient. To rephrase that point, which the criminal can never understand, we are indeed our brother's keeper. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk reading a laboratory report. Finishing it, he jumps excitedly to his feet and calls out. Pat! Oh, Pat! Yeah, Jim? Come on in here a minute, will you? Charlie. What do you want? Take a look at this report that just came in from the laboratory. On the fingerprints you sent? On the prints we both sent them. They're identical, Pat. What? Yes, they both belong to the same man. Well, what do you know? Who is it? A man named Charles Elgin, also known as Chuck Elgin. What's his background? He was arrested about 12 years ago for a bank job. He's also been in trouble with local police in several states. I see. He's always worked with his brother. His name is John Elgin, also known as Slim. Then they could be the two men who were seen with Adams that afternoon before he was murdered. I would think so, yes. I've got a complete description here on both of them. They must have come across the disabled plane. Yes. And they undoubtedly took young Robinson and his girlfriend along with them. Right. Say, does that report have anything on where they can be found, where they live? No, but they're from these parts originally. The local police can probably help us on that. Yeah. Pat, I'll send out an alarm on these men. Good. While you're doing that, I'll run over and talk to the police. Oh, how is it, Chuck? Oh, coming around. Hand me that dipper of water. Sure. His girlfriend was just moaning a little. I think she's coming around, too. Uh, leave her alone in there. I don't want him to see her again until he writes the note. Okay, give me that water. Here. Oh, please, please. Yeah, uh, that done it. I... Oh, I'm still here. Yeah, that's right. Where's Sue? We moved you out of her room. Is she still unconscious? Yeah. Look, won't you listen to reason? Please, go and get a doctor. I I told you before, we'd be glad to. You still want $10,000? That's right. Feel like writing that note now, mister? Look, I... Time's passing, you know. Okay. I'll write it. Well... That's better. You got a pencil, Slim? Yeah. No paper, though. Well, there's a bag over there. Go get it. Right. What will I say in the note? I'll tell you what to write. Well, here's the bag. Okay. Now, you can write it right there on the floor. Here. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> dear folks. Some good people saved my life. I'm staying with them. Got that okay? Uh-huh. Uh, what's your girl's name? Sue. Then say, uh, me and Sue are okay. I want to pay these good people for helping me. Give the man who brings this note $10,000. You got all that? This note, ten. Uh-huh. Then say, uh, he will tell you, uh, let you know where we are. And don't tell the police about this. Then sign your name. But what about the doctor? When they pay the dough, you'll get one. But the whole purpose of writing this note is to get a doctor. No! Look, just sign your name. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Pat. Oh, yes, Pat. How did you make out? Well, I spent most of the afternoon here at police headquarters. Been trying to get some line on the Elgin brothers. Any luck? Well, someone reported seeing them down near Tevis the day before yesterday. I see. And they do have horses. The police say they know the desert country like a book. Well, then they must be hiding out in that wasteland somewhere. We... Oh, excuse me, Pat. Yep. Hold on a second when your message just came in. Right. Hey. Hey, Pat. Looks like we may be getting some action. What is it? This message is from Robinson's parents. They just received a phone call from a man who claimed he's got a note from their son. Really? Yes. He told them he'd be right out to see them. Pat, I'd better get right over to their ranch. What happened, Jim? 
Well, I've had a busy two hours. Did you get out to Robinson's ranch in time? In time to wait. What do you mean? The man who called him never showed up. Oh, that's too bad. It was one of the Ocean brothers, all right. How do you know? Well, when the man didn't appear, I questioned the Robinsons about the phone conversation. They recall that he said he was telephoning from a blacksmith shop. Yeah? Well, there was only one blacksmith in their village, so I went over there. Yeah, I see. The blacksmith told me that Elgin had left his horse there to be shod and said he'd be back in about an hour. When was all this? About two hours ago. Did Elgin return? Yes, he came back in five minutes. The blacksmith said he seemed highly nervous. Elgin urged him to finish the job quickly, and as soon as it was done, he rode away. Did the blacksmith learn where he was going? No, but he did say he had a 30-mile ride. Oh, that doesn't tell us much. Pat, it could if he hasn't had too much of a start. I've got an idea. Now, this is what I think you Sue. Sue, darling. Why? It's all right, baby. I'm right here with you. Huh? I'm right beside you, darling. Oh, Ned. Oh, baby. Ned, where... Where are we? We're going to be okay, honey. But the plane... What happened? Well, after we cracked up, two men came along. Took us here to this cabin. Oh. You... You passed out for a while. That's all. Oh, Ned, what, what's happened to you? I, I hurt my leg a little, that's all. Oh, Ned. There's a doctor coming soon. We'll both be tended to. But what about me? Wait. Well, she come too, huh? Yes. What about your brother? Oh, he's coming back. I just seen him riding down the hill. Alone? Yep. No, Doctor? Look, that happens after the payoff, remember? Oh, what's he talking about? Nothing, honey. Well, what does he mean, payoff? I'll I'll explain it all to you later. Doc! Doc! I'm in here! Well, how'd you make out? No good. What, what happened? Wouldn't they pay? I never delivered the note. Why not? I've seen this newspaper before I went there. Look. What is it? Our picture's right on the front page. Before? Knocking that guy off. The FBI found out we'd done it. Oh, we got to blow out of here, Chuck. Fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about them? They stay here. Ned, what's this all about? These men wanted money. $10,000. Why? So you could get out of here alive, sweetheart. And we didn't get it. You still can't leave us here like this. I ain't going to. But you just said... I said I was leaving you here. I didn't say how. Chuck, we're wasting time. I know. Wait a minute. What are you going to do? What do you think? Put away that gun. Only after I'm done with it. But Ned... Shut up. Get it over with, will you? Okay. Drop that gun, Elgin. Huh? Drop it! Ah! Oh. Now, raise your hands, both of them. Who are you? I'm from the FBI. Oh, thank heaven. How'd you get here? We knew you had a 30-mile ride. And as much as planes travel faster than horses, we circled in a 30-mile radius until we picked up your trail. All right, Pat. Let's get these people out of here. Chuck Elgin and his brother Slim were both tried and found guilty of murder on a government reservation and sentenced to execution. The manner in which these criminals were caught illustrates how little chance the criminal has competing against the forces of law and order. For in this case, the criminals used horses and your FBI employed an airplane. With every field of science at their disposal, the various agencies of law enforcement, your local police, your state troopers, and the special agents of your FBI have cut the chances for criminal success down to the barest minimum, have proved again and again that crime is always an unprofitable career. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. Or how much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station, 
to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Professional Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor is played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The professional killer on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned now as contestants try for an amazing $2,000 jackpot on radio's biggest money-paying quiz show, Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Do you own your own home? Is there a mortgage on it? Be sure to listen to the special message to homeowners from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. In just 14 minutes, you'll hear about America's finest plan for home ownership. It's the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Don't miss it. Tonight's FBI file, The Professional Killer. Your FBI not only pursues every criminal who violates a federal statute, but it also makes a close, keen, analytical study of the field of crime all over the nation. For crime is the business your FBI is engaged in. And like every successful organization, it realizes that the more it knows about its business, the better job it'll be able to do. With that in mind, your FBI recently completed a study of crime throughout the 48 states. And the study brought forth one fact that is not only shocking, but is also indicative of the self-evident truth that the crime wave, unless stifled quickly will soon be out of hand. That one single fact is that in the United States today and every day, there are 36 people murdered. In the past two hours, three people have been killed by criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small, smart nightclub located in a large Midwestern city. In an office from the rear of this establishment, Larry Mansfield, the owner of the club, is just greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. West. Okay. You use cigars? No. When did you get to town? A couple of hours ago. Well, you, you made good time. I want to get out just as quick. Very well. We'll get right down to business. Good. Are you familiar with this town? Not very. Do you know where the Central Hotel is? No, but I'll find it. It's over on the west side. It's a small hotel. You may have... Can to... a cab get there? Yes. You get the directions. Just give me the address. Okay. Here it is. All right. 
party I want taken care of lives in the Central Hotel, room 819. Uh -huh. uh, here's the key. What's the party's name? Sanford. Sanford. Get it. Uh, West. Yeah. How do you intend to handle the killing? Why? Well, I just thought in as much as this is a hotel you're going Mr. to... Mr. Mansfield, let's get something straight, huh? You own this nightclub, don't you? Yes. Am I telling you how to run it? No. It don't tell me how to run my business. Uh, sorry. What about Doe? I'll pay when the job is done. And come back here tomorrow night. I don't want to wait around that long. What's the matter with tomorrow morning? I won't be here. Oh, where do you live? I'll come there. All right. Here's my card. Thanks. Well, guess it's time I went to work. Sweetheart. Who, who are you? That don't matter. Well, how look, did you get... look. I got a gun here. Let me ask the questions. Go ahead. You live in this room? Yeah. What's your name? Sanford. Well, where's your husband? I don't have one. Well, where's your brother then, your father? That's a blank, too, mister. Well, who else lived in this room with you? Nobody. You live here alone? Yeah. This is no shit. Where are you going? I'm getting out of here. Wait a minute. Out of my way. I want to ask you one question. Well. Who sent you here? Nobody. Look, honey, I've been around. I know a hired gunsel when I see one. What is that? Yes, that is your touch, right? You're right. Now tell me who paid you to come here. No dice. Was it a guy named Mansfield? Was it? We've had my business. We always protect a client. Oh, I know it was Mansfield. I should have figured he'd make this kind of a place. Look, what difference does it make who it was? You come off lucky, didn't you? Yeah. And forget it. Now, let me get out of here. Wait a minute. One more question. What now? You were paid to get rid of me. Why didn't you do it? Look, I don't... I want to know. I don't kill James. Do you uh, buy dame's drinks? Sometimes. I'm awful thirsty. In the same city, a bit later that evening, in the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from an assignment. Jim. Oh, yes, Neil. The call came in for you less than five minutes ago. I took the message. Oh, what was it? Interstate bus company. Oh, yeah. The driver you wanted to see is out of town. He'll come over to see you first thing in the morning. Oh, good. What are you working on? Well, it's kind of a strange assignment, Neil. Well, what's the story? Well, a thief named Lou Palmer was convicted two years ago for sticking up a bank messenger. Over $78,000 was stolen on that job. Hmm. And the money was never recovered. I see. A few days ago, Palmer sent word to the warden at State's prison that he wanted to give some information as to the whereabouts of the money. What brought that on? Well, it turned out to be revenge. Palmer revealed that he had two Confederates on the job, a man and a woman. They evidently promised to take care of Palmer's family out of the loop. When they reneged, he talked. Who were these people? Well, the man's name was Larry Kent. The woman, she was Kent's girl. Her name was Vi Sanford. And you're looking for them? That's right. What progress have you made? Well, we've established that Kent and his girl were living in Cleveland at the time of the robbery. Immediately after it, Kent disappeared. Well, what about the Sanford girl? Well, she stayed on there. Evidently, Kent had walked out on her. She was living in a cheap room and working as a cashier in a restaurant. Kent apparently wound up with all the money. That's it. Has the girl been picked up? No, she left Cleveland two days ago, believed to be headed for here. I see. And from what we could gather, she's looking for Kent. She'd been tipped off that he was here. Jim, do you know where to find her? No, not yet. This bus driver I sent for may help us on that, though. She was on his bus. You alerted the local police? Yes, I gave them the girl's picture, and they're starting a check on all hotels now. We should get something on her very soon. Oh, 
Oh, Phil, I could go on for hours with all the details, but that's more or less the story. Sounds like a nice guy. Oh, charming. Look, baby, when he walked out on you, didn't he leave you any part of that 78000 No. How about the guy in the can? Did he do anything for him? Lee Palmer? Yeah. Not a nickel's worth. <laughs> Phil, can we have another drink? Yeah, sure, honey. A waiter, let's have the same thing. Right. Why, how did you tell him here? Well, like I told you, I was a cashier in this joint in Cleveland. Yeah. An old-time grifter came in one night and slipped me a note when he paid his check. Uh-huh. A note said he'd seen Kent in this town, that he was using his old name. That's Mansfield. Oh. It also said he was doing what he always wanted to do. Well, I knew that meant he was operating a nightclub. So? So I called him up joints till I finally nailed him. He must have been real surprised, huh? Plenty. Well, did you ask him for your cut? Oh, of course. He said he'd bring it to me tonight. Instead, he sent you. He did send you, didn't he? Yeah. I knew it. Are you sorry? Not now. Hey, you are. Just set him down. Right. Phil. Yeah, baby. How much was he paying you? For knocking you off? Hmm. Five bills. Did you collect? No. You know, he owes me a pretty good chunk. My end of that job was over 20,000. Solid numbers. If you'll take a marker, how would you like to work for me? Baby, you just made yourself a deal. Oh, morning, Neil. Talk to the bus driver? Yes, he just left here. Did he give you anything? Well, I showed him the Sanford girl's picture, and he definitely identified her. Said she'd come in on his bus all right. Mm, did he have any idea where she went? Oh, unfortunately, he didn't. Uh, these pictures just came in, Jim. No, oh, what are they? Pictures of Kent. Oh, fine. Washington also sent a copy of his record. Swell, Miss Kent. Sure, here you are. Thanks. I read it through. There's nothing there at all to indicate where he's been for the last two years. No, I didn't imagine there would be. After all, he wound up with that 78000 and that's enough for a man to retire on for a few years, at least. Mm. Do you think he's gone into some legitimate business? Mm, could have. Well, even if he's here in town, he won't be easy to find. Probably changed his name, even his appearance. Yes, I know. Jim, I sent Kent's pictures and a copy of his record to the local police. They might have something on him. Fine, I sure hope so. Oh, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes, that's right. Wait, I'll, I'll write that down. Okay. Good work, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Well, Neil, we're getting some action. What, Jim? That was police headquarters. The Sanford girl is registered at the Central Hotel. I think I'd better get right over there. get into my apartment. You told me to come here. Not while I was out. I don't like to hang around in hallways. I don't like intruders. That makes a saving. Did you go to the Central Hotel last night? Yeah. Well? Well, what? Did you take care of that party? No. Huh? Why not? You didn't tell me it was a dame. What difference does that make? That's out of my line. Look, I made a deal with you. I got a better offer. What do you mean? Better let me tell him, Phil. Why? Hello, Larry. Why? Where did you come from? Mr. West brought me here. What? He's in a brand new business. Now he brings him back alive. What's this all about? Give him a rundown, baby. Sure. Mr. West here is working for me now. Now, look. I told him our whole story, Larry. He figures that I'm a lot more reliable to do business with. What are you talking about? $78,000. $78,000. Huh? That's the amount you ran out with. Remember? 
Now, Vi, in the Save first the place... Save the alibis. We haven't got time for that. We haven't got time for any chatter. We just came here to collect. Collect what? My end. I figured it out on the way over. It comes to $26,000. This whole thing's ridiculous. I want my cut, Larry, now. You're not getting anything. Mister. you're in no position to talk that way. You keep out of this. i got to protect my interests. I'm on the payroll. Get out of here, both of you. Bill, show him we mean business, huh? Sure, baby. Now, wait a minute. A few more treatments, honey. He'll collect. <laughs> Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home. The home of my own. That's what I've worked and saved for all these years. My home, my family. If home means a lot to you, then investigate the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver... It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. A home saver, you say? That's right. Just listen to these four advantages of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. First, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Second, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Third, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. You mean my wife would inherit our home free and clear? Yes, she would, and interest charges stop the day of death. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an Equitable Society Assured Home Ownership Plan. Who can tell me if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I... T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Professional Killer. many times have you heard the expression, there is honor among thieves? Probably a thousand times. But next time you hear it, you'll know that it is not true. For as proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, criminals do not base their actions on loyalty, but on profit. They're always available to the highest bidder. The tragic thing is that they never learn that man cannot live alone without friendships and alliances. For what is true of nations is also true of people. And if the last war proved nothing else, it proved beyond doubt that every nation is dependent upon every other nation and that every person on earth is dependent in some measure on every other living human being. The night's file continues in Larry Mansfield's apartment. Mansfield, still unconscious, is stretched out on the floor. The erstwhile girl, Vi Sanford, and her gunman confederate are searching the premises. Did you find anything in that desk, honey? No, not yet. Not see what's in this drawer. It's going to be a wall safe behind one of these pictures. Oh, this is full of nothing but letters. Why, that dirty chief. These letters are from Dames. Nice. Look at this. This letter was written three years ago. I was still going with him then. My darling Larry, our date last night will be remembered always. How do you like that guy? Stop being a female with your work to do. Look, there's no uh, dough on his uh, desk. Where else can uh, we... Wait a minute. He's coming, too. Uh, 
You better watch him. Yeah, we can right beside him. Okay. How do we handle it now? We find out where his dough is. Otherwise, he gets a full treatment. Good. What? What hit me? You were standing right on the track, mister. Oh. Next time, you won't get off so easy. Can, can I get up? Stay where you are. Larry, we want to continue our discussion. Before you left us, we were talking about $26,000. I, I don't know. The girl wants her money, mister. But I, I tell you... Look, I... let me tip you off. From now on, I use a gun. I'll get it up. I... I haven't got it here. Where is it? In my office at the club. Where in the office? In a safe. Okay. I want you to call the club. Tell them I'm coming over. Tell them I'm getting something out of that safe to bring back to you. Very, very well. How about the combination? I, I'll give it to her. Let me have it now. <laughs> Jim. I'm right down here, Dale. I've been looking all over for you. The hotel manager said you were on the floor below. Oh. Did you get a search warrant? Yeah, I have it right here. Good. This is the Sanford girl's room. I have a pass key. No sign of her, Jim? No, she left the hotel early this morning. Hasn't returned since. There was a man with her. He didn't answer to Kent's description. There we are. Go ahead, Neil. Right. I thought it might be a good idea to search your room and see if we get any leads. Now, there's a small bag over there. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I'll take a look at it. I'll see what's in that closet. All right. Did the management give you any line on what she's been doing? No, not much. He said she'd made quite a few phone calls. He's getting the slips together now. We'll pick them up on the way out. Yeah, uh, nothing in this closet. Wait a minute, Neil. I got something here. No, what is it? It's a note. What's it say? Well, it's addressed to her from a man who signs himself Joe. Yes? It says that he saw Kent here. Kent is using his old name. Uh-huh. It also states that he's doing what he always wanted to do. Doing what he always wanted to do. That's it. Well, that really confuses things. <laughs> All we have to do now is find out Kent's old name and what this thing is that he's always wanted to do. <laughs> yes. But Neil Sanford girl must know both these things. Well, in that case, Jim, she's probably already found him. Yes, I know, which means she may never come back here. Neil will post someone here to watch for her anyway. Let's go down and pick up the slips of the telephone calls that she made. <laughs> Why don't you put that gun away? It makes me nervous. I'd be nervous without it. You handled me quite effectively before without a gun. You didn't know the score, then. Hmm. Uh, tell me something, will you? What is it? Why did you double-cross me? What do you mean? You started out in this deal working for me. Why did you switch? I didn't like the way you operate. Is that the only reason? Yeah. I thought it could have been because you got a better offer. It had nothing to do with it. What has she promised you? What's it to you? I'd like to enter my bid. I don't get it. If I were to top her offer, maybe you'd come back to my team. Mister, that's just why I can't do business with you. <sighs> okay. Can we have a drink? Yeah, I guess so. Now, there's some scotch in the cabinet there. Would you get it? Where? On the lower shelf. I don't see any. <coughs> well, that ties the score. Hey, Jim. Oh, yes, Neil. The warden of the state's prison just called me back. And? He questioned Lou Palmer about Kent. Did he come up with anything? No, he had no idea what Kent's old name was. How about that business he always wanted to be in? He knew nothing about that either. Oh, I see. How are you making out? Well, I've combed through Kent's record. That didn't give us anything. Any word from the hotel? No, I just called there five minutes ago. The girl still hasn't returned. Excuse me, Jim. Oh, yes, Bob. Here's a report on those telephone numbers. Oh, thanks. Oh, Bob, they get a location on all of them? Yes, it's all there. Swell. Thanks, Bob. Are these the calls the girl made from the hotel? Mm, that's right. So she made... Uh... 21 calls. Let's see them. Okay. Here's the first one. Nightclub called the Ace of Clubs. Mm -hmm. Next, to Bar 8 Club. Next, the Angel Club. Are they and all the... nightclubs? 
Mm -hmm. So far, they seem to be. Next three are. Jim, I think we've hit something. These four are clubs, too. This could be the business Kent always wanted to be in. Yes, all these calls were to nightclubs. Did the manager of the hotel give you those calls in the sequence of amazement? No, he said they were all mixed up. That's too bad. Obviously, the last call she made was where she found him. Yes, I know. Well, I guess we'll just have to go to each place and bring Kent's picture with us. That should Wait a minute, Neil. I don't think we'll have to do that. Why not? Look, all these clubs begin with either the letter A, B, or C. Uh Uh-huh. She must have worked from a classified phone book, called each club in the order that it was listed. Right. In that case, the, uh... The Clover Club is the last place she called. Come on, Neil, that'll be our first place. Come in, Vi. Where's Phil? He's inside. Did you get the money? Yes. Hope you didn't have any trouble. No. I thought you said Phil was in here. There he is. Where? Right there on the floor. What happened? It's just my turn to hit him. Say, what is this? It's my party now, Vi. Let me have my money. Wait a minute. Give it to me. I said. <laughs> I gather it's in that bag. It's not your money. It belongs to me and you know it. Honey, we're not going into that again. Besides, you will have no need for it. Why not? One has to be alive to enjoy money. What are you talking about? I'm going to have to kill you, Vi. In fact, I'm killing you both. Now, wait and a minute. I'll be very legitimate, too. See, I came in, found you rifling my apartment, and I had to let you have You'll it. You'll never get away with it. You forget, honey. In this town, I'm an honest man. Now, would you like it first? Larry, don't. Don't. Put away that gun. Sorry, Vi. Drop that gun. Oh. Go on, drop it, I say. Oh, oh, who are you? Special agents, the FBI. I'll pick up his gun, Jim. You heard him. You heard what he was going to do. Oh, yes, Miss Sanford. We know all about both of you. That's where the manager let us in the back way. All right, Neil. Let's revive that man on the floor and take them all down to the office. Vi Sanford was sentenced to serve 10 years in a federal penitentiary for bank robbery. Her former accomplice was given a 20-year term for the same crime. Phil West was turned over to the local authorities to be prosecuted on an old murder charge. And thus, your FBI thwarted the plans of three criminals and also apprehended one for whom they had been looking for more than two years. Two years is a long time in the life of a criminal, but not to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. For their patience never runs out. Your FBI never gives up in the search for a criminal, even if it takes two, ten, or twenty years. No file is ever closed unless it is marked either convicted or dead. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Mr. Keating, I've been thinking. I certainly hope I can qualify for that Equitable Society Assured Home Ownership Plan you were talking about. I do too, Jim. Because look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Reluctant Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. 
This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Reluctant Thief on This Is Your FBI. Now, match wits with contestants as they try for amazing sums of radio's biggest money-paying quiz show, Break the Bank, which follows next. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs> 